Good afternoon. <laughs> Good afternoon. Merry Christmas. I mean, Merry. It's one day late, but Merry Christmas and a happy holiday. And um, yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. If you are in the chat, uh, please say hello uh, so that I know that you are here. So that I can talk to you if you're here. Um, okay, so. Alright, I have a good excuse why I've been away for so long. Uh, I hope it's a good excuse. But let's just say that life has been incredibly overwhelming lately. And I am absolutely... Uh, exhausted uh, from just trying to leave I know it's not a good excuse but uh, it is an excuse nonetheless um, uh, I think most people has already forgotten who I am <laughs> and I say this in a very sad voice um, um, but um okay so what's happening is this i mean i don't know uh, i'm a, i'm a i'm a i'm a terrible i'm a terrible 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 um streamer that's for sure. Um, uh, I wish I could. I really wish. I really wish that I could uh, be more uh, coherent right now. So that I can explain to you all what's been going on. But I'm just being very, very overwhelmed and tired, I think. Um, and every time... Hang on, hang on, my cat must get out of the room. So every time when I think about let's make a poster and let's plan for a notable session, I get so overwhelmed that it's ridiculous how, how like it's like that anxiety thing. That goes on in my head, like, who cares? Nobody's gonna listen anyway. Everyone's already left the game, and nobody's interested in your stupid books reading anymore. Um, and you know how I used to, like, post, like, posters of the book that I'm going to read, and then I plan all those things ahead because I'm such a planner. But you know what? Today I woke up. And I realized that I don't have work to do. And I thought to myself, if I don't have work to do, and I woke up early, what about this? Uh, let's read a book. <laughs> let's read a book. And let's read a book uh, with the... Um, with my... With in my stream, I I've been thinking about like just streaming for like in a few these few days, um, like just impromptu streaming, but um, end up I didn't because I'm a pussy. Um, hey, you know what? I don't know. There's like I I have, I have usually like three four people who actually stays in my stream to like listen I know those people <laughs> but there are actually people who enjoy my con my reading on another platform a small website called YouTube no just kidding um, so I thought to myself whether they are viewers or not whether they are people in my chat or not uh, I'm just gonna read because that's all I want to do. I just want to read, honestly. I just, I really just want to read, to be honest. Um, 
and I hope that you you all enjoy my reading, and that's the that's the thing that I want the most that you all enjoy my reading. You know, all I want is just people like like you know enjoy listening to me read, and I'm gonna put a party finder up, right? And it's gonna be absolutely bearable. Um. I'm gonna leave it up for one hour as it goes, and then I'm just gonna leave it off after that because I I can't be bothered to to redo it after this. So anyway, all I'm saying is that I have this uh stupid anxiety about coming back to reading, um, fear of people not being here for me. Fear of people not enjoying my reading, just a lot of fear for nothing. I don't understand it, but I gotta talk to my therapist. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> um, everyone's on holiday. My therapist on holiday. Um, it's like I haven't seen him in the wit in a bit, and I miss him. I know it's so weird to say that, but. I like talking to him. That's all. Um, okay. I'm a very flawed person with a lot of issues. That's the least that I can say about myself. And uh, I just want to read. Like honestly. Honest, 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 honestly, all I want to do is just sit here and read. So whether you are listening or whether you're not listening, whether there are people who are interested in my babbling about this fucking nonsense about my self that you don't care because you only care about the book that I'm going to read, that's fine too. I mean, I'm telling this myself, basically. That's fine too. People are here for different things. Some people are here to listen to me babble about my stupid mental health. Some people are here because they like to talk to me. Some people are here because they only like to listen to me read book, and that is fine. Everyone likes any facets of a person, and that's fine. And I think I should really, 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 really. Stop worrying about numbers. Stop worrying about viewers. Stop worrying about making this into something that it feels like a job because it's not a job. I like streaming. I like talking to people. I like reading books to you all. And you know what? It's been more than ten minutes of me babbling, and I'm gonna put a timestamp in my fucking YouTube video when I port this video over. And tell you all when it starts. Okay, so enough of babbling. Today we are going to read a book by an up-and-coming、uh, writer, a Japanese writer called Yukiko Motoya. So she wrote a bunch, uh, a, a a lot of、uh, short stories.、Um, When I was a wee teenager, I have problem concentrating on like reading a full novel, so I always really like short stories.、Uh, and、uh, I always have a soft, soft spot for short stories, and I think this is quite a good one. I saw quite good reviews on it, but who knows, right? So it is translated. It's、uh, yeah, it's translated from Japanese by Asa Yoneda. So. The title of the book is "Picnic in the Storm: Stories." So, it's a、uh, it's not a new book actually. It's like a twenty fifteen book, but it got translated in twenty eighteen. But somehow only started to get like people attention around this couple of years. But anyway, <clears throat> let me take a sip of tea, and then we're gonna start reading. Okay, I swear. I swear I will start reading. <clears throat> And we go. 
Picnic in the Storm by Yukiko Motoya. The first story. The Lonesome Bodybuilder. Nugget, Sam. You grown, you grown big, my boy. <laughs> Thank you for being here. I love you. <laughs> Sorry, someone in the chat. Hello, Doctor Piao. I'm so sorry I've been gone for a bit. I'm sorry for interrupting the reading session. Okay, I'm gonna start soon. So you guys. Thank you for coming in. Thank you for being back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for being here, guys. I really appreciate it. I was just getting a bit teary just now. Now I'm getting teary again. You guys, stop it. I've been busy with life and stuff. And, uh, Anxiety. <laughs> so, <laughs> I just woke up. <laughs> Jesus Christ. You party animals. I don't even do anything. I just AFK in my house. I mean, the house opposite this house. So. If you guys ever want to find me, come to this house, but go to the house opposite. I'll be there. Uh, anyway. I really should start reading. Uh, otherwise, then my, my YouTube viewers will be yelling at me. Thank you, okay. Okay, I'm gonna read, okay? Guys. <laughs> you guys can chat. I, I will be reading your chat. Don't worry, but I'll, I'll, I have to start reading. It is a reading, it is a reading stream. So <laughs> I'll tell, I'll talk to you all more after I finish reading. Okay. All right. Today we are reading a book, a short story compilation book by Yukiko Motoya called Picnic in the Storm. The first story, The Lonesome Bodybuilder. Please let me know if my volume is too low or too high or whatever. The Lonesome Bodybuilder When I got home from the supermarket, my husband was watching a boxing match on TV. I didn't know you watch this kind of thing. I never would have guessed, I said, putting down the bags of groceries on the living room table. He made a non-committal noise from the sofa. He seemed to be really engrossed. Who's winning? The big one or the, the big one or the little one? I sat on the sofa next to him and took off my scarf. I had planned on starting dinner right away, but the gears on my bicycle hadn't been working and I was a little tired. Just a short break. 15 minutes. Eyes still glued to the TV, my husband explained that the little one was looking stronger so far. They seemed to have reached the end of a round and the gong was clanging loudly. Both fighters were covered in blood, I guess from the cuts of, from their, from the cuts on their faces and their opponent's punches and as soon as they sat down on the chairs in their corners, their seconds threw water over their heads. It's like animals bathing. So wild. I tried to make sure the wild didn't sound too reproachful, but my husband picked up on it. That's the kind of man you really want, isn't it? What? What are you talking about? Don't pretend. I know. I know you secretly want a brute to have his way with you. You know... 
I prefer intellectual men. I don't want insensitive, insensitive jock. He put the remote where he had been clutching back on the table, then pulled up his sweater sleeve and wrapped his fingers around his wrist as if taking his own pulse. His wrist was far thinner than the boxer's, it was true. It's like you might be some kind of artist, I teased. He hated being pitied more than anything, so I was careful to make it sound like a joke. Are you saying you wouldn't go along with it? Would a guy like that would a guy like that came on to you? Say something. Anything to build his confidence back up, I thought. But my attention had been stolen again by the man on the TV. My blood pumped, and I could feel my body getting hot. Of course I wouldn't go along with it. Anyway, it's not like that would ever happen. Fighters are so beautiful. Incredible bodies, both of them. Taut bone and flesh, nothing wasted. My husband spoke again. What do you think of my body? I like it. Your skin's so fair and soft. Why had I never watched this kind of thing before? Boxing, pro wrestling, mixed martial arts. I would assume they weren't for me. How wrong I was. I always do that. I decide who I am and never consider other possibilities. I've been like that since middle school. The time I went to the amusement park with my friends and decided that a quiet girl like me wouldn't like roller coasters, I was the only one who didn't get on the ride. Someone like me would obviously sign up for one of those cultural activities at school. Would feel at home at the crafts club. Would find a job locally. But what really would have happened if I had gotten on the roller coaster that day? I have the feeling I would have met a version of myself I don't know now. Lived a completely different life. The gong sounded. And the man stood up. I had assumed that throwing out punches were was all there was to it, but the boxers guarded against every blow, observing each other's movements. With eagle eyes, that must be what they call dynamic vision. If only I had some dynamic vision too. I might not have missed out on so many things. The match was over, and they sounded the biggest gong yet. The very next day, I started training to become, to become a bodybuilder. I thought at first that I could aim to be a pro boxer, but I realized that I didn't have a trace of fighting spirit in me. No desire to beat anyone up. It was the bodies of the two boxers that I had seen on TV the previous night that seemed to steer it into my brain, even while I was at my job working at the register at the natural health and beauty shop. They turned in all directions, showing off their bodies to me. Even while I describe, even while I describe various products to customers, this is a moisturizing cream with pomegranate traditionally used in herbal medicine. How do firm limbs feel? This hair oil is made from rare organic concentrated plants extract. What is it like when a strong body throb? Was I looking for an affair? Of course not. I love my husband. He could be bumbling and juvenile, but he was just working too hard, that was all. I only needed to hang on until he was done with his busy period and then he would start initiating again. It wasn't like it wasn't that I wanted to touch any other man. I just wanted to luxuriate in some taut muscle. I hadn't felt so giddy in a long time. I was swing by but by the pharmacy on my way home from work and get some protein powder. I liked the taste of the protein powder when I tried it and decided to join the gym. I felt a little worried about fitting in, fitting it into the household budget, but I found a small independent fitness club two train stops away whose website advertised 100 free sessions until you see the results you want. 
Having never done any serious exercise before, I had no idea what kind of progress I'll be able to make in a hundred sessions. On the first day of my private sessions, I confided to the trainer, a boy in his early 20s, that I wanted to become a bodybuilder. He stopped writing on his clipboard and looked at me with surprise. Bodybuilding? Not weight loss? Yes, your website said that you have a training program. We do, but this is pretty unusual. Women in their 30s usually come looking to lose weight, so I assumed... Is it very difficult? Um... Not really. But with bodybuilding, you won't get anywhere with weight training alone. Nutrition is key. Could you handle consuming, say, 4,000 calories in a day? That's double the daily amount for an average adult male. I can spread it out over the day. What about protein powder? powder? I've already started. <laughs> Do you have a specific goal in mind? Do you want to compete? N no, I don't need to show anyone, just some muscles for myself. That's pretty unusual, said the polo shirted youngster again, and then tapped the tip of his ball pen point. Sorry, ball ball point pen. Sorry, <laughs> my, I, my eyes just crossed for a moment there. <laughs> Sorry, ball pen ball point pen on his clipboard a few times. I started to worry that he would turn me down, but then he surprised me by saying, "Okay." Let's see about coming up with a training program for you. I found out that he had been an athlete since childhood. He had played rugby at university and seriously considered becoming a dolphin trainer. But thanks to some connections that he had, he ended up joining this gym as an instructor. What? about coming up with a training program for you. Um, I found out that he had been an athlete since childhood. He had played rugby at university and seriously considered becoming a dolphin trainer. But thanks to some connections he had, he ended up joining this gym as an instructor. He was a cute kid with a boyish face, a snaggle tooth. 12 years younger than I was. He probably dressed a little dorkily when he wasn't in sportswear. That's the impression I got from his haircut. Makes sense if he had spent all his time playing rugby. He looked like he'd be into young women around his own age. My husband and I were the same age. We had met in college. The trainer in his bright red polo shirt looked at me soberly as these frivolous thoughts ran through my head. He said, You need to be aware that public acceptance for bodybuilding is extremely limited. Be prepared. Also, you definitely need your family members to be on board. In spite of his advice, I never did tell my husband. We had been married seven years, and this was the first time I had kept a big secret from him. Lately though, he had been spending all his time at home either buried in his work files or on his computer, and only ever talked to me when he needed to reinflate his confidence. Marital affection was pretty much non-existent. I explained the change in my eating habits by saying that I had started a protein powder diet on the recommendations of one of the customers at the store. I had tried out a lot of fat diets before, so my husband seemed not to find anything amiss. I religiously followed the training plan that I had developed with my young coach, hidden from my husband, who had been holed up in the study. I did push-ups, sit-ups, squats. My basic strength began to improve. So I started to go to the gym four times a week, where I did pull-ups, dumbbells presses, narrow grip bench presses, 
reverse crunches to add muscle definition. Ball crunches, tea bar rolls, rack pulls, plus protein powder every few hours and double the daily calorie intake of the average adult male. Sculpting. Sculpting beautiful bundles of muscles took a lot more commitment than I thought. You had to reach what felt like your absolute limit and then keep going. Another two, three steps. Alone, I might have given up. But I, but I had a coach for a hundred free sessions. Bodybuilding workouts required a partner. If you overreach on lifting a dumbbell or dropped it on your neck, you could end up dead. Coach was always by my side, making sure that didn't happen. One last rep, you're doing great, yes. By the end of the workout, I was, I was always foaming at the mouth from breathing hard through clenched jaws, but even that felt like an exciting new discovery. When I had first gotten married, I had a hard time managing the housekeeping accounts. My husband, who brought work home even on Sunday, saw the way I let receipts pile up without dealing with them and said, you just have no willpower. He often berated me. Have you ever in your life actually accomplished anything? The thickness of my neck was unmistakable. At the store, we demonstrate the moisturizing soap to customers by lathering up a sample on the back, backs of our hands like whipped cream. But now, all the customers were riveted by how my wrists would double the size of theirs with well-defined tendons and veins. They pretended to pay attention to my description of jojoba oil while they all looked at my neck, which was nearly as wide as my face. I could see in their eyes that they were trying to picture what they would find under my apron. It was like being stark naked. Eventually, I was summoned by the owner of the store. You seem a little different lately, she said. Is something going on, dear? Yes, well, I mean, haven't you gotten bigger? A lot bigger than you used to be? At first I thought you might be pregnant, but perhaps you're taking some kind of medication that, that doesn't agree with you? Something for the menopause? Are you experiencing side effects? I'm not. But it's clear that your hormones are completely out of kilter. I confided in the owner about my training. At first, she only nodded, looking doubtful. But when I told her that I had never felt this committed to anything before, she looked at me and said she could see it in my eyes. She was a very self-assured woman who had raised three children on her on her own and managed a change of and managed a change of stores. She became wholeheartedly supportive, and knowing the old, unremarkable, uh, and assertive me, said she much preferred the way I was now. My co-workers at the store said that they would help me with my fresh start too. The next day, someone brought in a yoga mat that they didn't use anymore so that I can train as much as I like behind the hair care product shelf while there were no customers around. No one batted an eyelid at me drinking raw eggs from a beer glass during breaks. Occasionally, some kids would graffiti things like, WARNING! Smiling muscle woman will strangle you to death! on the wall of the parking lot. But almost all the customers responded positively once they got used to it. A lot of the single mothers and women busy with their careers or raising children said they felt encouraged by my progress. I made sure I never let my smile slip, no matter, no matter how hard things got, because as a bodybuilder, I was cultivating muscle in pursuit of an ideal of beauty. Only my husband seemed not to notice anything, even though my chest felt so solid it was as though there was a metal plate under my skin. My arms looked huge enough to snap a log in half. My waist spotted six-pack, and from a distance, I looked like a big inverted triangle on legs. When I asked my co-workers for advice, they commiserated. That's just what men are like. And mine doesn't even notice when I get my hair cut. 
My hair was the one thing I had not touched, because my husband preferred it long. I tanned it. I tanned as dark as I could and got my teeth whitened inexpensively by a dentist as a, a customer had introduced me to. But my hair was the same as it had been before I became a bodybuilder. Around the time we had completed eighty of my four a week sessions, my coach encouraged me to start doing some posing. I know it feels good to be getting bigger, but you should compete and get some people to see you. It'll be something to aim for, he said. The first few times he suggested it, I politely refused, saying big occasions like that weren't my style. But my coach kept at it. I really think we need to do something about your deep-seated lack of self-belief. Lack of self-belief? Mine? <laughs> yes. Maybe you don't see it, but you are always mumbling anyway. After everything you say, and talking about the kind of person you are, I don't know where that comes from, and I think you need to get your confidence back. I knew the reason. Living with my perfectionist husband had made me think that I was a person with no redeeming qualities. It hadn't been like that before we we were married, but gradually, as I constantly tried to compensate for his lack of confidence by listing all my own faults, I I had acquired the habit of dismissing myself. I can't comprom. I can't promise that I will compete. I said, striking a pose for the first time in my life in front of the gym's mirror. This was what being a bodybuilder was all about. Nervously, I brought my arms up beside my face, held myself at an angle that made them look the most impressive. Make it look, make it look easy," said my coach. So I lifted up the corners of my mouth and kept trying my best to flaunt my muscles. My smile was still a little unsure. I dropped the pose without having been able to look my mirror self in the eye. There's no rush. We'll work on it. We'll work on it together, my coach said, and draped a towel over my shoulders. One day, while I was giving out samples of jojoba oil near the store entrance, a fight broke out just outside between two of our customers' dogs. The Yorkie's collar broke off from the leash, and the little dog approached a much bigger dog, yapping loudly, which made the big dog pick him up by the neck. The big dog was a timid dog, the kind that would look, that would normally look around at loss rather than get angry when another dog approached, it, sniffing and growling. The Yorkie's owner tried to rescue her pet, and in desperation, hit the big dog with the Yorkie's with. Yorkie's leash, which made the big dog even more confused and agitated, and it shook its head side to side while holding the little dog in its jaws. The, y- the Yorkie's yapping got quieter and quieter, and by the time the big dog opened its jaws and unhooked its fangs, the unfortunate puppy had already breathed its last breath. No one said a thing, but I knew what they were thinking. Why hadn't I, who had been the nearest to the scene, pulled the dog, pulled the two dogs apart, using my log-like arms? Why would they continue to lend support to muscles that were useless when they were really needed? A bodybuilder's muscles are different from an athlete's. They exist purely for aesthetic value. A proud bodybuilder never. Puts their power to practical use, because I had bought into these beliefs. It hadn't even crossed my mind to stop the dogs from fighting. None of this needed to have happened if I had stepped in and broken them up. The Yorkie had been a friendly, energetic puppy, popular at the store, and I had held him in my arms a few times too. I'll stop training at the store from now on. I told the owner this before I headed home the, for the day. She nodded, saying, "Maybe that was for the best." In the staff room, no one spoke to me. The atmosphere was strained. I said, "See you tomorrow," and everyone replied, "Take care." 
But as I passed the back of the store, I saw I saw the yoga mat thrown outside, out thrown out in the trash. After dinner, just as my husband was about to go back to the study, I said to him, "There was an incident at work today. Witnessing the death of that Yorkie had shaken me more than I had realized." I told him my worries, wondering whether I'll be able to keep working at the store, but he responded as usual with, "Hmm." And right, and then stood up and go. I noticed myself feeling incredibly angry. Picking up the breadcrumbs off the table, gathering the dishes, I said, "I went to the salon today. Before I knew it, I was holding up a strand of my hair, and say, 'I got it cut pretty short. I hadn't been to the salon in months.' My husband paused in the middle." Of pushing his chair back to the table and look me over, I couldn't remember the last time he had looked at me like that. He had a few more wrinkles on his face, but other than that, he had hardly changed since college. Just the same as we met at nineteen. After a moment, he said, "Looks good." Really? I thought you liked my hair long. This isn't bad either. How much do you think I got cut? Hmm, around eight inches. He scratched the side of his nose. Then, perhaps noticing my strained expression, he smiled as though to placate me. This was the smile I've once found so appealing that I had given in to his earnest invitations to go out with him, despite having been interested in someone else at that time. Surprised at the tears that fell one after another. Down my cheeks, my husband said, "What's wrong?" I went to wipe my eyes, but because of the training, but because of the tanning oil I had slathered on earlier, the tears traveled smoothly down my arm. It's nothing, but you're crying. Did you have a bad day at work? He had completely forgotten what I had been telling him all about until just a minute ago. When I shook my head, he moved around the table to my side and awkwardly st- stroked my shoulder. But my deltoid muscles were beautifully filled in from from doing rack pull. It felt less like him comforting me and more like me letting him admire my physics. No, I couldn't do this anymore. I took his little hand and said, "You care only about yourself." The longer I'm with you, the more unsure I become of myself. Am I really that uninteresting? My husband didn't seem to understand why I was so upset. I pursed my lips to stop the flow of tears and took off my knit top and skirt right in front of his eyes. Seeing the micro bikini I had worn for practicing my posing, my husband said tentatively, "What is that? Lingerie?" I left the house. There was still time to go before the gym closed. Coach, coach, coach! Even though I arrived breathless and in my bikini, coach led me into the gym with a smile. I want to train, but overtraining has real risk. You got to rest up on your rest days. Just three sets of bench presses, they make me feel relaxed. I kept pleading with him, so Coach said, "Very well," and let me go, get on the bench. As I lifted and lowered the barbell in the deserted gym, the tears spilled from my eyes. He just doesn't understand your partner. Yeah, he doesn't understand anything. Have you tried talking to him? I can't. My husband's not interested in me. You still have to talk. Bodybuilding's lonely at the best of time. Lonely, coach, word caught in my chest. I don't know how to get through him. I let go of the barbell, covered my face with my hands, let some, and let slip something that should have never been said. I wish you were my partner, coach. Oh, coach took my comment in silence. I knew he valued me as a client, so I didn't say anything more. 
But how many times had I thought while training that he was much more of a partner to me than my own husband? He helped me achieve things beyond my own limits and even more passionate than I was about my progress. After a while, coach said, better now? Thanks to him tactfully implying I hadn't really meant what I said, I was able to nod and take off the barbell again. Of all athletes, I most respect bodybuilders because there's no one more solitary. They hide their deep loneliness and give everyone a smile, showing their teeth all the time as if they had no other feelings. It's an expression of how hard life is and their determination to keep going anyway. But, I said to coach quiet words, if you are always smiling like that, don't you lose sight of your true feelings? Is it right to smile when you are really lonely? You could cry? I... I wish now I could have shown my husband all my different faces. There's so much inside me he doesn't know. Hang on, sorry. Just <laughs> wait. Wait, hang on. Okay. <clears throat> I'm okay. I guess I won't come back here to train anymore. I thought I'll divorce my husband, go back to being an average boring woman, and spend an eternity slowly dying while I wonder whether things would have been different if I had gotten on that roller coaster when I was in middle school. Thump, thump, thump. At the dull noise, coach went towards the big glass window. I sat up on the bench too. My husband on, was on the other side of the glass, striking it desperately with his fist. Is that your husband? Coach asked, and I said, Yes, in a slight daze. How had he gotten here? He didn't know about my gym. I had never seen him so visibly upset before. Coach said, I'll let him in by the back entrance. And left the training room. And once he was gone, I didn't know what to do. My husband had caught me alone with my young personal trainer. He was so worked up. Was he going to shout at me? But part of me was ready for it. While I understood that this was the moment everything would finally become clear, the waiting seemed to, to take forever. My husband was still heating the glass. I stood up and went to the window and nervously struck a pose at him. <laughs> Both arms up, bent by my head, chest out, emphasizing my V taper. My husband looked incredulous as I posed in my bikini. When I put my fist by my hip, striking another pose, he shook his head, looking pained as if to say, please, no more. I knew he would never want to see his wife like this, but this was the real me. Still holding my pose, I showed him all the expressions I had never shown him before. My lonely face, my sad face, my indifferent face, my face when I thought his technique was lacking. This is me. I tried to tell him. I'm not a boring housewife. I'm not the kind of wife her husband would ignore. Coach must have called to him because my husband went off towards the back door. My strength evaporated and I sat down. I couldn't think of anything until Coach knocked on the training room door. I brought your husband. The two of you need to talk. You're so much alike. As I wondered what Coach meant by that, my husband appeared from behind him. Instinctively, I was on my guard, but he wasn't angry. He wasn't crying either. He looked at me with a worried, uncertain expression and walked toward me until he was by my side. I didn't notice until I found your gym membership card. That you have gotten so big. He held me tight and stroked my hair over and over. I 
still work out. And on sunny days, I sometimes put on some tanning lotion and head to the park with my husband. We gaze at the dog park and eat chicken sandwiches, even sometimes hold hands as we walk over fallen leaves. His hands are still as slender as an artist and my arms are chunky like wild beasts, thanks my training. Passerbys always do a double take at the contrast between our physics, but we don't give it a second thought. Coach says my posing has really improved. I get the sense that you have some kind of breakthrough. The store owner has moved over my relationship with my co-workers too. They said that I should enter a bodybuilding competition, but I don't know yet, yet whether I will or not. They said that if I do, they'll form a fan club and get me, fancy, get me a fancy banner. At lunch break today, someone said, I guess we should take your wishes into account. What, what would you like it for it? What would you like for it to say? I said, How about you can fling another roller coaster with your bare hands? I want to increase my barbell lifts to another 30 pounds before spring, and I want to get a dog, an adorable Yorkie. And that was the end. <laughs> and that's the end. Of the lone, the lonesome bodybuilder. I'm sorry, I get teary eyed. I've been very emotional lately. Not emotional, like, I guess sensitive. But then it's not the first time I cry in the fucking stream anyway, so. Hey, Dean! Thank you. Yes, there's a lot of sus suspicious names. <laughs> Thank you, Dean, helping me with my uh, moderation. All right, let's go through a second story in the book. Oh, arigatou gozaimasu, kamui red hair. Welcome. Okay. I hope that you are in my stream right now. Welcome to my stream. I am Ariana Nuna. And I uh, do reading streams. So I used to do reading streams like at least a few times, a couple times a week. And then I stopped doing that because I've been busy. And I'm trying to get back to it right before the brand new year. So. Uh, for those who just joined, uh, we are reading a short story compilation book called Picnic in the Storm by Yukiko Motoya. We have finished the first story, The Lonesome Bodybuilder. And now we are on to our second short story called Fitting Room. Fitting Room. We are currently reading Fitting Room by Yukiko Motoya. She had gone in, so there was no way she wasn't coming out again. The only things in there were a rug and a mirror, but the customer had already been in the fitting room for three hours. What was she doing in there? Trying on our clothes, of course, non-stop since mid-afternoon. Whenever I ask her, how are you doing in there, madam? She replied, I'm just getting changed. Whenever, whenever a customer says this, you really have to wait a while before asking again because if you do they have to say i'm just getting changed again and that would that would feel really awkward as if you're trying to rush them plus they'd probably be insinuating that they are only doing things their own pace and wanted you to leave them alone 
in terms of a, of reasons a customer might not come out of the fitting room one possibility is that they have actually finished changing but the clothes are hopelessly unsuitable it happened to it happened to me too there are some clothes in the world that the moment you put them on make you feel so miserable you just want to smash the mirror in front of you as your reflection looks in su- in surprise the kind of clothes that make you think you've got to be kidding me and wonder if perhaps you have always looked like a clown whether your entire life up until that point had been an had been an embarrassing mistake at first i thought that must be it the shop where i work mainly sells slightly quirky pieces from high fashion labels that the owner purchases overseas so it's not uncommon for a customer to try something sorry <laughs> to try sorry so it's not uncommon for a customer to try something on but then feel hesitant about coming out of the booth to look at herself in the large mirror our clothes are by no means inexpensive either so when that happens we tend to leave the customer be and give her plenty of time to make up her mind in private so i was ringing up other customers and organizing the stock room and generally trying to fill some time before checking up on the customer again when i couldn't wait any longer i called through the curtains is there anything i can help you with at all there's nothing i'm fine said the customer sounding a little annoyed but haven't you got a dress that's more casual than this one this one's too much of a party dress i just couldn't wear it anywhere else in that case i said i brought her a light silk dress with a subtle almost translucent print this one from a paris label they do a lot of a lot of printed styles lovely sophisticated colors the customer the customer reached a hand out from behind the curtain and grabbed the clothes hanger pulling this dress into the fitting room there was a lengthy rustling as she got changed i wondered whether i should go do something else but i decided to wait stall policy is that the same no, the same member of staff stays with a customer for the duration of their visit many of our clothes can be somewhat challenging to work into a look so we pride ourselves on helping customers find the style that works best for them to do this you really have to start by knowing what your customer is like what are their age how tall are they what about their personality as it was this customer had come in just as i was serving one of our regulars a cup of english tea so all i had seen was her hand as she pulled the curtain close saying i'm trying this on what sort of size would you normally take in dress madam i forget hard to keep track perhaps she was extremely shy and it had taken all her courage to come into our boutique after seeing us featured in some magazine and then maybe she still couldn't bear for us to see her because of her insecurities about her height or her weight and had missed her opportunity to safely leave the booth do you tend to choose a trouser look madam or would you more often wear a skirt sometimes i more often wear a skirt and sometimes i tend towards a trouser another possibility was that she had recently had plastic surgery and her face had collapsed while she was getting changed she might be desperately adjusting silicone at this mo- very moment when i was younger i heard a woman who had disappeared from a fitting room uh, from a fitting room while on vacation overseas there was a trap door in the floor of the booth and she had so straight to some pe- people's to to people smugglers maybe i would maybe i could scare my customer into leaving the fitting room by telling her that story that might actually be a good customer service <laughs> less likely to cause offense than saying please do feel free to step out and look in the large mirror here are you 
on your way home from work today? Does that have anything to do with finding something to wear? Or what if it was a woman who had once been humili- humiliated in a fitting room trying to take revenge on retail staff by haunting us? And nearly freeze whenever I was, I was walking down the street at night and hear the sound of high heels behind me. It must be the guilt from constantly telling customers, Lovely! Or, Oh, that suits you so well! Regardless of what they're trying on, she was still in there at 8 p.m. closing time. I checked in with her several times to no avail. I could hardly draw the curtains myself, so I had no choice but to say, There's no rush, madam. There's no rush, madam. And settled in. The customer kept making rustling sound inside the booth, and once in a while I heard her murmur, Oh my! Or, Mm hmm. She requested each piece in every size and color, one after another, barreling around our storeroom to gather all the items that she asked for. I wondered what her story was. What in important occasion she might be shopping for and with such thoroughness. I asked my manager for the keys to the store. I had made up my mind to stay after everyone else went home to help my customer find what she was looking for. Our regulars could count on their favorite member of staff to be at their service at any time with just a phone call, so we often stayed open after hours with a single customer. By the time the clock rounded midnight, my customers had finished trying on every piece of clothing in the shop. Which would she choose? I made a cut. I made a cup of tea and set it by the sofa for when she finally emerged. But it wasn't to be. She didn't come out of the fitting room, dressed in the clothes that she had arrived in. Instead, she called out that she wanted to go back to the very first thing that she had tried on. Then, she wanted to do the same with every single piece in the shop. My stamina finally gave out at 3 a.m. In the morning, I woke up in the shop sofa. The customer was still in the fitting room. She had been trying to find something to wear all night. Poor awkward lamb. I was starting to have a soft spot for her. I decided to run out to a local bakery that opened at 6 and place the bagel at, and the cafe au lait I had bought just outside the curtain saying, Please, help yourself. She didn't respond, but the paper bag was gone when I next looked. I touched up my makeup and changed into some spare clothes I had in my locker before the other staff arrived. It's not your customer from yesterday, is it? They said, surprised, but thankfully when I said, I know, she asked me to open first thing. They didn't probe any further. By mid-afternoon, she had complete, she had completed her second try on, on of all the clothes I had brought out from the stock. Still, she wasn't satisfied. I drove to the nearest fast fashion outlet and purchased dozens of pieces for her. Some of the customers came to our boutique, but I left them to my colleagues to serve. They, there were two other fitting rooms, so no one seemed to notice my peculiar customer. She didn't like any of the clothes I had bought for her either, so I finally, finally decided to take her to another clothes shop, fitting room and all. I just remembered how our owner liked to change the decor of the boutique every once in a while so our fitting room were movable on wheels. Tell everyone I'll be out for a bit, I said to one of the other girls. Hook the rope around my shoulders. It was heavy, but not impossible to pull forward. I headed into town, towing the fitting room. Pulling a thing like that in broad daylight, I had been prepared for people to stare, but no one seemed to give it a second glance. I guess they thought we were setting up for some event or doing some photo shoots. My customer inside the booth, who had been so hard to please, seemed to be having misgivings, saying, There's no need for you to go to so much trouble. Please, don't be silly. We've come so far. We're going to find the perfect thing for you, I promise, I said, 
trying to keep her spirits high and wants you to come out of the fitting room with a smile on your face. I was set on finding my customer something really special. I thought I would take her to my favorite boutique that meant navigating a serious heel through steep residential streets. I call on passerbys for help. What's behind the curtain? They wanted to know. And I said, a valued customer, someone said. That's a funny way of getting publicity. But several of them offered to help push to the top of the hill anyway. Together, we transported the fitting room. The steeper the incline got, the more curtain the swayed. The more the curtain swayed and gradually I was able to make out the shape of my customer inside. No one else seemed to be looking, but I could see that she wasn't fat after all. She was smallish, but not especially tiny. More to the point, she didn't really seem human. Draping the curtains, she was an unusual shape that I had never seen before. From time to time, I could hear a sticky, slurping, roiling kind of sound, then the curtain would bulge and cave in different places. I had no idea what she was at all, but it was really no wonder she couldn't find an outfit that suited her when her body type was so unique. I was really just catching my breath, having towed the fitting room to the top of the hill. All that remained was to descend the hill to the other side. When the rope slipped from my hand and the fitting room started rolling down the steep street, caster rattling. I had used up all my strength and didn't have the energy to run after it. The fitting room hurtled down towards the bottom of the hill at an incredible speed, growing smaller and smaller. Madam! I cried as loud as I could. You're welcome to take that curtain if you like! A hand stuck out from between the curtains and waved slowly at me like someone was saying goodbye from a departing car window. Then, the hand threw something into the road. When I ran to pick it up, I saw it was a banknote in a currency that I didn't recognize. Since then, I've taken to imagining all sort of things about the things that I see as I walk down the street. Anything at all could turn out to be something beyond my wildest dreams. My customer's physique was kind of runny and grossack, but depending on how you look at it, you could also call it elegant. Picture a picnic blanket laid on the meadow. I bet that would look really pretty on her. Like a floral print dress. That was the end of fitting room. I hope you enjoyed my reading. That was a while, right? I like it! It's very imaginative. Two short stories so far. I really like this writer. She's very imaginative. And I like it when they have dialogue so I can do stupid voice acting in them. Those who have just joined, uh, we are currently. Hang on. We are currently reading a short story, a short story compilation book uh, by Yukiko Motoya called "Picnic in the Storm." We are currently on the third story so far, and it is called. Typhoon. <laughs> Try these. They are really delicious. I was in the bus shelter opposite the train station, staying out of the rain while I waited for my mom. When the old guy holding the umbrella dressed in rags started, talk started talking to me, I hadn't noticed him turn up, but he gave me a friendly smile and offered me a little packet of cookies. You look hungry, he said. Go ahead, take some. 
even though we are in the middle of a huge typhoon. And the ferocious wind was howling past my ears, I thought I caught a whiff of the old guy's sour smell. Ah, cookies, I said, taking them like a good child. I was clutching the cookies inside my palm and nervously pretending to eat them when the guy pointed towards the, the junction where the white station road met a smaller... Sorry? <laughs> met a smaller road and out of nowhere said, don't ever underestimate people like them. He was pointing at a man in a suit waiting for the lights to turn desperately holding his umbrella open in the storm. I didn't react, but secretly I was pretty worried that he would read my mind. I had been watching people just like the suit man passing by, laughing at them inside. Any time I saw typhoon coverage on TV, I just had to wonder, what on earth were these people thinking? Walking along, looking totally focused on holding Sorry. <laughs> Take care of the runny nose. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry about the runny nose, guys. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Happy Holidays. <laughs> Thank you for joining us today. I hope you enjoy it more of our content in the future <laughs> thank you i'll see you next time i've been watching people like the suit man passing by laughing at them inside any time I saw the typhoon coverage on television, I just have to wonder what on earth were these people thinking? Walking along totally focused on holding their umbrella open in front of them when their clothes, their hair, and most likely even their socks were wet too. I wanted to say, are you sure there isn't something wrong with your head? Are you, are you grown men really kowtowing to umbrellas? But I had never mentioned these thoughts to anyone. Just watch, said the old guy. Soon he'll be down to the bare bones. I didn't know what he meant, but his voice was strong like a sea captain's. So I looked to where his gnarly fingers were pointing at the man in the suit holding on for dear life to the guardrail on the, by the crossing. I had nearly blown out onto the road there too earlier as I battled the rain that blew horizontally into my face because it was a junction the strong winds bore straight at you. Three, two, one! The old guy shouted just as the man's umbrella turned inside out like a rice bowl and its fabric disappeared as though an invisible man had ripped it off instantly reducing the umbrella to just its skeleton. I was speechless. The old guy's timing had been perfect. Associating with people like him was a bad idea. I knew this, but his shabby appearance and offensive smell didn't bother me anymore. He handed me another packet of cookies and I pretended to nibble them again, apologizing to him in my head for deceiving him. Obviously to that, the guy started telling a story about some boy from a tribe that lived deep in the forest. He was explaining what the young kid did to win an umbrella that a foreigner had brought to their village. They beat each other with sticks, said the guy. The wind was whipping his long tangled hair around and it looked like the strands were trying to feed his face. Sticks? I said. That's right. In that village, they had a custom. Once a year, the men would take turns hitting each other with a tree branch. So the village chief decided to let whoever lasted the longest before letting out even a single sound would win the umbrella. None. Oops, sorry. Sorry. None of the villagers had any idea 
what the umbrella was for. They thought the foreigners must use it to hit each other as they did with sticks no one in the village wanted to avoid getting rained on. Local tradition had it that rain was caused by sylvan spirits and essential to the village's reincarnation as insects after their death. People getting born as insects in the mythology. Something unpleasant. Sorry. Crawl up my spine. As if I had just looked at a cluster of something tiny all packed together like bug eggs. As soon as he said sylvan spirits, I suddenly felt fearful and panicked about standing there next to him. Had I gotten myself into some kind of unsavory situation? I couldn't take my eyes off the tip of the umbrella he was gripping. I stuffed the cookies he had given me into, po into the pocket. The guy was still talking. The guy was still talking. His hair still nibbling away by at his face. The young boy wanted the umbrella so badly that he became the first boy ever to take part in the village custom of the men hitting each other with sticks. His opponent kept hitting him and hitting him and he stuck it out to the end without uttering a single peep. Young boy, not a single peep. Got that? When his towering opponent finally gave a groan at the pain in his arm and conceded, the boy collapsed and lay still. That's right, he was dead. Can you guess why the young boy wanted the umbrella so badly? At the sudden question, I shook my head and said, Um, no sir, I don't know. He believed that the umbrellas could make you fly. I was relieved that the story seemed to be over, but at the same time, I was a little disappointed. Somehow, I had been hoping for a little bit more inspired ending. I was starting to wonder where my mom was and about possible ways to safely remove myself from this conversation when the guy pointed to another trench man desperately holding his umbrella open. They still believe too. Then he counted. Three, two, one, like before, and I couldn't believe my eyes. The man, who had been getting buff buffet buffeted along, holding aloft his nearly closed umbrella, stepped onto the guardrail and springboarded off, catching the wind soaring up high into the air. All right. The old guy looked up to the sky and pumped his fist. He really committed Kept his center of gravity nice and low and knew he had a good chance. I stuck my head out from the bus shelter and looked into the direction where the man in the suit had flown off, wiping the, ha the hair and the rain out of my eyes as I scanned the sky. I spotted loads of tiny human figures floating among the dark clouds. I stared, mouth wide open, all of them were hanging on their, for their dear life, wriggling and flailing, trying to keep a grip on their umbrellas, 50 of them at least, or a hundred, or even more. I, I could have sworn the old guy was still right behind me, but when I snapped out of it and turned around, he was nowhere to be seen, or at least... He wasn't in the bus shelter anymore. Catch ya later! I heard a voice say from above. It was a guy. It was the guy. Sounded, sounding exultant. Catch ya later! Catch ya! Catch ya later! I don't laugh anymore when the news show drenched people with umbrella flip and turned to bones. I don't belittle their mental capabilities. When I pass people on the street who insist to trying to hold their umbrellas open on a stormy day, I know they are far more attuned to things than I am. That they are fearless and dreaming big. And if I ever meet a boy 
looking cynical during the typhoon from sheltering while sheltering from the rain i'll be ready to offer him some cookies and say try this they are real really delicious on my way home from the bus stop, I gingerly tasted one of the cookies he had given me. It was crisp and del delicate, better than any other cookies that I had had in all my 11 years. The old guy was found on the pavement all flattened out the next day, but I still tell the story anytime I'm out drinking and something to entertain the group. If I tell it right, the part that goes, catch ya later, catch ya later. It's always a real crowd pleaser. That is the end of Typhoon. Are you guys still here? Are you guys still listening? Are you guys enjoying? Alright guys. Next. <sighs> next, next, next. We are going to read I Call You By Name. I Call You By Name. For those who have just joined, we are currently reading uh, a short story compilation by Yukiko Motoya. And we are currently on the story called I Call You By Name. <laughs> All through the meeting, I was so distracted by the bulge in the curtain I could hardly sit still. Why wasn't it bothering anyone? The light green drape pulled so unnaturally at the side of the window. No generous death of pleating could cause a bulge like that. We were seated around three sides of a table and I was the only one directly opposite the bulge. No matter how many times I told myself to forget about it, no matter how hard I tried to concentrate on the discussion, the... The curtains came into my sight every time, and I look up, and there was just no way I could focus on my team's proposal. Should I tell them? Maybe say, look, someone's in there. Make it sound like a joke. But I didn't, I didn't know how. I hadn't established myself as the kind of person who could say like, this sort of thing. Plus, this was, a, this was an important meeting for me. After more than six months of strategizing and ingratiating myself, I had finally won the advertising contract for a major telecom firm. I was staking my career on, on my promise to deliver on the client's request for an eye-catching stunt that would get people talking. I had to focus. My team was all men, all younger than I was. If that bulge turned out to be nothing more than, than just a swell in the drape, they had decided. They would decide. It. They, they would decide. They couldn't take me seriously. Just the woman, after all, they would think. Even though I was better at the job than any of them, the room was a big one. Sorry. The room was a big one. I hadn't been able to reserve any of the upstairs spaces, so we ended up on the conference room on the ground floor, which held forty people. The distance between me and the window was the length of four long tables, at least. That made me even less confident about what I was seeing. The first member of my team finished presenting his idea I said, I see, not bad, but don't you think it's a little run, run of the mill? Who's next? As soon as the next guy stood up to explain his idea, my attention was back on the drape. Perhaps the suspicious bulge was just a trick of light and would disappear if I got up close to it. Perhaps if I had pulled too many all-nighters and was starting to hallucinate. Perhaps. Yes. I had always been easily frightened ever since I was small. 
I was much more prone than the average person to experiencing periodic phenomena, which is when any grouping of the three dots starts to look like a pair of eyes and a mouth, as I would see it everywhere. Three wrinkles on a suit in my wardrobe would easily reveal themselves to be a face, and I couldn't look at wood grain for longer than three seconds. It was only recently I had found out that there was a name for this. It had come up as a question on a quiz show I was watching. What was what is the name of the effect often seen in photographs purporting to show ghosts and spirits, in which a set of three marks is perceived to be a human face? That probably explain it. Drapery bulge effect. I had nearly convinced myself I was just imagining things, but then I thought I saw the bulge move. My mind went blank. There was definitely someone in there. I didn't know why, but they were hiding behind the drape. I reached for my bottle of water to steady myself. The awareness that I was supposed to be chairing this meeting stopped me from crying out, but I was terrified by what I was seeing. Was it a criminal? A naked person? Who are you? The second presenter sat down. I said, very interesting, and nodded, pointlessly stroking the cap of my bottle of water. For a moment, there was a strange silence, and I worried that I had said, something odd but then everyone started talking among themselves and i calmed down a little too i could probably afford to wait a little longer if it came to it as long as i was decisive in giving the evacuation order my team and i could safely escape i wanted to examine all the possibilities first rather than bringing the situation to my team's attention prematurely who's next i thought back to when I went to a furnishing store to look at curtains with my boyfriend when we were when we were planning to live in together my ex actually whom I had broken up just on, just last month when I found that he was seeing someone else even though we discussed getting married one day maybe some part of me wished that it was him hiding behind there and this was and this was making the bulge look 10 times bigger than it actually was forget all about that I told myself, focus on the meeting. I tried to read my handout, but the memory of what had happened with my ex was bubbling up. Screw the meeting. The truth was, I wouldn't be in this job if I had a choice. What I really wanted was to marry him, fill our place with meticulous selected antique style furniture and do housework for him all day long. I was confident in my ability to cook, clean and launder to perfection. So why did you have to be walking down that street of all streets arm in arm with her? All you had to do is to do it discreetly so I didn't find out. Or at least have to have the decency to come clean when I confronted you instead of ghosting me. What well, was that how? Was that how little I was worth? Not even worth dumping? Was I an old hag? I was so thankful that I had managed to hold back from crying out when I first spot the bulge in the curtain. If I had let out some kind of a shriek, I'd probably have to fall on my knees out of sheer humiliation. The third person finished presenting. I was beyond being able to come up with any appropriate feedback. I said, okay, time to discuss as a group. My team seems to be taken aback by my unexpected suggestion. Right now, don't you think we should hear all the proposals first? They ask. I cut them off saying, no, this will do. They could hardly keep complaining after that, so they all gathered around the whiteboard and started brainstorming. I was the only one who stayed seated, glaring directly at the curtain. The main question is, why on earth are your curves so suggestive? I lost my confidence there for a minute, but I refused to accept for another instant that anything about you could be a figment of my imagination. It can't just be me. How many people all around the world have you bamboozled or bloused out like this? Is there someone in there? Or isn't there? 
make up your mind. I've wasted too much of my life waiting around for ambivalent beings like you. Ghosts! Men who let you down easy. You must think you are really something. Calling yourself a phenomenon? <laughs> What's the big deal about three points looking like a face? Maybe? This makes me sound over the hill? A young girl? A girl as young as the one that he was cheating on me with wouldn't give you a second thought. But I just can't forgive you. Not when you are puffed up so suggestively. You have no idea what kind of effect you have on people around you. Do you understand the heartbreak of realizing you have lost the ability to respond to things that you have seen with your very own eyes with genuine surprise? How it feels when rationality and 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 heart won experience and your career all suddenly seem so pointless. How far I've strayed from the carefree, innocent child I was, all that youth and the potential that I must once had wasted. When I look at you, I'm confronted by the fact that I have turned into a totally uninteresting person. Don't you dare make me remember who I used to be. You've got to be joking. A room full of grown men put their heads together and this was all you could come up with? I can't believe you're getting paid for this shit. Maybe it's like this. Sad people like me are on the rise because of numb skulls like you who blow up like balloons without a single thought for the consequences. You get all your hopes up. You get all our hopes up. We think. This time, this time, I'll find someone for sure. But because you are never there, we have to learn to be pragmatic, explain things away rationally. Sh sure, there might be other things that teach us to do this, but... But, but, the first betrayal each of us go through is at the hands of a bulge in a curtain. At least it was that way for me. You were the very first to let me down. You imprinted me with some kind of habit of being betrayed. Men keep lying to me and abandoning me, no matter how devoted I am to them. You are where it all starts. Put down your markers this instant and eat some chocolate. Get your blood sugar up, eat until you come up with some ideas. Why don't you show yourself already? You can't possibly think you people are going to keep looking for you forever. I was sick and tired of it all. I wanted to get to the world where there was only one yes or no. Ones and zeros. Eat and then write. Squeeze some ideas out of your sorry brains. Get on it! When I look again, the bulge in the curtain, unless it was my imagination, had shrunk a little. Wait, you're leaving? Without a word? <laughs> Just because I told you how I really felt? That's exactly what I mean when I say that you are unfair. Wait a second. I didn't mean it. Don't go. I don't have the strength to make it through this life on my own. Why do you all try to leave me? You're not even there anyway, are you? Of course you aren't. In which case, at least, the least that you can do is to go listen to the story of my first time. I was in third grade when I first found you all swollen up upstairs in my room. Just after lunchtime, during summer vacation, both my parents were out. I was rearranging posters on the wall, trying out one unsatisfactory layout after the other. At first, I thought you were a trick of the light. Then I come closer timidly and touched you, and it seemed like you got a little bigger. Right. There in front of my eyes. See, it's starting to come back to you, isn't it? 
right away, I ran out to the garden and I looked up to the second floor to check on you through the window, but there was no one inside. I even climbed out onto the roof, but it made no difference. I still couldn't see anyone. I was scared at first, but I also sensed that you were a presence that would protect me, so I let you stay. You live with me for 20 days. I got to know you enough to wish you sweet dreams every night. And since I couldn't use my curtains, I set up cardboard box to keep the sunrise from disturbing us. <sighs> I guess I was already desperate to make people stay, even back then. Our party came suddenly. One day, I went into my room and found the edge of my curtains, which I carefully tied back, undone. And the curtains firmly closed. It was my own fault for keeping our relationship a secret from my mother. I rushed to open them in tears, thinking that you had left me without even a word. We had spent 20 days together and there was no one there. Just a lace curtain puddle up in the corner like a shell you had just discarded. I call, your, I call out your name. That's right, I've given you a name. Never mind. It's too painful remembering the way I used to be back then and never bothered with boring explanations. My mind was open to anything. I wasn't worried about being disrespected by my team or of how people think I was a crazy woman. I didn't let myself be bound by anything as common as common sense. I looked at the whiteboard and I saw these colorful ideas that my man had scrawled onto it all overlapping each other. There was no way I could decipher who had written that. <gasps> Were they all idiots? Feeling that I just remembered something precious, I drew three black dots on the back of my handout and chuckled. Hey, come look at this. It looks like a face even though all I did was just dot dot dot. My team leaned and peered at the sheets. Is everything okay, boss? Are you feeling alright? I got out of my chair, gave them a cute little wave before I reached to the door and put the conference room behind me. I skipped down the long tiled walkway. And we, we complained about having to walk down in heels to go by lunch and broke into a sprint, rounding a corner shouting, Church! I look over my shoulder, and there, on the face of a high-rise, I saw three yellow window cleaning platforms that sat suspended in the air. When I realized they were positioned precisely as the three points I had drawn earlier, I nearly peed myself. I knew that someone, someone very big, had found me. It's about time you finally turn up, I said to him. As tears roll down my face. That was the end of I Call You By Name. Dude, this writer is so good. She's so imaginative. The next story is kind of long. I don't know. If it, it will probably take me like maybe a, an hour. To read? Are you guys still up for it? I'm up for it. Yeah, the next story is more, it's like seriously much longer than the rest. <coughs> Please say something. I'm oh, sorry. Please say something. <laughs> ah, my runny nose. More? Okay. Okay, it's a longer reading, okay? It's, it's a longer short story. So, hang on. Let me get rid of this. Runny nose. <laughs> If you guys need to go, to feel free. Okay, don't 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 feel like you're trapped here. Don't want to trap anyone here. <laughs> okay, let's do it. <laughs> Welcome, Return A. I am not an ASMR primal hero of the books. <laughs> don't say that.
Alright, guys. <laughs> I roll up the book, stupid. <laughs> Thank you for welcoming me back. I really appreciate it. Alright. For those who have just joined us today, uh, we're currently reading a short story compilation by Yukiko Motoya called Picnic in the Storm. And currently, we are on the story called An Exotic Marriage. An Exotic Marriage. Oh, thank you! Thank you. Yeah, I need to drink more water. I really like the way she writes because there's a lot of dialogues, and I love reading dialogues because I like to like give like you know characteristics to the dialogues something that i really enjoy when i read Alrighty. Alrighty. all righty we're currently reading an exotic marriage by yukiko motoya One day, I realized that I was starting to look just like my husband. Oh wait, hang on. Once, what? Because it's a long reading. Just give me one second. I'm gonna go to to the toilet real quick and I'll be right back. It's a long reading, so I don't want to. I don't want to pause in the middle of it. Alright, I'll be right back.
Yes. So it's not just it's yeah basically voice acting. I also not just dialogues. I also really fucking love. I also really fucking love when there's internal mad monologues. <laughs> Because I can sound as crazy as I can <laughs> when I read all these internal monologues and I love it. Hang on. Now that you reminded me of smoke. back I'm gonna, I'm gonna start regardless okay sorry for missing for like five minutes got talk to mom and shit let me see all right alrighty very cathartic <laughs> it, for what smoking or what or me or me reading to, uh, to yeah reading modern logs right oh it feels really good to be honest yes yeah can you help me take pictures Alright guys, let's go! Alright, for those who has just joined us right now We are currently reading short story compilation book by Yukiko Motoya called Picnic in the Storm The current story that we are reading is called An Exotic Marriage It's gonna be a little bit of a long read so Bear with me, I'll try to make it entertaining okay? An Exotic Marriage by Yukiko Motoya Or Motoya Yukiko If you are being a weeb <sighs> Okay Let's go One day I realized that I was starting to look just like my husband. It wasn't like, it wasn't that someone pointed it out. It occurred to me by accident when I was sorting through some files that had accumulated on the computer, comparing photos from five years ago before we were married to more recent ones. I couldn't describe how exactly, but the more I look, the more it seems as if my husband was becoming similar to me and me to him. The two of you? I can't say I have noticed it, my brother said. My, son, my brother Santa said when I mentioned it. I had to call him to get help with the computer. He spoke in his usual slow way, like a language animal re resting by water you must have just adopted each other's expressions from spending a lot of time together by that logic you and Hakone should look even more alike I said double clicking on the folder as he had instructed Senta and his girlfriend Hakone had started dating in their teens so they had been together twice as long as my husband and I we had gotten married a year and a half after we met. Being married must be different from just living together. Different how? Don't know. More concentrated. Santa directed me to drag the folder containing the photos over to the icon of the camera. I've done this before, I said. Every time I try, it goes 
Boing! Right back to where it came from. As expected, I had to contend with Boing at least twice, but eventually managed to back up the photos. I told him we were thinking of selling our, ref our refrigerator on an online auction site soon and asked him to think of any tips. Then we hung up. I took a package to the post office from my husband. On the way back, I saw Miss Kitae sitting on the bench inside the dog run. When I knocked on the glass, she looked up and beckoned to me, so I decided to stop in for a minute. Our apartment complex had a private dog run. It was a small park that had been created by decking over the top of the roof that extended over the entrance and could be as assessed from the hallway on the second floor. I pushed open the heavy steel fire door. San, here, over here, Kitai said, patting the empty space next to her on the bench. Visit with me for a, for a bit. I know you're not busy. She, she pulled her customized shopping cart towards her and passed me a can of coffee from her. The rare pocket, her beloved cat, Sancho, was sitting on a string, string leash and curled up on a cushion on top of the cart, like a piece of decor as usual. Kitae brought Sancho out to the sun in the dog run every day after lunch, saying it was only fair since she had paid the same rent as our neighbors who had dogs. Kitae was nearly 30 years older than I was, but she exu exuded health and had a marvelously straight back. Her skin was so dewy she could easily be mistaken for someone in her 50s, if not for her grey hair. She pulled off white jeans better than I could ever hope so. Oh, ah! <laughs> Please have a seat. I first met her in the waiting room in the veterinary, veter, veterinary, veterinary clinic. I took my cat to where she had confided in me at length about Sancho's toilet problems. Our apartment complex was a, was a large one, unusual for the area, with two wings and a west wing, a west wing and an east wing. The resident turnover was quite high, and most of us didn't socialize with our neighbors. Kitai was probably the only one I could claim to know. At first, I had kept some distance from her strange habit of dragging her cat outside against its will, but as she kept greeting me, I gradually started to get to know her, partly out of interest in Sancho, who always lay unmoving on the cushion like some stone statue. I sat down next to her and pulled up the tap on the canned coffee. What a nice day, I said, even though the humidity was making my t-shirt cling damply to my skin. I can't stand the Japanese summer, so wet and miserable. Kitai looked across the sunny wooden deck and pulled an exaggerated grimace. Before moving here, she and her husband had lived in an apartment in San Francisco. She had told me recently that they had bought it, they had bought it when they were still young. When its value would have skyrocketed, it had been good news until their property taxes went up too. And they had no choice but to sell up and come back to Japan. Oh my god. <laughs> so, really, son? It was five million a year from, for an apartment we had already paid for. Five million? What a joke! I had seen Kitai's husband around just once. My impression of him was a gentle man smiling while he listened to Kitai talk like a Jizo statue or Sancho. Kitai asked after anything ex exciting going in on in my life. I'm starting to look like my husband. I found myself telling her about the photos. She stopped waving the hand she had been using as a fan and said, Dear me, 
displaying an unexpected level of interest. Tell me again how long you have been married. Um, coming up to four years? No, I could be wrong. I haven't known you long enough to say, but you should be careful. You are accommodating, son. And before you know it, girls like you get all a corgi running around the deck, bark at a butterfly, and I missed the end of Kitai's sentence. I hope she might repeat herself, but she was too busy lifting up her bangs with one hand while flapping the other to cool herself. Show me those photos next time, she said. I will. Kitai pulled her card over the scratch. Sun shows under his jaw. It seemed like a good time to leave, but then she took out an individually wrapped cookie from the rare pocket of the cart and started talking again. A married couple I know, she said, and I nodded and hurriedly sat on my set my bottom down firmly on the bench. Her story which she her story which she told me while breaking the cookie into pieces went like this. There was once a husband and wife. Of course, Kitai knew their names and faces. They are all friends of her and her husband's. The couples had socialized together. But after Kitai and her husband had moved to San Francisco, they didn't get the chance to meet again until nearly 10 years later. During those 10 years, the other couple had moved to England. Kitai visited London and arranged to meet up with them. And when she arrived at the restaurant, they stood up to greet her. Long time no see. And Kitai was astounded at what she saw. They had grown identical, like twins. She said, closing her eyes as though she was recalling the sight. Did they resemble each other to begin with? I asked. That's the thing. They had, they had been nothing like each other. Which was why I wondered, just for an instant, whether they had gotten plastic surgery. During the meal, Kitai tried to compare the couple's faces, looking discreetly from one to other. She considered that it might have been the result of aging, but the degree to which they had changed couldn't be put down solely to the effect of time. Plus, this was very strange indeed. When she considered the individual's features separately, eyes, nose, mouth, the two of them were clearly different people. But the moment she saw their faces as a whole, somehow they seemed like mirror images. Kitai felt uneasy, as though she were being duped. Was it the way they ate? Their mannerisms or their body language? I accepted a piece of cookie. She leaned her head to one side, thinking, maybe that was part of it. But it was more than, more that there was something drawing them closer, as if they couldn't help but imitate each other. She frowned. The even more surprising thing was that the wife was tucking, was tucking happily into a plate of oysters and lobsters, which she had disliked years ago. As far as Kitai could recall, it had been it had only been the husband who had had fondness for those things. When she casually brought that up, the wife said, "What? Really?" and looked startled. After a while, she said, "That's not true. I've always loved oysters." and turned to her husband, "Isn't that right?" Beside her, the husband nodded in agreement. They finished their meal before Kitai's foggy doubts had cleared. We promised to see each other again soon, but then, she said, poking a piece of cookie to a Sancho's nose. It didn't work out that way? I said, no. The next time we met was another 10 years later. Kitai turned up at the restaurant, at the same restaurant where they had arranged to meet again, feeling a little nervous. When they stood up from the chairs and turned towards her, she exclaimed to herself in surprise. Even from a slight distance, she could see that they had reverted to their original, unlike separate selves. I felt almost cheated. 
Kitaese. Munching on a piece of cookie in which Sancho had shown no interest in because a part of me had been hoping they had become even more alike. The three of them finished their meal and headed towards the main street to find taxi. Kitai looked at the husband's back as he walked ahead and suddenly feeling laughter bubbling up, turned to the wife and confessed what had been on her, on her mind for the last 10 years. I don't know what's got into me. I guess I imagine it. The couple invited Kitai back to their place and drank wine until the husband passed out. After Kitai and the wife emptied the third bottle, the wife said, Kitai, darling, why don't we step out and have a look in the garden? Kitai had been gazing at the rocks that were placed around the house, thinking the display was in peculiar taste. She stood up and followed the wife outside unsteadily. In the moonlight, the wife made her way through the English-style garden and crossed a small bridge over the pond. Eventually, she stopped in front of a flower bed blooming with salvia. I'm going to let you on a secret about how I got back to the way I was. The wife said it must have been the wine that made her sound like she was trying not to giggle. What are you talking about? Kitai asked. I mean... How I got back to myself. You'd like to know, wouldn't you? That's the secret. The wife said, pointing to the side of the flower bed. A rock? The moonlit flower bed was strewn with fist-sized stones similar to the stones inside the house. Exactly. My stand-in. The wife told Kitai to pick one up. Doubtfully, Kitai crouched and chose one. Like the ones inside the house, it was lumpy, dourly, ordinary rock. What about it? Kitai asked, impatient. Look closer, the wife said. You see that it's nearly a perfect likeness. Likeness? To what? You see it. Just look. Kitai stood up and looked at the rock in the moonlight. She half thought that she was being played for some kind of a joke, but when she changed the angle of the rock slightly, she felt her tipsiness evaporate. Incredible, she said softly. There was the nose, the eyes, the resemblance to the husband was remarkable. Isn't it? The wife explained that it had all started with the stones in the flower dish she had put by the bedside. They would get to look so much like him, and I had to keep swapping them out. They just kind of pile up. Only then did Kitai notice that there were countless rocks of a similar of similar size by the side of the salvia bed. I let a breath. It reminds me of the story of the three talismans. How does that one go? Kitai tilted her head to one side. Wasn't it about a monk who nearly devoured by a mountain hag and stuck a talisman on the pillar in the lavatory to take his place? Right, Kitai said, right. Though I couldn't tell whether she was interested or not, she got up saying. She asked me whether I wanted to take one as a souvenir, but I couldn't. It would have been just a little too peculiar, don't you think? We are the only ones left in the dog run. Thank you for the coffee, I said, and I rushed to open the fire door for Kitai, who had started pushing her cart toward it. I watched for a while as she made her way across the suspended walkway towards the east wing and then made my way back to the, to the, to the west wing. Back in the apartment, I pick up around the living room and switch on the Roomba. What? With the built-in dishwasher doing the dishes after breakfast and the washing machine drying the laundry too, I sometimes got confused about who did the housework around here. Before I was married, I had an office job at a water cooler company. The company was small and understaffed and when I met my future husband, the workload was taking a toll on my health. I found out his earnings were more than average after we started dating and when he told me I shouldn't keep working if I didn't want to, I leapt at the opportunity. Since then I thought, since then, though I call myself a homemaker, 
I felt a lingering guilt about just how easy I had it. Owning a home at this age, I felt as if I had somehow managed to cheat at life. I almost wished for a child so I could have a good reason to stay at home, but perhaps because my motives were impure, there was no sign of us conceiving anytime soon. It was past one o'clock. I remember that it was the use-by date of the ground meat in fridge, so I decided to fry it up with sweet chili miso and eggplant. My mind kept going back to the couple Kitai had talked about earlier. Was it all true? What happened to them after that? I couldn't get them out of my head. I tried to tell my husband the story when he came back from work, but somehow it didn't seem as mysterious or resonant as when Kitai told it. What is that? Some kind of a horror story? My husband was picking up pieces out, picking, picking pieces out of his miso soup, like birds pecking at bird's eat. I had repeatedly asked him not to, but he claimed a doctor told him to watch his salt intake. Since I, since then he had made a point of leaving the broth almost untouched every night. I reached for the dish of green onions and cuttlefish tentacles in vinegar and miso dressing and took the opportunity to look at my husband's profile as he sat at the table. Because he preferred to watch TV during dinner, my customary seat was on his right rather than, rather than across from him. My husband was engrossed in some variety show highball tumbler happily in his hand. It was a habit that he kept completely secret. While we were dating, soon after our wedding, he sat me down and said, Son, you know that I am a man who likes to watch at least three hours of TV a day. I had never been married before, but my husband had previously had a failed marriage. He said he had hidden his bad habits from his first wife, trying to keep up appearances that had become too much of a burden. That's why I want you, I want to show you the real me, he said. He sounded so sincere that I unthinkingly I welcomed it as a good thing. I discovered that TV means variety shows. Not, not was three hours was exaggeration. Each night, for at least the time it took to have a drink and eat dinner, his attention was glued to the screen as though he were suckling it with his eyes. Having successfully exposed me to the, to the real him, my husband eventually worked up to make it clear every chance he got that he was a man who liked not to think about anything when he got home. I examined his features more closely. My husband's eyes were piercing, to put it nicely. To put it another way, they constantly looked suspicious, even reptilian. Because of his bad posture, he always looked as though he was peering up at the world. Eight or nine time, eight and eight and eight or nine times out of ten, he gave people unpleasant first impression. His nose was long, as though it had been pushed down from above, and his lips were thin. My face, on the other hand, was pretty average. I had a round, low nose that took after my grandfather's. My lips were like my grandmother's, were plump. But thanks in part to the paleness of my skin, the overall impression was bland. So that sometimes when I look into the mirror and was reminded of the blank postcard, what was more, my face lacked cohesion because the right eyelid had one fold and the left had two. I've had a boyfriend or two who had told me that they liked the way I look. So I wasn't unhappy with my face, but now that I'm was married and had fewer reasons to put on makeup. My likeness to a blank postcard was perhaps more noticeable. I couldn't imagine anyone thinking we resembled each other. So why had I felt that we did? Out of nowhere, my husband said that he wanted to go on a short vacation. That day, my brother Senta had come around after work to repair the refrigerator that he was going to post online on an online auction for us. I had been watching him as he put down some sheets of newspapers, laid down the tools he brought and tackled the task. I turned towards my husband in the living room, surprised. Where does this thing come from? I mean, we haven't gotten away in a while. 
my husband looked totally relaxed, high ball in hand. We had talked about ordering some pizzas once. There was some progress on the repair, but he had gone ahead and started drinking to tide him over. He had no compunction about co proclaiming that he had no interest in doing anything as tedious as rewiring household appliances. I guess he had embraced his nature as the youngest of the siblings because he had shown no hesitation in taking advantage of kindness even if it came from his younger brother-in-law. Santa didn't help matters. He could have stood up for himself more, but there was something about him that almost volunteered for the position of junior partner. It went so far that because my husband would call on him for every little thing, my brother and I saw a lot more of each other now than we had before I was married. Son, my husband said from the couch, do you remember Uano? I brought him here once. The one who looks like a monkey? He put up that bookcase for us. A few months after we had been married, my husband had got had gotten it into his head that he wanted a row of shelves that went all the way up to the ceiling and he had roped in his co-worker to help. I guess he hadn't yet felt comfortable enough to then to ask Santa. Yeah, that's the one. Well, he says that he just bought himself a brand new camper van. He went for it, huh? Yeah, but he's too busy to take it out. Right. So, you know, he says it's a pity to leave it lying around and he just wants someone to enjoy it. Who's gonna do that? Me. Wano doesn't want to drive it himself? He's too busy. That's why, that's, why we had, that's why we decided that I should take it. Take it out instead. Weren't you listening to a word that I said? Can just anyone drive a camper van? I guess so, my husband said. Santa, do you know if that's true? I asked. I think all you need is a regular driver's license, he answered, working a fine brush that looked like a nail polish applicator. After multiple coats, the specialized adhesive would build up so that the repair would be undetectable to the untrained eye. Last week, when I checked over the refrigerator to see whether we had we will be able to sell it. I had discovered two cracks in the seal around the door. Santa told me that they are fixable, so I had asked him to do it. Now, seeing the way he knowledgeable laid out the professional-looking tools for the job, I couldn't help but think, as his older sister, that he should be training as some kind of craftsman instead of trying to make it as a film director. How many people can take it? It's a six-seater. It... It even has a toilet and a shower, my husband said proudly, as though the van was his own. So I was thinking, if you like, Santa, why don't you and Hakone come along too? There's enough space. Wow, really? I'll just check with Hakone, Santa said. It was obvious he was trying to rope in Santa to take care of the parts of, cra of camping he didn't want to bother with. Great. I think we should head for the mountains, you know. Are you thinking you would bring the grill? Of course, we'll put up hammocks. Take it easy. Have some beers. Once they had enthusiastically painted this manly picture, Santa said he had, he had finished covering the cracks in white paint and he was going to wait for it to dry. We ordered pizza. I don't know why, but I've been feeling drawn to the mountains lately. To nature, said my, said my husband, who had been rooted to a couch the entire time. Just out of a sudden, sudden, I don't know what's gotten into me. I recall that time, the last time we had been to a bookstore, he had, in fact, glanced through a field guide to wild plants. Well, sounds like you have been working too hard, said Dasset. Right, could be. Have you been putting in overtime? Overtime? Yeah, I have. My husband was licking a cheese off his finger while nodding. What is it you want to do in the mountains? Santa asked, sipping his cola. I really don't want to do anything. Just relax, zone out. Isn't it something? I said, reaching for a slice of reaching for a slice for quart of magi. No one would have guessed this was the same guy who couldn't make enough fun of outdoorsy people just a little while ago. Maybe it's a meat life thing, 
Remind me how old you are now. How old am I now again? My husband turned his bulging eyes towards me. Why don't you know your own age? I can't be bothered to work it out every time. This is why you need to remember things like this for me. Having said everything he wanted to say, and apparently eaten his fill, my husband went off to take a bath. Santa polished off the remaining pizza, including what my, my husband had left, and went back to work on the refrigerator. I half-heartedly started moving plates to the, to the dishwasher. It was the beginning of July. I had thought this would finally mean the end of the rainy season, but the humidity only rose. Joining forces with the heat and the weather became even more uncomfortable. Unusually, my husband, who had planned to go in to work over the weekend, said he had cancelled and invited me to go out for food. We were on our way back from a local lunch place where he had, we, had, we had eaten a plate of soba noodles with grated daikon and yam and a chicken omelette rice bowl. Three things happened more or less at the same time. My husband, who had been walking swiftly ahead, said, Oh, and stopped short. A woman who had been crouched by the utility pole said, Why? and stood up and from my vantage point, Behind the two of them, I had a nasty premonition. I suspected that my husband had been tried, had been caught trying to spit out phlegm by the side of the road, and he had the habit of doing, as, as he had the habit of doing. I nervously approached them and saw the woman was holding a dustpan and a, and a brush. Her expression was thunderous beyond what I expected, and I was considering walking past as though I had nothing to do with the situation when my husband, turning around, appealed for me for help. Son, can't you do something? What happened? Just get over here. Hesitantly, I joined him, and the woman who was watching him sharply from behind her glasses, she looked about halfway between me and my mother's age. This woman said my husband helplessly still standing right in front of her even though i explained that i didn't she insisted that i look right at her and spat on the ground you can't set her straight right the hell i would never do anything like that you think i couldn't see from this close the woman said knock it off my husband had apparently decided to keep talking to me instead of her this is exactly the kind of thing i can't handle he massaged the bridge of his nose with his fingers, looking genuinely pain. Look, just tell her I feel bad about spitting, okay? Mm, I started before the woman could open her mouth. I chose my words carefully to sound as politely as possible. People often misunderstood him because of the way he looks, but he's not the kind of person who spit at someone deliberately. How should I know? The woman's expression had grown even more ominous, as though she were trying to squash my husband's reptile eyes through the power of her gaze. I assume you are married. You ought to be ashamed of yourself acting like this at, and at your age. She looked at us closely from head to toe. My <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> My husband was staring off over the woman's head and looked down at my feet, unable to meet her eyes. Where do you live? She asked. I told her it was nearby, and the woman grimaced even more. Give me the address, she said. Our address? She, I raised my head in surprise. I didn't understand how that was relevant. Of course, it's only fair since you know where I live. There's no telling what people like you would stoop to otherwise, she said loudly. Really? I said, and entreating. I assure you, it won't happen again. I bowed my head, desperately trying to bring peace to the situation. But when I looked to my husband, he quietly moved himself over to the shade of the boundary wall and was decidedly in spectator mode, as though he were watching TV. What do you think you're doing, trying to sneak away over there? The woman's anger seems to have reached its climax. She put her dustpan and brushed down on the ground i've had enough she said she took out her phone from her pocket i'm calling the police w wait let me clean it up i said pulling a, hang a handkerchief out of my bag and crouching down on the ground 
under the searing sun, the asphalt was as hot as a frying pan over the low heat. I found the remains of gob of phlegm to the right side of the utility pole, wiped it off carefully, collecting it in my handkerchief, and then rub it, rub at the spot repeatedly. I got up, bowed my head deeply again, asking her to accept my apology. When I raised my head, the woman was staring me with a blank expression. Flustered by the change of the quality of her gaze, I bowed and apologized yet again, but the woman still wouldn't respond. Wasn't this enough? I was considering getting back down and scouring the area again when the woman quietly said, Look at yourself. It wasn't even yours. I still wasn't sure what she meant. She picked up the dustpan and brush. I'm done with this. Leave it and please don't come past my house again. The woman commanded and then shoot us as if she was chasing away some animal. My husband had started to walk away. I rushed around the corner after him. What a disaster! My husband said as though he had nothing to do with it. The old cow had it, had it, had it in, had it in for you. Bad luck. I looked down at the handkerchief I was holding in my hand. I had the strange sensation that my body was tangled with my husband's, or maybe cleaved to it, until the woman had pointed it out. I had been feeling that the phlegm wrapped in the handkerchief belonged to me. I looked over at my dawdling husband. Oh! I exclaimed before I could stop myself. My husband's features seemed to have slipped down from his face towards his chin. Then, as though reacting to my voice, they hurriedly moved back to the original position. What's the matter, son? Surprised at my surprise, my husband peered at me. His face w was his usual, somehow fish-like face. What just happened? For a long moment, I was speechless. Eventually, my husband seems to get bored and said, You know, you're starting to show your age, son. Then he ambled around the corner and disappeared. The end. Why can't I? Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, the end. <laughs> I was trying to ban. <laughs> oh my god. Hi. <coughs> we are currently reading. Sorry. We are current. We are currently reading. Sorry for uh, suddenly stopping as some people bothering me on in chat. All right, okay. We're currently we're currently we are currently reading an uh, a short story called "An Exotic Marriage" by Yukiko Motoya. <laughs> when I paid careful attention. I could see that my husband's face changed nimbly in response to whatever situation he is in. When we were with people, it stayed looking that way, it always looked, keeping up appearances. But once it was just two of us, the position of his eyes and nose would take on a slightly haphazard placement. The difference was a millimeter or two, and in determined changed like the outline of his caricature dis dissolving and spreading in water. Sorry. I started finding excuses to make him look in the mirror whenever his face was slacking. Hey, you miss a spot shaving, I would say. Or you should check out the thing by your nose. 
The moment he faced the mirror, his features, which had been sitting in an approximate a position, uh, approximate positions, would snap back into the original arrangement as if they were lining up for inspection. At first, I thought it was creepy, but seeing it every day, I started getting used to it, and even finding it impressive. The only time it still threw me off was when. My husband's features would imitate mine. I assume it did this because it saved effort to draw a, draw on a face that was close at hand. Either way, I noticed a clear pattern in that features were most likely to become careless when he was watching a variety show with his nightly highball. I was on my laptop at the dinner table fresh from a bath. When my husband started talking about how his ex-wife was acting strange, I finished my nightly survey of potential rival refrigerators up for auction and closed the laptop. What do you mean strange? I had never asked him not to talk to her, and I had an inkling that they had been in contact, but it was the first time he had brought her up so openly. Before we were married, he told me that his ex-wife. His ex-wife was happily married, was happily with another man. She keeps sending me weird emails. My my husband said during the next ad break, over the back of the couch, I could see his upper back, which was starting to get fleshy. The short hair covering the back of his head. This was the what the one. He had split up with. Only after two years, because he had gotten tired of not being able to be himself with her, that was definitely different. I thought. Than leaving someone because you stop being attracted to them. How are they weird? I stood up and went to the kitchen to get Bali tea that I had brewed during the day. I don't even know how to describe them, but you said strange. What 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 made you say that? They are kind of garbled, I guess. Are you going to reply? I said. I already did. He was doing something with the TV remote. He said he had written her back with vague general generalities. She would respond with it with even more incomprehensible incompre- message. Do you think she wants to get back together with you? I asked blandly. My husband said nothing. Was his face? Staying in line just now when he was thinking about his ex-wife, I wondered vaguely as I drank the cold barley tea. Another variety show came on. I left the apartment to go to the dry cleaners and spotted Kitai sitting on the bench in the dark run. She was sitting with her spine straight, neck long as usual, but her back seems to be missing some of its some of, some of its vitality. I lean against the fire door and push it open to enter the enter the dog run, and she waved at me quietly. No Sancho today, I I said, noticing the ever present polka dotted card was nowhere to be seen. No Sancho, Kitai said distractedly. She looked over to the brown dog that was trying to climb the fence. Normally, she would have insisted that I sit down and keep her company. I waited a little, wondering if something was wrong, but she didn't. Say anything more. The sun was nearly directly overhead. The light was spent the morning, thwarted by the apartment building, would soon overcome it. Blazed triumphantly down onto the bench, picturing Kitai's perfectly pale, pale hair frizzling under its ray. I didn't feel right just leaving, and ask her, "Would you like to go to a cafe? Am I overstepping?" Until now, we had only met at the vet and the dog run. For a moment, I I worried, but Kitai glanced up with a look of mild surprise and said, "Sure, let's go. There's a place I know near here that does a really good red bean shave ice." With that, she started walking with powerful steps that belied her age. We headed to the cafe off the main shopping street. It was an old-fashioned establishment with sooty lace curtains. In the window, Kitai sat down at a corner, took out a white terry cloth handkerchief from her pocket, and wiped her brow. You know, I feel like a Neapolitan spaghetti. Won't you have a bite to eat it now? 
I decided to follow her recommendation of a red, red bean shaved ice. I just had egg and lettuce fried rice for lunch. It seems presumptuous to ask whether something happened. So I pick at the shaved ice for a while, listening to the sound of the TV filtering out behind the counter until Kitai abruptly stopped stirring a glass of water with a fork. Don't think me heartless, she said. When she saw I was at loss as to how to respond, she continued, I'm sorry. That's a lie. I'd rather, I'd rather you, did, you did think so. Either way, I thought, this doesn't sound like a conversation to be taken lightly. Of course, no, neither of those, I said, dismantling this, the mound of ice with my spoon. It's about Sancho, Kitai started, looking down at the Neapolitan spaghetti the server had brought over. His accidents just wouldn't clear up. If I remembered right, it had been midsummer last year that the accidents had started. Kitai had been going to the vet with this problem for almost a year, for almost a whole year. I took him around to all the best clinics, but nothing seemed to help. Kitai, Kitai let out a sigh as she reached for the grated cheese. Our cat Zoromi had also gone through a phase of peeing outside her little box when she had first arrived as a kitten. Perhaps as a form of protest at having been separated from her mother, the smell of cat urine had been overwhelming and no amount of scrubbing with cleaner would get rid of it. What was more, once the spot that the rug had been marked with her pee, Zoromi kept using the same spot. It was an expensive rug we had invested in right after we got married, but exhausted by the strain of repeatedly taking it out for dry cleaning, we tearfully evicted it from the apartment. While our issue had resolved in about a month, when I thought of the despair I felt, wondering whether we had been locked in the urine battle forever, I still broke out in sweat. Because I hadn't heard any more about Sancho's problem, I had assumed that it had cleared up too. But Kitai had been dealing with it all this time. Half admiringly, I asked, so how is it now? It must have been a strain of having big kept quiet about it for nearly a year. A lid popped off Kitai's mouth like a cork shooting out of a bottle. I thought I was going to have a breakdown. I know your rug issue, but Sancho started, the, started but Sancho started in the hallway just inside our entrance. In the beginning I look on the bright side thinking at least laminate was easy to clean, but he get but he kept going in the same corner. Eventually, it soaked into the wood. The smell got worse, and after a while, I had to tape up a little pad there where the wall met the floor. It was no time to worry about appearances, I tell you. Having said that much, without stopping for breath, Kitai finally let go of the canister of grated cheese that she has been clutching. A thick layer of cheese had settled on the spaghetti. Like... The aftermath of a major snowfall. But that was just the only that was only the beginning, she continued. Maybe it never would have happened if I hadn't interfered. Feeling perhaps that he had deprived of his chosen spot, Sancho started to go to the toilet on anything, everything fabric in the apartment. He went on deliberately marking cushions, laundry, the couch, even the bed where Kitai and her husband slept. The two of them tried every tactic suggested by the vets, but nothing worked. They upholstered the sofa and the bed in the little pads and packing tape. They even covered the comforters and their pillows. As a result, there was an unpleasant rustling sound when they sleep. At one point, they tried, to, tried confining Sancho in his cat carrier, but he kept up such a piteous cry that you would have thought he was watching his mother die and Kitai couldn't stand it. There was when an, an acquaintance mentioned that a change of scenery had cured their cat of the same problem. Kitai had started taking Sancho outside as though clinging to a lifeline. Do you know how many litter boxes we have around the apartment right now, son? Kitai said. Watching the back of the board looking waitress who had topped up, top up our water. 13! 
13. I don't know anymore whether the cat lives with us or we are the ones staying in the cat's bathroom. Kitai laughed. I still didn't know what to say. So I just kept... I just kept on ferrying the red bean one by one into my mouth. The whole situation seemed like a muddy bog where, where struggling would only get you, get you sucked in deeper. What are you going to do? I asked. We have decided to let him go. Of course, they would have preferred to find him another home. But there was no way someone would take him. They considered leaving him in the grounds of a shrine. But it seemed unlikely that Sancho at nearly 11 could start over as a stray. They searched and searched for a solution until Kitai had stopped be being able to eat. That's why I haven't seen her for a while, I thought. Which was why we thought of the mountains. Mountains? I said. There were tears in Kitai's eyes. Yes, we, we thought the mountains that will work. Having said that much, Kitai finally started on her untouched Neapolitan spaghetti. I realized I have grown quite chilly because of the red bean eyes and asked the server who was watching the TV to turn down the AC. I glanced at Kitai who looked like a shrunken balloon gazing down at her spaghetti and moving her fork obscurely in the noodles. <sighs> For our honeymoon, we had gone to the Andes. My husband, who had happened to see a clip of the Machu Picchu on TV while we were deciding on our destination, had, su had suggested we might as well take the opportunity to go to South America. With no background knowledge whatsoever, we had signed up for a package tour recommended by the travel agent. I only found out that after we had paid the fee that Machu Picchu was a historic ruin of an ancient city that came into view atop of a cliff at an altitude of approximately 2,400 meters above sea level. To get there, we have to take a plane, a bus, a train, and then another bus. It wasn't a trip to be taken lightly. Every information on website I checked emphasized the importance of making sure we are physically prepared for the rigors of what would be demanding a demanding route. We decided to Decided, we decided to start taking nightly walks to build up our stamina, but my husband would stop after 30 minute circuit of the local park saying that he had enough. If it comes to it, son, I'll just rest at the hotel and you can record it all on video for me, he said. But to my surprise, once we were in Cusco, while other members of the tour went down one after the other with the altitude sickness, my husband alone walked around as if he had sprouted wings on his back. I held my breath thinking he was overdoing it and would crash later in the trip. But the next day, when we reached Machu Picchu, he said, I felt a lot stronger than usual and continued exploring the ruins with even more spring in his step. I guess I just needed more altitude this whole time, he said. Once we are back in Lima, Li Lima, the capital. Well, the other tourism having recovered from the thinner air were out making the most of an hour of free time. My husband reverted to his usual self and refused to even acknowledge the possibility of getting up from his seat at Starbucks. That was the memory that came to mind when Kitai mentioned mountains. We have a lot of people here today. <coughs> One sip. Thank you, thank you, thank you everyone. We are currently reading An Exotic Marriage by Yukiko Motoya, a short story. A few days later, my friend Hasebo, whom I had known since high school, asked me to organize the after party for her upcoming wedding. At first, I demurred, saying that there must be someone better for the job, but she said that I seemed like the one with the most spare time to plan, which was true, so I agreed. For a while, my days were as, were as busy as back when I had my office job, and before I knew it, the rainy season had given way to high summer. 
Look at you go! My husband would say every time he noticed me rushing around with party preparation at the blazing heat. I can't believe you said yes. I wouldn't do it if you paid me. What else could I do? It's Hasebol, I said, feeling offended. He had obviously forgotten how much she had done for us at our wedding. Hasebol, she was married before, right? Already has a kid? Then what difference does it make? Why are they even bothering with the wedding? That's why they are only doing reception with family only and all their friends are invited to the after party, I said, recalling how I had taken charge of most of the preparation for our wedding too. Make sure you get her to pay you if it turns out to be too much work, he said. And without waiting for a response to this piece of totally unreasonable advice, he turned back to the TV. Each time I look at my husband lying on the couch, I had a strange impression. I was living with new, a new kind of organism that would die if it exerted itself in any way. Even when I told him about Sancho's toilet accidents, he only res his only response was to pick up a Zoromi from the floor and say, Zoromi, you're not going to cause me any extra trouble, are you? Do you understand that, what I'm saying? How was it that he could have so little compunction about always letting someone else pick up the slack? I wanted to ask, but no doubt this exotic creature would consider the question just another thing that was too much effort to deal with. How had I ended up married to a completely different species of being from me? This, ladies and gents, pick carefully before you get married. <laughs> I had seen Kitais in the dog run several times since our last conversation, but between being short of time and feeling hesitant, I hadn't gone over to talk to her. Do you really think Sancho's gonna make it in the mountains? I had almost said this to her as we stepped out of the cafe when we last met but just before i could my lips had crumbled and instead i said i'll try a near part next time and on that irrelevant note we had gone our separate way i resolved to ask her the next time we talk but at the same time, I also expected I wouldn't be able to, and those two feelings had hung suspended in the air ever since. I was on my way back from the big stationery store in Shinjuku, where I had acquired supplies of construction paper and self-adhesive vinyl sheets for the after-party when I remembered that the dental clinic where Hakone worked was nearby. I decided to drop in. I hadn't had a chance to thank her properly for her and Santa's help selling the refrigerator. As I went down the steps leading to the basement floors of her office building, I saw Hakone at the reception desk and caught her eye. While I was dithering about whether to go inside or not, Hakone said something in the ear of the other receptionist and came out to me and pushing open pushing open the glass door. Son, what brought what brings you here? She was probably surprised by how much shopping I had. I was just passing by. I put down the stationer's branded bags. Thank you for everything about the auction. It was quite a lot of work, isn't it? Selling things online. Once I had realized that I had taken photos for the listing was only the beginning of the process that involved a mountain of tasks like signing up for a seller ID and answering questions from watches. I had ended up passing the whole business over to the two of them. When Hakone messaged me st saying someone had asked when and where the refrigerator had been purchased, I took my time looking for the warranty. Then Santa called and said, Sis, our rating goes down if you don't respond immediately. Apparently, even a small drop in your rating means a buyer would avoid doing business with you. I could hardly repay Hakone's kindness in letting us use her seller ID by damaging her reputation, so I looked frantically for the paperwork. The whole thing had been a weight on my mind until the buyer left the feedback that they safely received the item. 
it's amazing that someone actually bought it for 70,000 yen though, Hakone said. When we posted our old fridge, it got zero bits, nothing. It is? It is, especially since I was planning to pay a waste collection company to get rid of it. 74,000 yen for that? I never even heard of it, but I guess it's a really popular foreign brand. I bet it, it was his ex-wife who had wanted it to begin with. He'd never go for anything so flashy himself. But he sprang for it. He was trying to impress her. Oh, Hakone, I think you're being called. Yeah, the receptionist was waving and pointing to the phone. I'm, I'm almost done for the day, so if you want to wait for a few minutes, I can leave with you. Okay, why not? While I'm here. I followed Hakone into the waiting room. Inside the space, which smells like disinfectant, a woman with long hair was sitting on the bench, head lowered, looking at the floor. We, we got a lot of slightly strange patients here. Hakone had once told me when I had come in to get my teeth whitened. Strange? I asked. Our clinic director doesn't believe in tooth extraction and has books and give talks about how you shouldn't let your dentist extract any teeth, no matter what. Because of that, we get patients from all over the country who believe their lives have been ruined for losing teeth under other doctors which gave it a different atmosphere from other clinics, I guess. I recommend going elsewhere for treatment. Hakone was six years younger than I was, but it had been nearly ten years since Senta had introduced us, so I didn't have to worry about her not feeling at ease to tell me what she really thought. She looked like a lady in waiting from doll festival display and i thought her creaseless eyelid were cute on her but she seemed to have a complex about them and once seriously asked me whether i thought she should have a plastic surgery she had scaled my teeth for me when i when i when i had come here before even though as far as i knew she wasn't a qualified dental hygienist without thinking too deeply about it i asked about some stubborn discoloration whereupon she said I'm sure a quick polish would get rid of that for you and had gone to the tooth surface of the drill. Thanks to the incident, I had a tiny dimple on the bottom of my front teeth. I sat on a bench behind the one where the other woman was flipping through a magazine. Soon, Hakone came out of the door behind the reception desk, having changed out of her uniform. When I got up, the back with the construction paper rustled loudly, but the woman on the bench kept looking on the floor as she had done the whole time and didn't move an inch. He said his ex-wife has been sending him strange garbled emails recently, I said. We had found a table in the sitting area of the apartment of the department store's food hall. I was still thinking about the ex-wife following the re refrigerator conversation. You must be concerned said Hakone, sounding anything but she took a pair of disposable chopsticks out of their packets. Maybe I should have gone for that one too, I said enviously, looking into Hakone's bento, as I took the rubber band off my own. You can have two slices of my steak if you give me some of those, some of your eels. I brought her to the store, promising to buy her something new to wear or anything else she wanted, but Hakone had headed straight for the escalator, escalator down to the basement food hall and asked for a bento. I saw it on the local news the other day. They had feature, they had a feature on a department store, Delhi Eats, and the spicy fillet steak summer set bento just looks so delicious, she said, flattening her plump eyelids in anticipation. Maybe partly because of the TV feature, the late afternoon deli counters were thronged with people, banners, positioning, Around the, the floor advertised the beat, the heat bento expo. Hakone swiftly referred to her floor, floor guide and said, This way! and took off without sparing a glance at the stall that she passed. I followed, but you never having but never having very good at, at walking through crowds. I kept barging into people's shoulders, and by the time I caught up, she had already joined the line for the steak bento. I planned to just wait for her, but I saw a banner for a special selection for ill taste, but taste has bento. And tempted to getting one. It features 
eel source from the Shimanto River, Lake Hamana, the Mikawa region, and the Miyazaki Prefecture, grilled both with salt and without. I carefully took a piece of each and placed them on top of Akone's rice. Do you think he's still getting them? The weird garbled messages? Probably. Has he said? No, but you can just tell this thing sometimes. Huh. Aren't you worried? Didn't you say that his ex-wife was really good looking? Really good looking. Like that actress from from the movies. And she's got long legs? Really long legs. How did he split up with a person like that and end up marrying you? I wonder. What would you think if you saw his true form? I thought. I shivered, then looked up and saw that an AC vent embedded in the ceiling right above me. Hakone, are you and Santa thinking about getting married yet? I asked, getting a, a light blouse from my bag. Hakone hummed and said nothing. She said she looked like she was giving it some serious thought. Her eyes were focused on the booth cloud glass partition, but her mouth was still chewing away steadily at the steak. Do you think he's too immature? Is that a problem? I ask. No. It's not like that. I'm not sure why. Maybe I don't really know myself. But I'd like us to stay as separate people for a little longer. Separate people? I mean, getting married. That means swallowing everything about the other person, the goods and the bads. What if... There, what if there ends up being more that more of the bad? You'd be both in trouble then, wouldn't you? Akone said. Do you know the story about the snake ball? I don't remember where I read it. Maybe someone told it to me a long time ago. So there are two snakes, and they each start cannibalizing the other's tail. They eat and they eat at exactly same speed until. There's just two heads making a ball. And then they both get eaten up and disappear. I think that's the image I have of marriage. That both me and the other person, we are, as we are now, would disappear before we can do anything about it. But I guess that can't be right, I think. Snake ball, huh? I poked at the piece of grill eel laid on the rice and pictured a bright, white ball covered in scales. Hakone quenched her thirst with cold roasted green tea from the vending machine. But it only applies when the snakes consume each other at the same rate. Between me and Santa, I might end up swallowing him up in one big gulp. I took a mouthful of grilled eel seasoned with plenty of Sancho paper. The Lake Hamana eel was firmer and more succulent than the one from Mikawa re region. I was secretly impressed by Hakone's story. Whenever I, I'd gotten close to someone in the past, I had the feeling that little by little I was being replaced. The other person's ideas, interests, and habits would gradually take place of my own. Every time I noticed myself acting as though that was who I had been all along, a chill went up my spine. The fact that I couldn't stop even if I tried was proof that it wasn't some actually a matter of anything benign as acting or pretending. Men entered into me through my roots like nutrients dissolved in potting soil. Every time I got together with someone new, I got replanted and the nutrients from the old soil disappeared without a trace. As if to prove it, I could hardly recall the man I have been with before. Strangely too, the man that I have been with had all wanted me to grow in them. Eventually I started to feel in danger of root, not, root rot and would hurriedly break the pot and uproot myself. Was that the fault of the soil? Or did the problem lie in the roots? I had expected my marriage to be a, I had expected marriage to be an even more constricting flower pot than my previous relationship. But after four years, I hadn't tried to escape from the soil that was my husband. Hearing Hakone's Nick Ball story, I finally felt that something 
that had been cloudy to me had become clear. All this time, I've been feeding. I've been feeding myself to those men. By now, I was like the ghost of a snake that had already been eaten up by many other snakes, and I had lost my own body long before being swallowed up by my husband. Didn't that explain why I didn't mind much whether it was my husband I was living with or something only resembling a husband? One night after dinner, I was surprised to notice my husband engrossed in his iPad rather than the variety show playing on the TV. What are you doing on there? I peered over his shoulder. Huh? Is it a game? It's a game. What kind of game? There was no response. I gave up and cleared the table and went for a bath. And when I came back, my husband had hadn't moved. Bath's free. Okay. I heard a muffled voice say. I finished towel drying my hair, stepped out onto the balcony to bring in the laundry I had hung out that afternoon. The alcovas planted in a clump just beyond the railing were overgrown with green leaves that looked like neglected hairdo. I recall seeing a circular in the mailroom about plants to prune the planting. Uwano recommended this game. My husband said at last I was folding laundry in the living room floor. Uwano again? I'm talking about him a lot lately. I think you should give it a try. It's good. No thanks. I don't like games. That's exactly what I told Uwano. Here, take it. I'm folding laundry. Let the cat do it. Go, Zoromi. Go do it for her. He moved the cat off the space beside him, beside him where he had, she had been asleep and beckoned to me. Normally, he was never this insistent. I guess he must be feeling needy. My husband seems anxious to make a snake ball with me. When he made me sit with him while he watched his variety show claiming it was more fun than watching alone, it had to be that he was trying to erase his chilly gaze that he felt I was in, I was directing at him. He probably thought that once he and I become one, he would never again have to worry about being judged by others. I sat down on the couch and looked at the iPad screen. I was expecting some cutting-edge visual effects, but what I saw was an image representing what looked like oceans and continents, drawn in simple lines like in old Nintendo games. Small discs of different colors twinkled all across the map. What are these? I asked. Oh, those, my husband said, turning his shoulders forward, forward me, toward me. Coins. And what do I do with these coins? Touch one and see, he said. So I, so I tried pressing a brown disc with my finger and I heard a tinkling sound like a coin dropping into a piggy bank, which I've been hearing constantly all evening. I waited something to happen, but that was it. It didn't do anything. It didn't do anything. Look at the bottom of the screen, you bank some money. Sure enough, there was a number on the right hand corner of the screen. This is a game where you collect money? Yeah. My husband nodded while sucking on a strip of dried squid. Are there any bad guys? Huh? Bad guys? No. So, you collect the money, and then what? You've collected enough money, you can buy your own land. You buy your own land, and then what happens then? More land gives you more coins. Does it? Yeah. Then you collect those, then you can bank money again, then you can buy more even you can buy even more land. I didn't say what I was thinking, but he must have sensed it. He pulled a strip of squid from his mouth and said, It's because you are a housewife, son. You can't understand how men don't want ha want to have to think about things when we get home. What is it that you want to avoid thinking about that badly? The answers to questions like that, for example, Hey, give it back if you're not even going to play. My husband took the iPad from my hand and sank his head back to the game. I fled from the tinkling of coin falling and suckling around of him chewing on dried squid. 
After that, my husband took the tinkling of the fake coins incessantly everywhere, in the bath, on the toilet, under the covers. Why don't you try a different game? I had asked. But he would only say, I like this one. I could have understood if the game offered a vision of a wonderful world more exciting than real life. But what was so appealing in this insipid map that looks like a stage backdrop and it's ever twinkling coins? I thought perhaps the game got more interesting the longer you play but whenever I look over my husband's shoulder, the screen is always look the same. It seems that all he was doing was almost robotically placing his finger on the disc. Every time I would ask, you really enjoy it that much? He would say, that's not what it's about. In a curiously languid tone. Hey, do we have any more of those pears someone gave us the other day? The pears? My husband looked up from the iPad for the first time in a while and what I saw nearly made me shriek and run from the room. The positioning of his features was deteriorating faster than ever. His face was barely maintaining a form that could even be recognized as a human. He seemed not to realize that anything was amiss and simply looked at me with his terrifyingly white set eye and said, Are they all gone? No, I said. I was feigning calm, but my voice came out higher than normal. Can you peel me one? Okay. I turned on my heels and went back into the kitchen. And then there was a tremor in my hand holding the paring knife. When I served him the peeled pear segment on the plate, the husband-like creature excitedly reached for a cocktail slick. You know... I think pears might be my favorite food, he announced. How could he even see straight? This uh, husband-like thing pick up the cocktail stick and pop a pear segment into his mouth, which was positioned perilously close to his jawline. His teeth must have been in the right place because they made a champing sound as he chewed aren't you gonna have any the husband like things said i wasn't sure i wanted to but it would have been suspicious for me to say no when i sat down next to him the husband like thing picked up the tv remote and started flipping through channels this really takes me back on the screen a quiz show was posing a question about an ad that had been on heavy rotation just after we got married. We used to sing this song all the time, remember? Instead of responding, I looked down and nibbled a slice of pear. Do you remember on our honeymoon how I chew up all the fruits for you so you could eat it? Indeed, I said distractedly. Sure. You had gotten braces and you said that the metal hurt and you couldn't eat anything so I ordered a fruit platter from the room service and chew it up for you and spat it on the plate and gave it to you. You fed me fruit that you had eaten? Yeah, and you smiled and you ate it all. The husband-like thing's voice sounded indistinct as if it were from behind a wall of water Maybe that's why it's so easy being with you. When you did that, I knew you'd probably eat up my poop with a smile too. That night, my husband left the iPad outside the bedroom. For the first time in months, his hand crept up, crept into my bed under my comforter. I wanted to pretend I was asleep, but then he went to switch on the lights. So I reached out and caught his hand almost by reflex. In the darkness, my husband swiftly removed my pajama bottoms when I thought about whether the thing that had started to move on top of me was my husband or just something like him. I felt a terrible dread and kept my eyes firmly shut. Then, I feel skin slacken and body started to yield and I could no longer tell whose sensation I was feeling. Snake ball? My body was starting to coil 
I tried to stop thinking by closing my eyes even more tightly. The only th boundary between the skin of our intertwined body bodies even hazier. My husband, the snake, opened his mouth and swallowed me head first and I desperately resisted his sticky, moist membrane and soon the inside of his body became a pleasurable place to be. By the time I was actively feeding my body to him to be devoured, he seemed to be enjoying eating me up so much that the sensation of it spread to me and I felt as though I was tasting my own self. Hi, King Komodo. We are currently reading An Exotic Marriage by Yukiko Motoya. I'm back, King. <sighs> okay. It was intense. After Hasebo's wedding had come and gone, and I had returned to my usual sequence of undistinguished days, I ran into Kitai by the checkout in the pharmacy. My, Kitai said, her voice clear and effortless. It's been quite a while since I saw you. How have you been? Fine, thank you. For some reason, I couldn't meet her eyes. I bowed and looked down at the floor where it reflected the fluorescent light. Kitai, who had joined the line after me, looked into my basket and pointed. I used the same fabric conditioner, isn't it good? And then strode off over to the kitchen goods aisle. I decided to wait for her outside the pharmacy. The cicadas were cheering at full volume as I was comparing prices on brands of toilet paper. Kitai came out of the automatic sliding doors carrying full bags. San dear, you're looking a little tan. She said, studying me closely from head to toe. Am I? You certainly are. You used to be all pasty, like a sheet of paper. Oh, I've been busy with errands lately, I said, instinctively stepping backward under the shade of yawning. Awning, sorry. That must be why I haven't seen you around. I couldn't decide whether she believed me or whether she just accepted my excuse. And have you been well? I hesitated without asking after Shansho, leaving an awkward pause in the conversation. Kitai seemed preoccupied by the tatami shop opposite the pharmacy, saying something about the owner. His wife's sick, poor man. They're going through a hard time. She started walking slowly up the slight hill of the main street. I hurriedly fell into step. Where do you normally shop? Kitai asked, a little out of breath. Where do I shop? Similarly out of breath, I looked up towards the new supermarket that stood at the top of the hill. I used it often because it had a wide selection and good prices. Oh, that place! I thought so. Kitai said something disappointed. Is it bad? I wouldn't say bad. She said, it's just that as soon as it opened here, everyone started shopping here. Isn't it such a shame when we have such a traditional Japanese main street right here? She waved to the employee, sitting behind the counter in the dry cleaners. Of course, I understand the appeal of being able to pay for everything at once, but you lose the human touch, don't you? At the middle of the hill, she stopped to catch her breath. She watched a line of people waiting to buy a bento outside the Chinese restaurant, then took out her usual white terry cloth handkerchief and wiped her brow. So, son, are you about to do your shopping now? I nodded. I've been thinking about tonight's menu as I left the apartment. Then come with me for a bit. You mean to the local shop? I asked. I'll introduce you to my grocer and the butcher and the fishmonger I use. She neatly folded away her handkerchief and set off purposefully, overtaking a young person wheeling a bicycle. And so, the mountains ended up being the best solution. I couldn't tell if Santa was listening or not, because he was stuffing his mouth with proscucio, proscucio while making a small huffing noises. He seems to be in a rush to get his next plate of food, even though I had told him there were no time restrictions. 
Hakone, who had taken a spoonful each of the, every single different dishes on the appetizer plate sat beside Senta and stared intently, conveying food into her mouth. It's so different from our usual all-you-can-eat place, she said, cradling her cheeks with, with her palms as she savored the mixed seafood marinade. The place Senta and I always go has so many choices, it's almost a joke. We assumed that it was the point of go to of going to an all you can eat, but actually the better places stick to what they are good at, I guess. Or it's more like they really refine each each dish. A server stopped by the side of our table, so I asked for a refill for sparkling water. We are in your debt. You took me out once already and now you're treating us to high class all you can eat. Hakone said. It's called a buffet, Santa butted it, butted in. Don't worry about that. A thousand yen bento to thank you for several thousand, for seventy thousand yen? And a new Santa would enjoy it too. Hakone picked up the divinely decorated bowl of chilled vegetable potage. We've been going hungry since last night to make the most of it, sis. No problem, I said vaguely and sipped my freshly poured sparkling water. I had invited them to a hotel lunch because I had called. I recall Santa grousing about not being allowed to eat his fuel when they eat out. While I receive an agreed upon amount each month from my husband for leaving expenses, Santa and Hakone shared their finances, even though they weren't married yet. Hakone held the purse string, and having a good head for money, I made a rule of feeding Santa a bowl of rice before they went out to eat. Since Hakone had was the one bringing in most of the income right now. Santa couldn't really complain. So, does either of you know a good ma- mountain somewhere? I ladle a spoonful of curry from silver sauce boat over my saffron rice. I deliberately for a while. I deliberated for a while between it and the, and the beef stroganoff. But in the end, I, I had given in to the curry, curry's dark allure. Mountain? Do you mean... For the camper van trip? This is a different mountain. She's going to abandon a car, Santa said. What? No! Oh, sorry. She's gonna abandon. Uh, she's gonna abandon a cat, Santa said. What? No! You're throwing Zoro me out! Hakone said, looking up from her, pl- from her platter. No, no, not Zoro me. It's a cat belonging to someone I know. Oh no, I thought you meant Zoromi. I'm not going to abandon Zoromi. This person's cat started peeing all over the apartment. It's been a year, they had tried everything. She and her husband decided to let him go live in the mountains. I spilled more curry into my rice. Go live is one way of putting it, Santa said quietly. Sis, aren't you going to tell them the truth? I don't need to, she knows really. That's, that was what Kitai had held on to Sancho all summer. She promised her husband she would do it once the weather gets a little colder. After taking me shopping at the local shops, Kitai had bowed her head and asked whether I could drive them up to a mountain somewhere. I sigh. I hate a problem without a good solution. Maybe this was this was the kind of thing my husband was trying to avoid too by playing his game all the time. I'm going for a grilled dark breast, said Dasturab. Hakone, busy coiling spaghetti carbonara and spaghetti peccatory alternately onto her fork, didn't even glance his way. Is Santa always like that, even at home? I ask. I tried to recall what he has been, how, what he's been like growing up. Like that? Yeah, I guess he is. Hakone said, head tilted, seeming not to understand the question. Just as I thought. His face doesn't degenerate like my husband's, I said. I guess he's not a man of many worries. No, Hakone nodded thoughtfully. But his screenplays always seems to full, to be so full of really conflicted characters, which makes me laugh because when he's at home, he's really got a belly full of cabbage, you know? I mean, I pat his meals out of cabbage just to make the other dishes go further. So I think... Why doesn't he make a film about cabbage? But I think it will be a lot more interesting, don't you? I look toward Santa, and he prowled back and forth in front of the silver tray of food. Maybe you're right. That could be interesting. 
Santa went back to the buffet for two more helpings after that. The beef stroganoff and curry on rice combo works better than you than you would think, he said as he shoveled it into his mouth. Hakone had a small mountain of cake from the dessert section and expressed regret at having to leave more than half of it. I paid and met the two of them at the hotel entrance where they had been waiting. They bowed at me like flunky, saying thank you for the meal in unison. As I was waving goodbye and walking away, Santa came running back towards me. Sis, the mountains you were asking about earlier? How about Gunma Prefecture? Gunma? I just remember that when I went out there to help a friend shoot, there were some mountains that, over there that looked untouched. There might be animals living there. I didn't know that. I'll sign you into a dress later. Yes, please. Santa turned on his heels again and ran off into the station. After taking a stroll around... Sorry? After taking a stroll around town and doing some shopping, I came home to find my husband's work shoe in this entryway. It was 4 p.m. Wondering whether he was back from work already, I called out, I'm home! There was no answer. I left my shopping in the hallway and went to the living room. On the table, there was an empty glass and an open container of the sweet and savory sauteed shishito peppers I had made ahead and stashed in the refrigerator. I picked them up both up and moved them into the sink in the kitchen along with a pair of abandoned chopsticks. I then went out to the hallway saying, Anybody home? This time I encountered a pair of suit trousers and a dress shirt on the floor, still retaining a somewhat human form. I picked up the clothes and knocked on the door to my husband's room. I opened it. Zoromi, who had been curled up on top of my husband's desk, looked at me and got up and thrust his front leg towards in a stretch. He must be got he must have gotten trapped inside again. He made an affectionate sound and brushed up against my shin. I hung up the suit jacket on the clothes hanger and moved towards the bedroom with Zoromi. My husband was sitting with his back against the headboard, dressed in t shirt and sweatpants, playing the iPad again. Even though it was daytime, he had the curtains shut tight. What happened to work? I was secretly exasperated. If he was here, why hadn't he answered me? I've been feeling kind of sluggish. My husband didn't look up from the game. His voice was faint. It was nearly drowned out by the tinkling sound of coins. You should see a doctor. I pick up a pair of socks from the floor beside the bed. As soon as I said it though, I found myself doubting whether it was really the kind of problem a doctor could help with. Son, what would you do if I died? I had moved towards the window to draw the curtains, but I stopped and turned around. What are you talking about? Uwana told me something about his wife said recently. When it turned out that her dog needed surgery, she said that if the dog died, she would be more upset than if he died. I pictured Uwano's rosy, macaque-like face. That must have been a blow. I feel like you'd be pretty indifferent too, considering, my husband said. Without replying, I flung the curtains open, sunlight leapt into the room, through the glass. My husband looked up at me for a moment, but the shaft of light and the dust rising from the bedcloth prevented me from seeing his face clearly. Could be a summer slump, he said, eyes back on the screen. Could be a summer slump, I said. Something good to eat might do the trick, he said. Something good to eat might do the trick. I repeated and left the room, which was suffused by my husband's smell. But his condition didn't improve. His color looked worse and worse every day. He was managing to go to work but didn't seem to be sleeping well. Even his once formidable appetite dropped off and he lost weight. He went to a doctor was, but was only told non committal that it was it could be a case of late summer slump 
I tried to get my doctor to quit playing the game, but he said that that would make him only feel that would only make him feel worse. But he continued to collect the tinkling sounds, tinkling coins, as if he had been possessed. It's a mantra. Kitai said, pulling the tab on the canned coffee. A mantra? The game? I said, shuffling my butt around on the bench, which was damp from the previous day's rain. Yeah, I think your husband's trying to shut all his troubles and worries and anxieties out of his mind, which is why he needs to tap, tap, tap all the time. You mean like in the story of Hoichi the Earless? I said. I haven't even thought of that, but maybe. Of course, that's also a possibility he's desperately hiding from some kind of temptation. Temptation? I was surprised. Yes, temptation. You haven't noticed anything? The only possibility that the word temptation brought to mind was the issue of his ex-wife. My husband hadn't mentioned her. That one conversation and I assumed the whole thing was had been blown over. But what had actually happened? Kitai looked at the dogs playing and chasing each other around. I'll be doing everything I could for you if I weren't so distracted myself, she said and sighed. You're going through such a difficult time too. I'm so sorry, apologizing for the fourth time that day. We're setting a date to abandon Sancho. Kitai had been postponing it every Sunday, saying, We'll wait until it's just a little cooler. But the situation had finally come to a head. The whole apartment smelled foul. And a, neighbor, and a neighbor had raised a complaint. Kitai had grown haggard. So, Gunma Prefecture, huh? She said, as though she was trying to work up some enthusiasm for the idea. Yes, I haven't been there myself either, but as far as I can tell online, it looked like there are several species of animal living there. Do you suppose they are bears? It's a mountain after all. Yes, Kitai said and sighed deeply again. <sighs> I'm so sorry. He must excuse me. When you have gone, when when you have gone to so much trouble. Maybe because the evening was slightly cooler, there were more dogs in the dog run as usual. Kitai wasn't saying anything more, so I watched the dogs and drank the coffee, which had gone warm. I was, I was listening to the voices of the children laughing when Kitai said, I've been thinking about how little this it takes to bring happiness crumbling down. I couldn't have imagined any of this would happen when I decided to get Sancho, to have a husband and a cat to live with. That was everything I wanted. I thought I was sad. <laughs> Who would have thought that the cat pee? <laughs> it's... Just makes you think, you know? <laughs> Cat pee of all things! <laughs> a dog barked. And one of the dog owners, who had been chanting nearby, pointed to what the dog was looking at and said, Dragonfly! Dragonfly! Maybe I ought to, dis maybe I ought to disappear into a game myself, Kitai. Kitai said. The way she said it, I couldn't quite take it as a joke. I left the apartment complex to shop for dinner. Ever since Kitai's com recommendations, I had switched over to shopping at the local shops on the main street. Prices are higher than the supermarket, and it was more trouble paying separately at, e at each shop. But even so, I feel like taking time and trouble over something added dimensions to my bland life. The way I was living now was like being exiled on an island. The isolated island was certainly a kind of paradise with abundant fruit trees and animals I could frolic with and to my heart's content, but even so, I would occasionally be, be overcome with longing for where I used to be. When I was newly married, I felt that the island would ruin me if I stayed on it, and I often seriously considered escape, but then I would quickly remember about having to fight for fruit and endure the petty discomfort of living with others. I remain a drifting resident of this utopia, cut off from everyone. When I turned 
The corner to the flower shop, a brightly colored rose moss caught my eyes. Now that it was September, the plants and flowers on display were starting to have an autumnal feel. The word Kitai had used earlier, temptation, resurfaced in my mind. Picking out tomatoes at the grocery store, I tried to conjure up an image of my husband's ex-wife, whom I had only seen in photograph to picture her proposi proposi propositioning him. But before it could happen, my husband's face started to collapse. The whole scene seemed so completely unlikely. The prospect of one day finding myself more upset by losing a pet than a husband like Wano's wife hit much closer to home than the worry that my husband would get back together with his ex. As I hunted through a cardboard box of the shapeliest daikon, a boy of grade school age slipped past me and said, Here you are, mister, and handed a scrap of paper and 1,000 yen to note to the shopkeeper. That's today then. Well done, lad. See you again tomorrow. Then the boy took the bag of vegetable and the change and left the shop with a sullen expression on his face. Now, that was a shopping technique I hadn't considered, I thought admiringly, but then I accidentally made eye contact with the shopkeeper and feeling awkward, I said, I would like some bran pickles, please, and one eggplant. Maybe what was tempting my husband wasn't the ex-wife, but a voice that said, There's no need to live life, just keeping up the appearance of being human. The thought came into my head as I looked down at the shopkeeper's baseball cap as he crouched to get my pickles. I'll throw in a tiny tail for free, the shopkeeper said and stood up holding the bag of pickle, bringing the sharp sour smell of fermented rice bran into my nostril. When I got home, my husband was in the kitchen deep frying something. The whole time we were dating and since we had been married, he had never once cooked anything. What's going on? I asked, shocked. I saw it on the TV and just felt like trying it out, he said, without even looking up. He had been in bed a lot recently. Was he feeling better, I thought? I'm impressed you figured it out, I said. When I looked around the stove where he was standing, I saw a jumble of brand new cooking equipment, including a thermometer and some metal trays for laying out the hot food to soak up excess oil. I didn't know where to find everything, so I bought what I needed from the supermarket, he said. What about work? I left early. Okay. I started putting my groceries away into the refrigerator and the pantry. What happened to the mantra? The temptation? The question was in my throat, but the sound of oil popping and the whine of the exact extractor fan surrounded my husband like a wall and there was no opening for me to speak to him sit down son i'm making us the deep fried special tonight he said in a slightly injured tone apparently i was getting his in his way i took a seat in the couch where my husband usually sat zoromi had followed me so i stroked her fur for a little bit but i fe still feel unsettled do you want me to show you where the paper towels are? You can use the grill rack that came with the microwave that to let the oil drip off. I commented on this and that. My husband brought me a highball and plunked it down on the table. You sit this. If you sit and drink this and watch some TV, he said, and picked up the remote and pressed on a variety show that he had recorded. Without another word, I did what he said sat and sip at the highball which was a drink i didn't even like i tried concentrating on the tv screen but the show's appeal was entirely beyond me after about half an hour or so i heard him say here he comes and i went to the table 
I saw a mount of fritters on a large serving platter, the brand pickles that I had brought earlier, that I bought earlier, inexpertly sliced, and two empty glasses laid out in a plausible way. There were even small dishes for condiments, with a choice of salt, sauce, or lemon juice. Quick, son, my husband said, and I sat on my seat and picked up my chopsticks. My husband sat down next to me and took took top of a bottle of a beer and started pouring it into my empty glass. What's going on? I said. I couldn't help feeling spooked. It makes a nice change, doesn't it? My husband poured himself a beer as well, held it up and said, Cheers! His Adam apples moved happily up and down. He drank so fast as if it, the beer was soaking straight into his body. I had a mouthful of I, I I had a mouthful as well. The mild bitterness and alcohol content spread through my mouth and felt pleasant. They are best eaten hot. I tentatively extended my chopsticks towards the fritters piled up on the serving dish. They look a little lumpy, but the batter was tawny golden color. My appetite wetted by the smell and the sound that pervaded the room adapted salt. On the batter and threw it in my mouth. It was good. I feared that it might be undercooked, but the feeling was the ideal texture. The batter made a satisfying, crispy sound between my teeth. What did you learn to do this? I said, huffing as I moved the hot fritter loosely around my mouth. It's my first time, he said, huffing, huffing like me. It looks like you got your appetite back. For the first time in a good while, he seemed to be enjoying his food. He reached for another fritter and said, yeah. There was much more I wanted to ask, but he just kept saying, best hot, son. Uh, son. So, dutifully, I shoveled down the fritters. Onion rings, squid, prawn, sweet potato, chicken, they were all tasty. I had them with sauce, had them with lemon juice, the mountain on, on the serving dish, which... I thought we could hardly finish between the two of us began diminishing before our eyes. In silence, we devoured the fritters and guzzled down more beer. I couldn't remember the last time I had this much to drink. So, you're feeling better? I said slightly drunkenly once my belly was filled up and I could, and I could feel a rosy flush be around my eyes. My husband was still eating in silence picking up the fritters with his fingers now rather than, rather than with his chopsticks. What do you think it was in the end? I know it wasn't the summer slump, I said. My husband cocked his head to one side as if to say, yeah, I don't know what it was. And I heard myself laugh. I felt so relaxed for the first time in months. By the way, I was telling Miss Kitai about the game today. She asked whether you are feeling tempted by something. Tempted? She didn't say what, but I guess there was no need to worry, I said, and then laughed again louder. And then I noticed that there wasn't even a smile on my husband's face, and my expression sobered. You're feeling better, aren't you? I asked again. My husband didn't respond and continued eating, keeping his reptilian eye cast down on his plate. I looked at his expressionless profile and remembered that I hadn't seen his face from the front in a long time. I took a long swig of my beer. Maybe I'll go into business, open a fritter joint, my husband said quietly, licking off the oil off his fingers. His voice sounded both like my husband's and of that of a complete stranger. And though the last mouthful of beer suddenly tasted nothing. I gulped it down without meaning to. Okay. <clears throat> we are about. We are about. We are about. Sixty percent, maybe seventy percent into the sorry. Might be ending soon. Okay. For those who just joined the stream, we are currently reading. We are currently reading 
An Exotic Marriage by Yukiko Motoya. It's a short story by Yukiko Motoya. Okay? I went to see Hasebo in her in her husband and her husband's new, spa- new place and got home late afternoon to find my husband who seemed to have left work early again standing pensively pensively in front of a pan of oil holding a pair of cooking chopsticks should we open the window the heat of the frying had steamed up the apartment my husband who had been gazing into the pan as if he was searching for his long lost mother finally reached finally reacted to the beep emitted by the AC remote and said, Son, welcome home. It sounded hollow, as if half of him was still wandering through some dream. The tray on the countertop was a lavish pile of battered and, and breaded ingredients. Not again. Just the sl- sight of it seemed to bring last night's fruitures back up to my throat. Truthfully, my stomach had begged for mercy long ago. But what was the right thing to do when a sick person told you the only thing that gave him relief was deep frying fritters? It turned out that the fritters were just a replacement for the coin tinkling game, and my husband is still unwell. He once again reinstalled me on the couch and handed me a highball. Helpless to refuse his strange, solicitous husband, I brought the glass to my lips and stared dimly at the variety shown. There was still nothing interesting to me about it, but soon enough, between the sounds of deep frying coming from the kitchen and the ca- cacophonous cries of the TV, I felt a mist descend over my head, stirring from the couch that seemed like a huge effort. Tell me where you have been today, my husband said, having moved me to the table and eagerly poured me a beer. He sounded almost like a wife, I thought. To Hasebo's new place. To Hasebo's new place. Beside me. I thought I saw my husband nod, but maybe he didn't nod. Maybe he was just staring at me. I felt an uneasy rustling down the left side of my body and as I picked up my chopsticks. I moistened my mouth with the pleasantly foamy beer and picked up the fritters I, as I was told. No rice, no miso soup. My husband was only interested in deep frying. That's a bamboo shoot. And that one, that chum with yam bulbs, he told me prou- proudly. I've made a light ponzu sauce for you tonight. My husband said his digestion wasn't so good lately, so he hardly touched the platter, making me eat most of it. I put the fritter in my mouth resignedly, and to my surprise, the moment I tasted the first piece, my appetite came back with a vengeance, and I found myself reaching for the next fritter even before I swallowed the first one. Perhaps my body was starting to need the oil. I tossed one fritter after another into my mouth, washed down with beer, they made me feel warm and excited inside. I'd keep eating them. I would keep eating them forever if I could. I got so absorbed in moving my mouth, I couldn't even think about anything else. It's nice you're getting to be more like me. I heard my husband murmur as he poured himself another beer. What? I thought. But my mouth was full of fruit and I couldn't respond. I hurriedly saw. So- I hurriedly tried to swallow, but he said, Try this one. Try this on the next one. He pressed yuzu chili paste on me, and I chewed the next fritter. I found that I couldn't for the life of me recall what he said or what I wanted to say in reply. Belly full. I let myself let but the hand to the couch and gaze at the variety show with him. It's so easy being with you, my husband said. As though intoning some kind of a spell, so I replied, You are right. I hadn't even stopped to think about what I was saying. When I woke up and looked into the mirror, I saw my face had be- finally begun to forget who I was. I guess 
my features had just been caught off guard that day. When I peered closer, they rushed to reassemble, as though to say, Oh shit! But it was as if they couldn't remember their original placement, and as a result, the final impression was a little off kilter. I took another harder look into the mirror. The eyes were a little too far apart, making the whole face look curiously stretched out. I was becoming like my husband. <sighs> Trying to pull myself together, I washed my face, sluicing it repeatedly with water. Then I used my fingers to smooth on a stronger sunscreen than I normally use. There was a voice in my head that said, What's the point of going to all this effort over the face that was neither here nor there to begin with? But I managed to ignore it and left the apartment just on time. When I took the car out and drove it to the ramp from the complex underground car park, Kitai and her husband were waiting in the exit at the top as we arranged. I got out from the driver's seat and said, Thanks for meeting me and bowed to them. Thanks isn't really the right word. I thought I thought as the word came out of my mouth. But I didn't know what else to say. Kitai's husband seemed to be in the same boat. No. Thank you, he said. And he bowed much more politely than I had. Next to him, Kitai was cradling the, so the soft pet carrier, hanging from her shoulder as if it were her child. Seen up close, her husband was smaller than I, I had imagined. As with Kitae, all the color had seemed to fallen neatly out of his hair. And because he was dressed in pale shades, he again reminded me of a statue of Jizo standing on the side of some country road. Santia, this is my husband Arai. She turned to her husband. Arai, this is my friend San, she said almost carelessly. San had cats for a long time since she was small. She understands them much better than we do, so we leave it up to her, Arai, and everything will be fine. Kitai then turned to the mesh panel of the pet carrier and leaned towards it. San sure you don't have to you don't need to be scared either. San's gonna find you a wonderful mountain for you. I was a little daunted by the weight of the responsibility that seemed to have been placed on me, but I have got I've got the two of them into the back seat and said, Okay, here we go, and loaded the GPS the address of the young people's nature camp in Gunma Prefecture that Santa had sent me. The estimated travel time was two and a half hours. It's nearer than I thought, said Kitai. She leaned forward and looked closely at the GPS screen. That means we can go visit any time if worse comes to worse. Could they? It would take five hours to get there and back, I thought Mr. Arai might be more realistic about this, but he didn't say anything, so I acted as if I hadn't heard anything either. Just as we set off, Sancho gave a small cry inside the carrier, but I also pretended not to have heard that. Once we had been on the Doshinetsu expressway for a while, the mountain range came into view. Because it was a clear day with what seemed like an impossibly high autumn sky, the profiles of the mountains stood out, stood out clearly, seeming to advance on us. The view was so impressive that I've, I would have applauded if not for the situation. We exited onto the local roads and advanced towards the mountains following the GPS. The houses, which has been clustered together, soon began to be spaced out, then become more sporadic and finally disappeared. As we climbed on an endless series of switchbacks, we found ourselves deep enough into the wood that I braced myself for animals leaping out onto the roads at any moment. According to the GPS, the young people's nature camp was still farther ahead, but I found gravel track that I decided of, and I decided to follow it. Soon after getting into the car, Kitai said that she was going to open the pet carrier. She must have been holding Sancho on her lap the entire way. Look, we are in the mountains. What do you think? Kitai was talking to Sancho. When the gravel track petered out into narrow dirt path, I stopped the car. 
it didn't seem to be recognized road. The GPS screen showed a red arrow that indicated we should turn back. No one spoke until I said, we are here. I was wondering whether or not to switch off the engine when Mr. Arai said to Kitai almost in a whisper. Hear that? We're here. Uh-huh. Kitai nodded but stayed in the back seat holding Sancho, head lowered. Is it different from what you expected? I twisted my body around to face Mr. Arai. He made a small smile angling the corners of his eyes down and shook his head. Come on, Kitai, he said. You decided. You cannot change your mind now that we have come all this way. Kitai said, yes, yes, but didn't raise her head. I said, I'm going to have a look around, and I got out of the car. The second I opened the door, my body was enveloped by the natural chill of the mountain. I found myself breathing in as deeply as I could. The air was humid and seemed to snuggle up my skin. I retied the laces of my sneakers and walked ahead of the path. I could hear the sound of birds everywhere. Were they singing from the top of the trees? No matter how hard I tried to train my ears on their voices, I couldn't tell what direction they were coming from. I expected the mountain in fall to be cool, but the sunlight was blocked by the trees. It was so cold that it was, I, was, I was almost shivering. Between the tall trees and bushes, I could see clumps and scabbers, gentian and hairless salvia. Perhaps there has been dew on the sleef. I noticed my socks were wet and turned back towards the parked car. It seemed that Mr. Arai was desperately trying to soothe Kitai. I couldn't tell exactly from a distance, but I could tell Kitai still holding Sancho and refusing to look up, and Mr. Arai's head was moving as he was talking to her. I was hoping that one of us would say, let's go back home after all. There was no way Sancho was going to survive here. He would have had more chance at the local shrine. But Kitai had said, if he's near people, he'll get hit by a car. As a child, she had witnessed a neighbor's car trying to cross the road and get flattened. I realized that indulging Kitai's idea about the mountains, I started to subscribe to the idea that once we get here, Sancho would thrive. But it was clearly impossible. <sighs> My husband is the one we should be returning to the mountains, I thought, remembering him at Machu Picchu and how he had moved about there as though he had been brought back to life. I picked my way carefully through the trees and back to the car and found Kitai sitting nearby on a nearby stump with a, with a, with a pet carrier on her knees. How is Sancho's doing? I asked, thinking to myself. Oh no, Mr. Arai managed to convince her. Sancho, well... He seems to be quite calm about it all, Kitai said, and pulled on the carrier zipper and peeled back the nylon flap that covered the top. Sancho, she called, and Sancho raised his head, sniffing. See? We are in the mountains now. Your new home. You can pee anywhere you want. Everywhere. You're going to be happy here. Sancho shriveled his ears and peered around cautiously, but after a while he stood up inside the back and thrust the top of the top half of his body out of the opening. He's getting away, I thought. And almost as soon as I did, Kitai grabbed his head and pushed him back inside the carrier. No, 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 she said, looking like she might cry, shook, shook her head petulantly. Why don't we just head home? The words were in my mouth, but I managed to hold them back. They'll be easy to say, but then what? Mr. Arai came back from his reconnaissance of the area and looked at Kitai, stooped over at the stump, and me, standing like a log beside her. He seemed to comprehend everything. Kitai, let me take care of it. I'll go leave him over there, he said calmly, as if he were telling her he would lend a hand with the dishes. Arai, did you say leave him? Kitai snapped, but 
but in a voice so weak I couldn't imagine it belonged to her. The voice, the words, seemed to take the last of her resolve, and after that, she would only say, Oh no, oh no, 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 oh no. Mr. Arai gently lifted the carrier from Kitai's lap and turned to me. It'll just be a minute then. Right, okay, I said, and then added, I'll come with you. Mr. Arai lowered his brows for a moment, looking concerned, then glanced towards to the back of Kitai's head. It's fine. Go. That's why we asked her to come. She said, still looking down, and Mr. Arai nodded and started to walk off. When we were a little distance away, I thought I heard Kitai's voice behind us, going, ah, ah. But it sounded uncertain, and I didn't know whether she was angry or relieved. The slender Mr. Arai strode up the mountain path ahead of me. Sancho, in the carrier hanging from the shoulder, must have weighed 12 pounds at least, but Mr. Arai followed the trail confidently as though it were, it, were, it were a walking route in the city park. I was frantically following, carrying the backpack Kitai had loaded into the trunk of the car. Thanks to the extra weight, I gulped at the air like a fish poking its face out of the water. With each step, the sole of my sneakers sank into the soft ground. The deeper we went up the hill, the more oxygened, oxygenated the air seemed. I could feel the breathing of the trees, the soil, and the things that were, that, that were turning back into soil. While I was distracted by the sound of insects, Mr. Arai, ahead of me, suddenly turned his face to one side like a wild animal. He must have sent something and started climbing straight up the slope, easing through narrow gaps between trees. I followed with much difficulty to a large rocky area where the ground leveled out. Water was flowing from one end. A rock spring, I said out of breath. How did you know? I grew up surrounded by mountains, Mr. Arai said in a voice as clear as a bell, and carefully took the carrier off his shoulder and put it on the ground. What do you think of this place? It seemed safer than the surrounding area, with better visibility and good hiding places under rocks, but also more dangerous considering the possibilities of other animals. Seems good, I think, I said haltingly. Nowhere was truly safe, Mr. Arai nodded briefly. We'll do it here. And maybe our kindness for how much I was sweating, he said. Shall we sit down? That's a good view. Kitai's backpack held a surprising number of items. Dry cat food, canned food, plates, Sancho's favorite bag, blankets, toys, bottled water, collapsible cat house made of nylon. The other animals would notice Sancho straight away if we leave this out. Mr. Arai said, sitting down on a convenient rock, voicing exactly what the thought that was in my head. What was Kitai thinking? A picnic? How long have you and she been married? I asked, changing the subject even though I thought it might sound rude. So I wouldn't have to think about Sancho in the bag. Married? Let's see. I think we're coming up to 45 years. You have got married young. I was 25 and Kitai was 22 or thereabouts. I thought we could have waited a little longer, but you know how Kitai wouldn't budge once she set her mind to something? The two of you aren't at all alike, I said, and Mr. Arai seemed amused. Even though he didn't laugh, but I could see in the depth of his eyes, he would be a hard man to keep secrets from. Something inside me said. You know, I've seen you and your husband together, he said. Really? Yes. But you seem like different, a little different then, I think. I've gained 15 pounds, I confessed, embarrassed. But Mr. Arai looked at me steadily quiet, and quietly said, Yes, that might be part of it, but I think you were looking more human-like human-like? I don't look human now? 
I said, laughing to cover up my shock at his startling words. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's a funny thing to say when we are, we have only just met, but please, it's just something that came to mind. Just don't worry about it. No, actually, it's something that I've noticed myself. Uh, it is? Mr. Arai gazed, gazed at me again. I looked down at where the water welled up from the rock as though I was trying to pass unnoticed by some wild animal. Kitai told you about the couple who became identical. The wife had came to me for advice. In, and in fact, I was the one who suggested putting down a stone. It might be best if you were to place something between you and your husband too. Shall we? Mr. Arai got up. Looking at his white shirt, which was, which was still pristine after walking so far, I stood hurriedly to follow him. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> Sorry. I need tea. As soon as she saw us coming back, Kitai jumped out of the car. Arai, you must have gone a long way. Did you set Sancho free somewhere nice? He, he, he won't be attacked by a bear, will he? The skin around her eyes were puffy and red. It's alright, we found a good spot for him, Mr. Arai said slowly and patted her shoulder as though brushing off some dust. Really, son? Is it true you, you found a good spot? I nodded, lowering the backpack. There were places to hide and it looked surprisingly comfortable, I said. In the end, I hadn't actually witnessed Mr. Arai letting Sancho out of the bag. I waited a little distance away, pacing over tree roots and vaguely imagining I could evade some responsibility. Kitai continued to look mournful even once we were all back in the car. As I gripped on the steering wheel, I could hear her sniffing and Mr. Arai mur murmuring something in low voice, but I couldn't make out what he was saying. I don't want fritters tonight, I said as soon as I got home. I've been trying to think of what I could put between me and my husband and I hadn't come up with anything. Oh? Why? My husband said languidly. He already had the pans on the stove and was preparing the food with long chopsticks as usual. It makes me feel fuzzy. There's nothing wrong with that. When I get fuzzy, we can't talk about anything important. My husband dipped the tip of the chopstick into the bowl of egg and flour mixture and then flicked them over the hot oil. There's nothing to there's no need to talk about important things when we are at home, is there? Then when there are people who stay at home supposed to talk about then what then when people are then when people who stay at home supposed to talk about them I said quickly. I had to face it today. I had to question him bef before I lost my human form. But the more anxious I felt, the more sluggish my husband became. The thing is, son, he said, adjusting the heat of the stove. You keep saying that we need to talk, but is that even true? Maybe you would like to talk about important things, but do you have anything important to say? I started to feel less sure about myself. I focused on feeling strength in my stomach. What about having children? It kind of got put on hold and we haven't mentioned it since. How do you feel about it now? How do you feel about it? He said. And I found myself lost for words. See, son, there isn't anything you want to talk to me about, is there? What about your ex-wife? I said in desperation. But I knew as soon as I said it, it wasn't a conversation I particularly w wanted to have. You are like me, son. You don't really want to talk about anything. And there is no need to pretend that you do, my husband said. And took one of the ginger shoots lined up for the cutting board and dropped it into the pan. We don't have to have the face. We don't have to face the big stuff, you and me. That's why... Being with you is so easy. 
You are wrong, I wanted to say, but I couldn't get the words out. How could you have lived like this for four years otherwise? A shiver went down my spine, like this. What was he trying to say? This past four years? Did you ever once say you wanted to go out and find work? My husband said in a syrupy voice, still gazing into the foaming pan. A quail leg plopped its way into the oil. What did you think you found out I already own an apartment? Another egg went in. I knew from the start that you would never leave this place. His voice wasn't my husband, but I could no longer recall how my husband's voice sounded. I think you understand it, son. Why you married me and why I married you? I felt the hairs on my body stand on end. As I opened my mouth to scream, I felt something hot fall into it. They are best eaten hot. And it was hot. So hot, I thought I was about to burn myself. But the more I told myself I had to speed out the fritter, I had to spit the fritter out right away. The more my mouth huffed and my tongue moved to taste it, the delicate aroma of the in-season ginger root rose to my palate. It's okay, it's okay. It'll start to taste good soon. My husband looked at me. His face, which I haven't seen in a long while, was a perfect, half enough mixture of my husband and me. My husband continued throwing ginger shoots and quail eggs into my mouth one after the other. It was horrifying but oh so delicious. As I moved my mouth to keep up with the onslaught, the taste started to change into something I knew well. You thought you were the only one feeding yourself to me? He said, twisting his body into a coil and smiling thinly. I cried out and tried to peel him off me but it was too late. I couldn't breathe. But the sense of revulsion gradually lessened. And soon enough, with tears in my eyes, I was filling my mouth with the familiar substance. Tastes so good, it tastes so good, I said, coiling breathlessly, continued to revel in the taste of the thing I knew so well. We ran to Mr. Arai just once after that, at the entrance of the apartment complex. Mr. Arai was collecting his mail from the mail room, stopped as soon as he spotted me and my husband and said, Oh, it's been a while, I said, and bowed lightly. I see, Mr. Arai said, looking at the two of us in turn. You decided to placing something between you. Yes, I felt that we could make it work without... Oh, you decided placing, you decided against placing something between you. Yes, I felt we could make it work without that. You weren't so averse to it then. I guess not. I see, I see. Mr. Arai nodded again and looked up at my husband who was listening to our exchange suspiciously. Well, there's plenty of very similar married couples out there. You're right. Perhaps it does work. He said, well, he, and walk off briskly towards the east wing. I wanted to ask him what we looked like to him, but I watched him go in silence. Not long after that, Kitai told me that the two of them decided to move back to San Francisco. It was October, and several out-of-season typh typhoons made landfills in made landfalls in quick succession. People were saying it was because there had been so few during September that we were getting them now. My husband had gotten a doctor's note and taken paid leave from work and providing me with couch and highballs and the TV and took on houseworks with a kind of relief. That day, the biggest typhoon of the year was, was forecast to approach. Drop in air pressure triggered my migraines and I had been in especially bad mood since morning. I started drinking earlier than usual to compensate. 
I went shopping on the main street today, my husband said after dinner. Uh -huh. I said from the couch, not really listening. Thanks to the painkillers I had taken for the migraine, on top of the features that I had stuffed myself with yet again, my head felt even fuzzier than normal. Watching from behind as he eagerly folded the laundry, I thought, he's finally progressed to shopping at the local shops. The butchers was closed. Apparently, the owner fell sick last week. The old grocer said so. Mm. I said, I've heard about that only the day before yesterday myself. And our dry cleaner is going to be changing hands soon. I knew that too. My husband noticed my glass was empty and I got and got up smoothly and brought me a refill. What an attentive wife he was. He waited quietly until I'd taken my first sip and then continued. Oh, Zoromi's cat food going up next month by 60 yen. He said triumphantly. But this was an information that I had told him yesterday. Caught you out, I thought uncharitably, and looked at my husband, who had sat back down in front of the laundry. 80 yen, not 60. When I corrected him, my husband simply repeated himself, Zoromi's cat food going up next, uh, next month by 80 yen. He has no shame. Only housewives understand what it's like to run a household, I said, taking a big swig of my highball, but my husband was pretending not to have heard. He was spreading a bath towel and, de and demurely folding one corner to another. Utterly shameless, I thought again. You wouldn't know anything about being a housewife, raising my voice without meaning to. My husband, who was sitting flat on the wood floor, Tap his hands moving, folding the laundry assiduously. There's no point in clinging to me like this, I said to my husband's back. It only relieves the suffering a tiny bit. It doesn't get rid of the temptation. I think you may well give in to it already, actually. What's the point of killing yourself trying to keep up with the appearances of being human? Letting the headache and the alcohol loosen my tongue. I hurl my real feelings at him. The words seem to spew out of me in a torrent in exact proportion to the amount of fritters that he forced me to eat. You only say that the trick husband. My husband, who still had his back to me, suddenly emitting a screeching high-pitched voice that I have never heard before from somewhere and around hid the nape of his neck. I was speechless. I can tell! You're going to leave me because you've gotten tired of me, aren't you? He was speaking in peculiar tone and I wondered whether he was trying to sound like me. His back started to quiver and then the back of his head moved strangely and as though I was watching fast forwarded footage his short hair starting to grow furling and unfurling the inchworms crawling and the squirming tips move as one mars his shoulders copying the length of my hair why do you want to be the wife so badly I said don't turn it to me be something better my husband finally stopped folding laundry. I saw his ears twitch like the ears of some wild animals. Husband, go be a creature of the mountain, I commanded. His body started to shake violently as though it had completely loose shaped. Its outline blurred and his back ballooned up to double its size and then shrank down and it was much smaller over and over. But he still refused to turn around so that I could f see his face. And struck with terror, I decided I had nothing to lose. I shouted, You can stop being house shaped. You can stop being husband shaped now. Take whatever form you want to be. The distending body of my husband exploded with a loud pop. It settled to the floor in countless small clumps. I switched off the TV and gingerly peered over to 
peered over toward the laundry where clumps where the clumps had fallen. Oh I cried out. A single mountain peony was blooming behind the stack of bath towels. It had translucently fine white petals and looked nothing at all like my husband. I never knew he wanted to be such a dainty creature. My eyes were wide with surprise at it at it at its delicateness. As the only proof that it had once been my husband, the mountain peony stem was growing straight out of the pair of his underwear. A married couple was a strange thing. Although we had lived in such close proximity and spent our days and nights together, I hadn't had the faintest inkling that my husband's desire had been to be a single bloom of mountain peony. After daybreak, I took the mountain peony back to the mountain. I, played, I planted him in a quiet sunny spot where the rocky clearing where we had set Sancho free, next to a purple gentian that was in bloom so he wouldn't be so lonely. Back at the apartment, I made myself breakfast, washed a single set of dishes, did one person's work of laundry, ran a bath for one, and got into bed. When I closed my eyes, I sensed a fuzz my fuzzy contour clamoring to re reconstitute itself. This is mine? This is all mine? I touched my still humming body and felt amazing. The following year in late spring, I went to see my husband, who had turned into a mountain peony. My husband was in bloom, vivaciously displaying a white flower, as pretty and unafraid as a paper lantern. Moved nearly to tears, I gazed for a while at this beautiful form. The gentian at his side, not to be outdone, was also flowering elegantly. I lingered there, contented, until I felt ready to leave. I got up slowly and noticed that the two flowers looked very much like each other. I examined them more closely. I started to feel a chill, and I fled from the rocky clearing and left the mountain without looking back. And that was the end of an exotic marriage by Yukiko Motoya. <sighs> what do you make of it? I need to reread this on my own time. This writer seems to have a lot of issues with marriage. But then she's Japanese, so I, I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> Alright, let me see. Uh, we have about uh, half a book to go. But we are it. No. Mm, we have about, let me see. One, two, three, four, five, six. We have six more short stories to go. I don't mind reading them, but I need a quick break if you will allow me to. Or do you guys want to come back tomorrow? Am I taking, am I taking too much of your time? today if I continue reading let me know if you want me to continue reading or not uh, we only we only have six short stories to go basically but I need a quick maybe 10 minutes uh, food break No, I just if I don't want to 
continue reading and then make you all feel like you all have to stay here, you know what I mean? Um... Oh! Hey, Dimitri! <laughs> yes, I'm back! Okay, since Dimitri is here, we gotta read. <laughs> it's no Dimitri. No Dimitri is here, so I have to read. <laughs> you you guys can. I mean, you guys don't have to stay if you go. You guys have something to do, like other events to attend to or whatever. But I'm just gonna continue reading, so I don't have to separate the book because it's like just one book basically, and it's all short stories, so I can continue reading. And Dimitri is here, so Dimitri, you have. Uh, uh, if uh, I talk a little bit about this earlier before I started the stream, but I will talk about it later. How 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 I have been. Uh, yeah, I'm so sorry that I've been away for so long. I'm really I really apologize that I've, I haven't streamed for like two months. Um, I think three months. Yeah, I think my last stream is like. October. Yeah, I'm so sorry. I have books lined up, but I was, I was just like really busy. I'll tell you more later. But okay, give me give me a good uh, uh, food break. I need I need to eat real 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 quick. Like real quick. <laughs> You guys don't. You guys don't have to stay if you don't want to. But I will continue reading the book since uh Dimitri is here. I think Dimitri will enjoy it. Um, we have six short stories to go. Uh, Dimitri, we are reading a short story compilation book by a, a very a, a pretty young, like upcoming, up and coming Japanese writer called Yukiko Motoya, and uh, the book is called um, Picnic in the Storm. And so far, it's a very like very weird exploration of human and human behavior and stuff. So I'm I'm enjoying it. It's very very creative. Uh, lit lit literally, it's very very creative. Yeah. But okay, can you, yeah, I'm gonna quickly go grab something to eat. I'm I'm gonna be right back. Uh, and I got like and chat with you guys for a bit. Uh, but if you guys if you guys have somewhere to attend to or somewhere to go, don't 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 hesitate to go. You guys are not trapped in this stream. <laughs> go go and have fun. I'm gonna be right back.
sorry, I'm bad. I really need to eat. I'm really hungry. Like, I'm serious hungry. <sighs> okay. Alright, guys. How are you guys doing? Let's chat. Let's, let's chat. <laughs> let's talk. How are you guys doing? How are you guys bored? How do you guys find the writing style? I actually think that she's really good. I really think she's very very good actually. Dimitri, you missed you missed out like half more than half of the book. If you are still here, Dimitri. <laughs> so why have I begun? Um I've hang on. Super late lunch. Um fried fish egg um uh, fried fish, fried egg um French bean. No, I'm, I, okay, I didn't, I didn't give up, <laughs> Kai, I mean, okay, um, I think long story short is that I have, okay, there's two, there's two factors why I've been missing, I think, um, one is, um, I was extremely busy in October and November. Um, I was traveling a lot um, for work. Um, so it was like really, 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 really hard. It's really hard for me to... Sorry if you guys hear me chewing, okay? But I, I'm really hungry. Um, very very hard for me to plan any sort of like um, stream um, it's, it's just very difficult to plan any stream even even when I'm back at <clears throat> back at where I am right now um, I, I had so much work that it, it's just insane basically and I what and I have to do a lot of work because of the situation I was in, so it's just really really hard to to plan out like a, a stream schedule, uh, and being the somewhat perfectionist that I try to be, that I always have like posters of like I always make like posters of like books that before I read and all that stuff, and. Okay, it's not, okay, so it leads to, so when I came back early this month, so I could probably start like early this month, but I didn't because basically the whole thing lead into me getting extreme anxiety about streaming. Mm. I would think, why bother? Nobody's watching. I would think, why bother? Nobody cares. Uh, I would think, who's even listening <laughs> anymore? So a lot of like the negative um, anxiety stuff. Uh, which made, which made me not want to stream. There are it's a couple of times when I just want basically like today. I just decided that like, I will stream today, you know. But 
when I think that maybe like in like the next second or something I'll be like nah no I'm not gonna stream I don't understand why because it's not that I have to perform or anything I'm not like you know those proper v VTuber who is like have a personality to, to entertain others I'm just I'm just me and I'm <clears throat> I'm just me and I'm I just read books so I don't know why I'm so anxious about everything or care so much about viewers Um, yeah, I don't know why I care. So I just like, I just want to do what I like to do. So I, I, I spend like weeks just ruminating bad thoughts and stuff. So yeah, I'm not exactly the most healthiest, uh, mental health wise. Um, just a lot of basically it's very hard to explain basically a lot of anxiety about streaming and and the, i will get days like this when i feel like oh who the fuck cares i'll just stream you know but most of the time it's like most, most of the time it's like yeah i i i don't know who actually care <laughs> Who, who actually care if, if I stream or not, so... But... Don't worry. Aww, you silly. You don't have to. Merry Christmas. Thank you. Sorry, I got nothing for you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, I'm sorry for missing in action for so long. I really apologize. Um, uh, I'm sorry. Don't worry. Okay, all I can say is don't worry. If okay, this is gonna sound really concerning, but if one day I'm gonna disappear from the face of the earth, uh, I would definitely let you guys know. That's all I can say. <laughs> um, I will let you. I will let y'all know. Don't worry. Or or, or I will let the know the end. Let y'all know. Don't worry, okay? Don't worry. <laughs> I never done this to for okay. I never done this I never started this for viewers. But Sometimes there are days when I read and there's absolutely no one watching and that's when I feel very 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 down. Like what, like why am I doing this again, <laughs> you know? But I, I forget that I'm doing this for myself. Well, in a way, with the with the many, 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 many reading videos that I have produced so far, which is a lot of them, in a way, I have already have enough time uh, recorded on Earth that will stay probably forever, unless YouTube delete all my videos or Twitch delete all my videos.
No, the traveling is the traveling wasn't for fun. The traveling is for work, so it's, it's like really not fun. Let's just let's just say, let's just say, October and September weren't good months for me. And I would like to erase it from my brain. I mean, okay. So when I was <clears throat> in my neighboring country, I did meet up with some friend to go for like theme park and stuff. That was nice. But other than that, it was just a lot of working. Yeah. So, like I said, I started because I want to do this for myself. And then I got trapped in this Twitch thing where... Where, where somehow I need, I feel like I need to be validated by numbers which made me forget that I'm doing this for myself you know so this morning I woke up and I think you know what even if there's nobody here anymore I will, I will still read But not every day I feel that way. So, you know how I used to plan what book I'm going to read, right? Starting from today onward, no, no, I don't get, I don't give a damn. I will stream. When I feel like streaming, and I'll read whatever book that I want to read. I mean, the second part is already true, because I never really taken anyone's advice. <laughs> I never really, <laughs> I never really ask anyone for suggestions. Um, but just so you know, we have at least like five books planned out after this book. So, even if I I read uh, I stream sporadically, we have a lot of content for next year. New book, new book next year. Read it on books that okay. So from now onwards, all the books that I have, all the books that I am going to read, I have not read them before. So basically, I'm reading them with you all. I mean, I could make like a short announcement like, oh, I'm going to be reading this book <clears throat> next week. So maybe that will give you time to go buy it and read with me. But I will not do those posters things anymore. Um, I, I simply, that, th that thing has started to become an anxiety thing for me to do like, I gotta make it look pretty. I gotta do. The, I got. I got to do this. I gotta. I gotta. I gotta. I gotta. You know that 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 thing in my head. So I I don't want to do that anymore. So what will happen is, I will wake up. <coughs> if I don't have work, I'll start my stream right away, and I'll start reading whatever book that I already have in my hand. All right. 
I have finished eating my food even though I was talking at the same time. I'm, I have a special talent. Um, I'm going to be right back in about two minutes and then we're going to continue reading. We're going to finish this book at a go. Let's go, basically. I'll be right back. I'll start doing my stream a little bit later like this so Dimitri can join us. Also, thank you Dimitri for the sub. Seriously, you're like one of the two person who sub. <laughs> okay, sorry for the sappy story guys i don't mean to be sappy all the time but um <coughs> but i you know me uh if you know me you know me you know that I don't. I I am as <coughs> I am as um, truthful and honest as I can ever be, um, because I don't want I don't want I don't want to hide the fact that I am not super mentally well, basically. Uh, and I struggle a lot I struggle a lot a lot a lot and in 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 this world right in this current world where we have social medias and everything we we tend to see the perfect the, the, the perfect side of everything and everyone and that's not what I want to portray myself to be um, because I'm not nobody is fucking happy all the time but obviously obviously I'm not depressed all the time but but I struggle with it a lot so it's just something that I struggle with so I just want to be honest and truthful with what with my with my struggle so that it normalizes 
people talking about how things are affecting them or how life is very very hard <laughs> for some of us um, and uh, yeah because I'm not a character. That's why I could. That's why I'll never say that I'm a VTuber because I'm not. I may use. I may use a a VTuber model thing, but I'm not a VTuber because I'm not a character. I'm not playing a character. I'm. I'm. I am who I am. Except that I won't tell you my full name. <laughs> but I am who I am, and I'm not ashamed of that. I'm just tired of being myself sometimes. And I'm also fear that you guys are tired of me sometimes, so <clears throat> I'm I'm trying to find a good balance where I can be myself, but I can also be someone that can help you with uh, reading, whether it's pronunciation, which I cannot help you that much because I'm not English is my second language so I struggle with it too um, but if I can help you read easier whereby I've I have literally got a message on my <clears throat> YouTube that Somebody literally wrote, Never w would I have thought a VTuber would be helping me with my schoolwork. Thank you very much. So, yeah. <laughs> or, I got a quiz on this shit today. Listening and reading along with this help thank you and you know people discussing about stories the, the novels in my comment section on youtube those are precious to me i love that i love that and i want to be that person for you guys but i just i just struggle with myself and I don't want to lie to you guys. I don't want to tell you guys, oh, I, oh everything is fine. I, I was just busy, that's all. No, I struggle this couple of months. And I'm still struggling because I hate the holiday season. And I hate the new year. Maybe that's why I'm here. So I can keep my minds out of everything. Anyway, this break is taking too long. <coughs> We're gonna finish up. Okay? We're gonna finish up this book. So, for those who have just joined us today, uh, for those who have just joined us today, and I am very, very sorry to those who have had to listen to me uh, yodel about my fucking miserable life. Uh, I apologize for that. Uh, but, for those who have joined us right now, we are currently reading a book by. A short story compilation book by uh, Yuriko Motoya called Picnic in the Storm. We are halfway through. We have six more short stories to go. And uh, we are going to continue. We are going to continue with the short story named Paprika. Paprika Jiro. Paprika Jiro. Mm-hmm. I agree. Okay. Paprika Jiro by Yuriko Motoya. <clears throat> Sorry.
The first time Paprika Jiro saw it happen, he was 10 years old, helping his grandpa with his green grocer's store in the market. Jiro worked hard, calling out to customers to buy their fruits and vegetables so that he could contribute to his family's meager income. When he made a sale, he had to step on a wooden crate to reach the hanging basket where they deposited their earnings. Grandpa's knees and hips weren't what they used to be, and he rarely got up from the barrel these days, but Jiro was the apple of his eye, <coughs> and customers never failed to compliment him on what, a f on what a fine grandson he had. Other stalls in the market kept animals in cages to draw in customers, so Paprika Jiro did his best to compete by singing out the names of the fruits and vegetables. In his clear boy soprano, his voice made people stop and listen and brought a smile to their faces. He was going to inherit the stall one day. It should have been his dad, but he was a ne'er ne do well who drank. It was the end of another day. Grandpa laid a gentle hand on Paprika Jiro's head. Time to be getting home? Yes, Grandpa? That was when they turned up. Jiro heard a woman scream and looked up and saw something approaching from the other end of the market, setting off what looked like fireworks of fish and meat and flowers, destroying stalls left and right. Jiro gaped at the sight when he was startled into action by the cries of confusion and panic from the people around him. They're here! They're back! Come on, Grandpa, let's go! Jiro tugged at Grandpa's sleeve, but Grandpa didn't budge. Jiro brought him his cane, but Grandpa would not take it. The ground rumbled as the thing approached, blowing up stalls and gathering speed. There were distant sounds of gunfire. Jiro asked Grandpa why wouldn't he move. Grandpa smoothed his frantic grandson's head again and said, Getting chased on purpose, those pe those folks, just to wreck our stalls. Jiro didn't understand. An Asian man making a kung fu type movement and pretty white woman hurtled past in a tangle of legs. The man lost his balance and barreled head first into Grandpa's stall. All too easy, the wheels came off and with a loud noise, the fall the stall fell on its side. The basket full of coins they had worked all day to collect, spill and roll away. The man... Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the follow. I'm not sure what happened, but there should be... Oh, thank you. Thank you for the follow. Yes, I hit 190. Now I have to change to one, 200. Hang on. <laughs> Hang on. Okay. <coughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you for the follow. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. I got 200 balls. I don't know what happened. There, there should be a... Maybe I need to up, update something. There should be something that pop up when someone follow me. I need to check after this. <laughs> anyway, sorry. Let's continue reading. <coughs> The man leapt, leapt neatly to his feet, and he and the woman ran off, neither of them showing a speck of interest in the destruction of the stall. But Paprika Jiro had noticed how the man had lost his balance on purpose, even though there had been nothing at his feet to trip over. The man and the woman had made sure there were vegetables flying through the air, and then exchanged a satisfied smile. Soon, man in black 
suits came running after the two of them, shooting guns and rays, anything that was still standing, like a pair of clippers buzzing the hair off someone's head. Once they were gone, the market people went about quietly picking up the debris scattered all over the street. No one uttered a word of complaint. It was as though they had been hit by a tornado of some other natural phenomenon. Just another part of being a market trader, Grandpa said placidly. In the years that followed, Jiro saw them come back time after time without no, with, with no warning to destroy the stalls and disappear. Grandpa was killed by a stray bullet from the man in black. When Jiro first took over the stall, he tried to improve it by borrowing a top from a friend to make a roof, but no sooner had he installed it, they began to fall from the sky. They bounced off the top and then fell straight through it, reducing the stall splinters. No matter how where he moved the stall, they kept coming. As long as he continued to trade in the open, they found him. They were like an infestation of bugs crawling out of the woodwork. Just once, Paprika managed to grab on the hem of the trouser of the very last suited man just as he hit the ground. Why do you do this? Who are you? Why? What did we ever do to you? Jiro shouted in English that he had memorized specially. The man in his uh, the man his eyes hidden behind sunglasses. Jiro stood upright with surprising gentleness and rubbed away a streak of dirt from his face. Jiro felt his hope rise. He would finally get some answers. But the man who just quirked both ends of his mouth 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 out and then made a beeline for the big metal gong that hung from the iron monger's stall. When Jiro quit the vegetable stall to become the market's pigeon seller, he returned immediately and liberated every last one of his pigeons before he could say a word. The whole market accepted them as a fact of life. No one else wondered where they had come from or where they were going, but Paprika Joe wanted to know the truth. One night, he filled a big pot of glue and placed it in front of the mall. A few days later, when he heard the woman scream at the entrance of the market, he stripped naked and jumped inside. Jiro waited inside the slimy pot of glue, pinching his nose and holding his breath. The sound of chaos gradually got louder until he heard something break nearby. One of them thundered through the pot where Jiro was hiding and smashed straight into it. Covered head to toe in glue, Jiro, Paprika Jiro, stuck to the back of, a, of one of the men in suit and watched the market grow smaller and smaller behind him. Once they had cleared the village and entered the, the desert, the man gave a strange cry Hurray! and ran as fast as the wind. Jiro discovered that what he had assumed to be a dark business suit was actually just skin that looks like a suit. Even the sunglasses were part of the man's body. Gradually, a group of large-breasted women and well-muscled men gathered behind Jiro in a line that trailed into the distance. The numbers swelled and swelled. They fired their guns wildly and as they ran, retrieved and ate fruits and vegetables they had somehow taken from the market from the inside of the pockets of their skin. When the night fell, they ran even faster. Eventually, the glue peeled and Paprika Joe G Paprika Jiro fell off into the d desert. It took him seven days and seven nights to get back to the village. Paprika Jiro remains a market trader today. These days, he sees them less and less often because no one really believes in them anymore, says the ironmonger. Once in a while, they still come through just like old times in high style in a cloud of dust and mayhem. As a mark of the utmost respect, Paprika Jiro does his best to react in exaggerated astonishment as the Korean true fearlessly confronting obstacles head on. <laughs> and that was it. <laughs> Some of these stories make no sense, but I am entertained. I do be liking it.
<coughs> sorry. Sorry guys, let me... Uh, probably because I haven't logged in for so long that oh, <laughs> I was logged out from my... Uh, today yeah sorry let me check something real quick yeah, it's like really short, but like short and sweet, I guess. Sorry, it was really quick. I really, it's bothering me and I need to check in. should be working now but who knows fucking annoying hello to anyone who just joined my stream hello um let me see should be fine I got like it should be fine <laughs> it's annoying uh, let me try something real quick probably have to restart my stream and stuff, I guess. Because, yeah, it's not... It's 
definitely not connected right now. Shut the button, eh? I'm sorry I have to fix this right now. It's stupid. You know, it doesn't make sense. Okay. Hello, guys. Okay. I need to check something. I'm sorry, guys. Sorry, uh, probably will be. Uh, I have to restart my stream tomorrow. If I stream tomorrow, maybe tomorrow will be. Uh, will will be fine. For now, it's broken. My apologies, guys. I don't mean. I should have checked this earlier. I didn't know shit. Uh, how to burden the girl not playing what I want to play. <laughs> anyway, okay. Um we're gonna continue reading. Next one is called How to Burden the Girl by Yukiko Motoya.
What was I thinking? Getting involved with a girl like her. The only reason I was interested in the first place was that I thought she was an innocent young thing standing up to an evil gang all on her own. I had no interest. Sorry. I had no intention of getting mixed up in such a violent love affair. You said you would do anything to get to know me, she said, inching closer again. I had said that, sure, but I was 34. I was dubious about my chances of understanding someone so much younger than I was. And anyway, I know nothing about women. I just thought that she must be lonely with what her entire family had been killed by an evil gang. So the words had just slipped out. There was no need for her to take them seriously. She moved slowly toward me. She had just blown the heads off the 19 evil henchmen. I watched her closely while I retreated. I looked at the tears of blood. She was crying because her beloved father had just become the last of the family to die, killed in a manner so diabolically cruel as to seem beyond human imagining. The special tears were the whole reason the gang was after her. I didn't know the details. I had simply been taken by the way the girl's thighs, thighs looked sticking out of her skirt. The pink hair, the emerald green eyes, those were a little freakish, admittedly, but they didn't bother me. I had thought some of them must have just come like I thought some of them must have just come like that. My old man would cry and sigh and call me a hopeless ignoramus if he knew. My mother walked out on the two of us a long time ago, so he's all the family I've got. I kept creeping backward and before I knew it, I had left the living room. My food came up against the staircase of the hall. Her house was enormous. She, her father, and her five brothers had moved here sometime last year, settling into a quiet life next door to a house that I've always lived in. It looked like the girl's father took care of all the errands and things in the huge house behind the high wall. So at first, I was simply excited to know there was some someone next door in the same situation as I was. I rarely feel any curiosity towards un other people. But I took to watching her, watching her through the windows occasionally, and would see her taking really good care of her five little brothers. This made me feel pretty inadequate. I leave all my cleaning and laundry to, the, to my old man. His stuff, I leave up to him too. At some point, I started to find it strange that she never left the house. What's more, the five little brothers who look so alike they could have some quintuplets seem to be disappearing one by one. I mean, one day there were only four boys playing in the garden, and then there were three, and then two. The, the little brothers carry on tumbling around the ground looking carefree, but on the day just after one had vanished, the father would usually come out and hold the girl's hand as she sat in a chair on the deck. On those days, she would forgo her usual bare legs and cover up in some dark outfit, looking gloom. But why no funeral? Why no police? One night, I saw one of the little boys nearly get snatched by members of an evil gang and knew that was what they were I knew what that was what they were because their getup was pretty unmistakable. Mask faces, capes and in black from head to toe. The girl and the father were fighting them off in the garden, him with a gun and her with a kind of long sword that I thought only existed in movies. People around here pay no mind to moderate amount of noise or gunfire because there's a massive ballpark around the corner. Their hearing shot. I was taken aback by the girl's almost superhuman physical ability. Her father looked realistically enough like a man holding a gun, but, but the skill which she wielded her sword as she killed those henchmen was way out of the ordinary. I should have realized then that she was different from your average woman. But what can I say? The only person I could compare her to was my old man. They managed to save the little kid from being taken. 
that day, but a few days later, the gang came back and killed the, killed the kid in a gruesome fashion. That was my first sight of her tears of blood. The gang members held her down, used a dropper to collect a few vial tears into the vial, and disappeared into the woods behind the house with a purposeful swirl of their capes. The garden was littered with the bodies of little boy and numerous dead henchmen. Then there was a the girl sitting on the ground clutching grass and her father coming up to her and gently putting his hand on, on her shoulder. I started to piece the situation together. The gang was after her for whatever reason and it was no use trying to run because they'd catch up at some point. So the father so the girl and the father were trying to force a showdown next door. That's much I got. I did think maybe their plan was in a little bit of a rut. What with the way the gang seemed to insist on attacking the house repeatedly instead of just taking the girl hostage. Or the way she and the father let the little boys roam around from the taking when they could have been when they could have been kept out of harm's way in a shelter somewhere. But I don't like to sweat the details. That being said, if it had been occurred to me, surely it had occurred to her that once all the little brothers were dead, her father would be next. Reduced to just the two of them, the girl and the father expanded their arsenal and kept their guard up around the clock. It was impossible, so they, was, they were staying put because... They were using the father as a bait to lure out the evil gang and eradicate them once and for all instead of trying to find their HQ. The epic battle racked up mountains of dead hench henchmen until one day it all came to an end. Her father was finally taken down. The gang took just one drop of her blood tears and left as usual. The girl sat on the lawn and wept. Her father, who had always been there to hold her hand, had now been blown to smithereens. Seeing how she was suffering, I was moved, despite not being in the habit of empathizing with people, to pop on a pair of sandals and make my way to, to the stately and by now familiar garden next door. I entered the ground through the segment of the wall that had been damaged in the fighting. When I got closer to her, I saw the grass where she was sitting was entirely slick with red. This with the tears whose mysterious powers the gang was after. They didn't even raise her head as I approached. What do you what do you do to get a woman to stop crying in a situation like this? Chin up now, I said, trying to keep the squeak out of my voice. I told her that I understood how she felt losing her last living relative. That I had no one beside my daughter in old man. I thought I might be in love. As she raised her face, I saw a red tear trail down her cheek and I knew I would do anything to take her father's place as her right hand man. I didn't know how to shoot a gun, but perhaps I could learn to drive instead. I hardly recognized myself. I knew what this was called unconditional love. The gang would probably be after me, but being beside her even just briefly would be worth it my very first experience of love for a fellow human being i would bear my heart to her tell her everything how i had never been able to sympathize with anyone before but would try to understand the loneliness that must come from having such extraordinary abilities that we had no doubt faced plenty of obstacles but hey there's always my old man she had been still for so long, but suddenly she got to her feet. Love, she said, moving towards me, head angled inquiringly. Love? Love? You think you still love me once you heard what I've got to say for myself? I didn't know why she was acting so aggressive towards a guy who was obviously trying to help. But... I figure she was probably confused. Nothing you can say will shock me, I said, affecting calm, nodding like a man of the world. I hadn't brought up my spying on her, but it was possible she had been aware of me for some time. Oh, this is my own fault, she said. 
for falling in love with my father. I was dumbstruck. She looked into my eyes to make sure that I was listening and began her tale. I was 10 years old when mother first suspected I had designs on father. She kept warning him. Damn. <laughs> Damn. Thank you. For the follow. <laughs> yes. I was 10 years old when mother first suspected I had designs on father. She kept warning him, but he kept brushed, he always brushed her off, told her not to be absurd, said that she had a bee in her bonnet and that I was only a child. But mother was right. I meant to take him away from her. I used every trick in the book to turn them against each other. They've been so close. My father defended me until the very end saying that saying it didn't do to suspect a child. He wasn't interested in knowing the truth. He wanted to think of his daughter as some kind of an angel. He should have realized that it that was hopelessly naive if he remembered anything about being ten himself. She stepped towards me, holding out her little hand. I should have been thrilled, but my body felt all tense, looking for a way to escape. Mother seethed, grew hysterical. Unable to prove that I was a wicked child, she finally cracked and shouted at me and raised her hand in anger. That was the moment I had been looking for. I stumbled hard on purpose, fell into the road. I was taken to the hospital and have to have dozens of stitches, but after that court made sure that she would never see me again. Father, who had ad adored her gentle nature, divorced her and we moved away together. Do you see? I got the law on my side. That's why mother joined the evil gang. She needed to find something that was more powerful than the law. I'm sure she made a study of every conceivable means of murder purely to make me suffer. You know about the wonderfully imaginative, almost artistic way each of my brothers were killed. You couldn't do that without genuine love of killing or some serious obsession. <laughs> she gave me no time to respond. One other thing. Those weren't my little brothers. They were our children, mine and father's. I could hardly go to the clinic, so I gave birth to them all at home in the kitchen. I admit, I was pretty surprised when the triplets turned up. This isn't a fight for justice, she said, pausing at last. It's a deeply personal matter. I tried to rouse my stiff tongue. but. Aren't I collecting your tears? I said. Those tears of blood. I thought they had some kind of a special power. The tears? She shrugged. Who knows? They don't do a thing. Mother just takes them as trophies for the misery she causes me drop by drop. I had obviously gotten everything wrong. What with the pink hair? Then the fact that she was just a girl, I had just assumed that she was a plucky young thing fighting on the side of good. I wanted to get away, but she just kept trying to come closer. I'd inch my way back over the deck and found myself inside the house. Do you really love me? She sounded sweet, but I no longer felt like saying yes. I should really go check on my old man. I said, gesturing vaguely toward my house. He, he hasn't gotten anyone but me to look after him. She seemed to sense that advantage was hers. Grabbing my arm, she said, If you love me, then find out how it feels to be me. How it feels to lose your family. You try it. I realized a while ago that I was over my head, but it wasn't going to be easy to get off the hook. I couldn't let my smile sleep just yet. L lose my family? I couldn't kill my old man, I said. 
That's not what I meant. To feel what I feel. She said, immobilizing me with one hand. You need to seduce him. I need to... If you want to get to know me. But um, that's what you need to do. I hadn't been lying when I said I wanted to understand her. But there was no way I was going to seduce my geriatric father. Uh, just picturing it made acid rise in the back of my throat. Aside from mother, no one realized that I had seduced father, not even the father himself. He was so full of guilt for having ruined my life. And I planned to use that to make sure we went on living together like man and wife. With mother legally out of the picture, there was nothing to stop me from lying to everyone else and taking the secret of my wickedness to the grave, or so I assumed. But I was wrong. Because then it all started. First my hair. I used to have beautiful black hair. But soon it started to turn pink. Have you ever had a dream that, 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 that you, you, you could do? Yes, it works now. <laughs> Thank you. I was wrong because then it started. It all started. First, my hair. I used to have beautiful black hair, but soon it started to turn pink from the roots out. I dyed it, but it wouldn't take. When I woke up the next day, the pink color would be deeper than other, than ever. That wasn't all. It grew out at an incredible rate. I always wore my hair in a bob, but now it just comes down to my waist. Eventually, I gave up cutting it because it just keeps growing. Next was my eyes. Each time I look into a mirror, my irises has lost some of its dark color until they finally, they were finally emerald green, like a doll. Then my brothers, <laughs> but I told you that they were mine and my father's children. But the thing is, we only ever conceived the first one. The rest of them, we don't recall making. So all we were doing was living together but my belly keeps swelling and I was trapped in a hell of perpetual mourning, sickness and contractions then when I was giving birth the baby's little heads would get caught and putting me in agony some of them get caught got stuck for too long and they don't make it I was gradually starting to understand what these changes meant the some force out there that wasn't going to let me get away with what I had done to father, even if I had managed to fool everyone else. Soon, I couldn't even leave the house. <laughs> Thanks to my outlandish appearance, in the early days, we kept moving from one place to the next, but every time we did, I got pregnant with another one, so we decided we'd go somewhere new, buy a house and stay put. Once we got here, my perpetual pregnancy is finally let up. We breathe a sigh of release, relief, thinking we might have been forget forgiven at last. But there was another change yet to come. You know what I'm talking about? I said the first thing that came to my mind. The tears? That's right. She nodded, clutching my arm. I started to cry tears of blood. Was this some kind of a sick joke? I was too confused to work out where her lies started or how exactly she was different from other women. I mean, they were all completely foreign to me to begin with. I tried to pry her hand off my arm, but she wouldn't let go and kept talking as though she was trying to unburden herself by confessing everything. It was infuriating. I kicked her in the gut as hard as I could and I made a 
a mad scramble, half leap, half tumble down to the garden and clambering towards the shadowy darkness. Seduce your father! I heard her cry. Then you'll know what I'm talking about! I had meant to aim for home. But I found myself in the woods behind her house, through which the evil gang always made its exit. I ran and ran and the trees went on forever. There was no way it could be so fast. Father! Father! I, ca I shouted. But maybe he didn't hear. There was no sign of anyone coming to help. I saw that I was surrounded by countless of mound soils where the girl and the father had buried gang members they had killed daily. There were capes and moss scattered everywhere. Farther on, I came across five secluded graves. After a while, I finally, I finally spotted the lights on in my house. I went into my room and slipped quietly into the bed. The next day, my old man brought me some lunch. The moment I clapped my eyes on him, I remembered the night before and promptly lost the will to eat his food. I couldn't even bring myself to speak to him. That was the end of How to Burden the Girl. <laughs> I like everyone's reaction to the incest. Hey. Hey. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Stop it. I, I know you will say that. <laughs> No, you will say that. <laughs> okay, next story. The woman. Man. I can't tell whether this writer is trying to make women sound good or bad. <laughs> and she's a, she, I mean, it's a she as well, the writer. Alright, next. <clears throat> For those who just join us, we are currently reading uh, Yuriko Motoya's uh, com short story compilation called uh, Picnic in the Storm. The current story is The Women. It's called the women. There was nothing to be done. No matter how many times I asked why, all she would tell me was she was challenging me to a duel. I begged her to reconsider, but it was no good. She was the kind of girl who would call me every night when we first started, started going out just to check that we are really dating a lover who is so slender she looked like she might break if you embraced her I couldn't believe it she stood up as if to say there was nothing more to discuss and asked if I would like to do it by the river how did we get here? I cried could we choose a more romantic location at least? she paused to think and then started listing places that were special to us. The amusement park, the movie theater, the park with unusual swings, the petting zoo, my par our parents' homes, the courtyard at the college where we had met. The river's fine by me, I said. She nodded. Anywhere much farther and we'll have to drive which will be fine for getting there but will be tricky on the way back she said of the two of us i was the only one who drove my suggestion that we wait until it got dark was rejected 
Her excitement seemed to mount as we searched for the perfect spot along the river. I stole a glance at her profile, saw the upper lip curl back, exposing her teeth. I had no idea why she felt so passionately about fighting me. I just want to know why, I said again in tears. She was breathing heavily. <sighs> Another man came over the bank, led by his girlfriend. He also had tears rolling down his face. For a second I thought an enormous mirror had appeared in front of us. The girl reminded me of my girlfriend. She was short and energetic looking with an attractive what an attractive face. The man was like me, nervous and pale, with a way there. As we passed each other, I noticed something that took me by surprise. The girl was holding what looked like a dog's leash, the other end which what the other end of which stretched up to the top button of the man's shirt. I tried to pretend I hadn't noticed it, but I couldn't help myself from looking at the collar around his neck. No good spots back there? The girl said. She may or may not have noticed me staring. We have just come out ourselves. We weren't sure which way to go, my girlfriend said. She was still panting. <sighs> Same here, the girl said. We just decided to follow the river. The two of them moved towards each other and started exchanging information. Making it seem like the man and I should probably be talking to each other too. Um, hello, I said, and nodded exploratively. For a second, I was worried he couldn't understand me, but the man in the dog collar looked at my drying tears and in a surprisingly normal voice said, So, it's happening to you too. He wore glasses and would have looked like a trustworthy office worker if not for the wrinkles in his suit. I didn't know how to react because the girl was a few steps away and the leash was now pulled taut, making it even less possible to ignore the collar around his neck. What has? I said. You're the same as me, he said. What are you talking about? Am I right in thinking you have been challenged to a duel? I look over at our girlfriends and in alarm. So that girl was also about to... Shh! Beat up! He admonished me without taking his eyes off my face. He sounded sharper than I expected. Maybe he had a position of authority in his company in spite of the dog collar. It's our fault, he said quickly, moving only his mouth as though the rest of his face had turned to stone. Your fault? I almost asked, except a sense he meant to imply, Im implicate me when he said the fault was ours. When I didn't say anything, he continued. Didn't you wish for a more exciting lover? This is all because of the, de of the desires of men like us, the women. There's a sharp pull on the leash, and I saw the light disappear from his eyes as, as he turned to plot after his girlfriend. After that, we met many similar couple. All men walked three steps behind the women with sad expressions and head bowed as if they were accepting their heavy punishment. As we passed each other, they signaled mutely to me with their eyes. The women were starting to salivate. My girlfriend was walking in front of me, but I couldn't see her face, but I could hear the occasional watery dribbling sound, so I presumed that it was happening to her too. I had the impression her body was expanding. Her dress, one of her favorite, which she, worn, which she had worn on some of our dates, looked uncomfortably tight. Her breath was getting faster and more rhythmic. <sighs> Her spine was slowly arcing, arching as though it were being pulled by an internal spring. And to think she at once had this perfect posture and she had always looked after her appearance from her shoes to, the, to her meticulous trim bangs. You, you're doing this because of, 
of me? For me? I asked. But she had her nose in the air and was busy sniffling something upwind. She seemed in no condition to talk. Decisively, I stepped in front of my lover and looked into her face. I couldn't be, have been more shocked if she had punched me. Her eyes, which turned, tended to droop demurely, were angled sharply upward, and her eyelashes had grown preter, preternatural, naturally thick and voluminous, and her dark line rim eyes have made and made uh, a dark line rim her eyes and made her seem to be glaring at everything it made me shiver what a provocative look and her mouth too at first i thought she had bitten through her lips by accident but no the pink was gradually flushing from the striking red i reached out and brushed my finger across her lip the color came off of my finger it was lipstick the lipstick her lips were producing their own lipstick. She started making a strange gesture. She was desperately trying to hold down her chin, which kept rising. You want to pull your chin back down? I asked, and her eyes wordlessly answered the affirmative. Using the thumb and index finger carefully to avoid breaking her delicate jaw, I tried repeatedly to push it down, but her jaw pointed resolute upward, immovable. There was nothing more I could do. It was my favorite of her angles. Her, it ac accentuate. It accentuated her beautiful neck and flattered her already slim face. She cried out with an animal sound. What now? She was pulling the hem of her skirt down. I tried to help her. The knee-length skirt of her dress was shrinking upward with incredible force. Stiletto heels were spout sprouting from the soles of her shoes. Not me, I said, shaking my head at her, at her as she grimaced in pain. I'm not the kind of man. Stop trying to defend yourself. This is what you wanted. A man I didn't know yelled at me, and a flying rock grazed the side of my face. When I looked towards where the voice had come from, an old man slowly getting back into a corner by an old woman who was wearing fishnet stocking and a skirt with a hem far north her knees we have accepted that we are responsible for the physical effects they are experiencing he bent to pick up another rock and made an appeasing gesture with his other hand to distract the old woman's attention but why now why all of a sudden sudden hardly this could have happened at any point since humans first appeared on this earth exactly it's a young man sitting behind me, being stared down by a woman in police uniform. Life's not worth living if you're not tending to the whims and demands of high-maintenance lover. Everywhere I look, each and every woman was transforming into a legendary beauty of unbelievable gorgeousness. I turned to my girlfriend, still wiping off the lipstick that keeps staining her lips. I know you're worried about my ex. It's true that... Being with her was exciting. I was on the tenterhooks, but I forgot all about her long ago. If you got the impression I found you in any way lacking, there's no truth at all. Her black rim eye opened wider as she heard what I was saying. So she had the feeling so she had been feeling insecure. Of course, she had never really wanted a duel at all. I continued to wipe off the lipstick. Don't change. I just want you to be yourself. The old woman growled and leaped onto the old man the old man shuffled and fell back he held up his rock but as he was about to strike he stopped himself and slowly lifted both hands above his head the young people behind us had started to i took my lover's hand in mine and resumed walking down the river bank the stilettos growing out of her shoes seemed to have given the ability to move much faster and more dynamically I thought she might have broken some of my fingers. I stopped us every once in a while to wipe off more of the lipstick. lipstick. She was no longer out of breath. Her nose was growing ever more beautiful in the light of the setting sun. Her eyes gave me chills. Her chin was held proudly aloft. Of all the women at the river, she was the most devastating beauty. I was continuously swabbing the lipstick now, but I couldn't help keep up. I'm sorry, I said, crying again. I came to view as we approached the bridge, a classic location for a duel. Several 
Hundred couples engaged in melee, defying all imagining. Battle cries rang out in the distance, screams and clash of weapons, men begging for their lives from lovers who seem beyond language, belated confessions of love. Don't change. I love you just the way you are, I said. There's a death on the riverside. With tears streaming down my face, I pick up a barbed breaking ball from the ground near my feet and swung as though my life depended on it. My girlfriend leaped high into the air and evaded it easily. So I tossed the wrecking ball aside and ran into the river. She chased me with superhuman feet, uh, speed, be, even though the water came to her waist. Just as I thought I had reached to the other side, she grabbed a fistful of my hair from my from behind and yanked it out of my head. A wail of pain escaped my mouth, but I managed to clamber onto the shore and acquire a stun gun from a man who almost mowed me down. When I looked back, my girlfriend was right behind me, coming at me with a ferocious expression that I've never seen before. I pressed the stun gun to her ribs and released the current. She opens her eyes and stumbled backwards. I followed, maintaining pressure of her. Against her body, she staggered and nearly fell. I was about to press the button again when she weakly said, Stop! Please! No more! Help me! Weeping, I swung at her head with a club I had taken off a man I had kicked to the ground. She fell back to the river with a splash and drifted slowly downstream. On the way home, I slowly recited the list of our special place. The amusement park, the movie theater, the park with the unusual swings, the public petting zoo, our parents' house, the courtyard at the college where we met. I knew then that she had let me defeat her. When I told her I loved her just the way she was, it must have gotten through to her somehow. I couldn't stop crying. I walked past the old man who expired, who had expired with his hair arms still outstretched in entreaty. My sweet, kind lover, I'd rather die than ever lose you. <sighs> if only... Her imagination is something, I'll tell you that. <laughs> I wonder how many times... I wonder how many times... She... Some guys cheated on her or something. With... with, with. It seems... It seems that... She had. She must have had an ex-boyfriend who cheated on her with their ex-girlfriend, because it's like a recurring thing, you know. I can feel it. It must have happened to her at least once. That she. It's like it keeps coming up in her writing, you know. Or maybe it's just happening to a lot to to people around her, like her friends or something. What? Like, you know, imagine she's like going out with her friends and her friends telling me, like, oh, my, my boyfriend cheated on me with, my, with his ex girlfriend. And then another friend came in and said, like, yeah, my, boy, my, my boyfriend too. And she has all this inspiration to talk about, like, you know, how. How in. Like, how women tend to feel inferior to another woman. You know? It's pretty common. I feel that. As a woman, I feel that. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> Her imagination is something, I'll tell you that. I, I, I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying it because I haven't read something so imaginative in a long time. So this is kind of fun. Alright, next one. <coughs> next one. So those who currently just joined the stream, we're currently reading uh, Yuriko. 
Motoya short stories. This one is called Q and A. Q and A. In my decades as a columnist, I have been honored to have had the opportunity to respond to the worries and fears of so many women everywhere in the Q&A format. But the time is fast approaching for this celebrated series to come to an end. As you all may have started to suspect, I have reached the limit of my living ability to blithely continue spouting phrases like your feminine radiance or a natural lifestyle and so forth. Not only mentally, but also on the purely physical level. As of this issue, I'm writing to you from a hospital bed. When I expressed my desire to retire from this column, the editorial team was kind enough to ask me to reconsider. It's a reader's favorite, they said. It's been running since our very first issue. You've made it this far, so you may as well make it your life's work. You still have a niche as a grandmother hot in pursuit of beauty beyond age. All much appreciated. Sadly, it is not within my power to live up to these kind of expectations. However, in this issue, my last team had gone all out on a 58-page extravaganza of a feature under the title, If You Can Do It, We All Can. I intend to do my part by responding to as many of your questions as humanly possible. Without further ado, let's start with some from the editorial team. 13 things we all want to know but thought it was probably too late to ask. Thank you as ever for reading. Question. What do you think people think when they think of you? Wah. Okay. Wah. Wait. Hang on. Oh, this is gonna be. This is gonna be personal. Cause when I read the question, I'm going to co- like try to answer it myself. Wah. This is good. This is good. This is good. Holy shit. Sorry. I. Hang on. Tea. <clears throat> oh my god. Hang on. Question. What do you think people think of? People think of. What do you think people think of when they think of you? Answer. Number one. Both men and women find me attractive. Number two. I have a great deal of integrity. Number three, my age and the experiences that have come with it have refined me as a woman. And number four, I keep my promises to family. Question. Tell us about your 30s. Answer. Having just made my start as a cover model from women's magazine at that age and because of the media interest that went with it i felt under pressure to say things that conform to the image of a desirable woman my main fear memory is of women my age who welcomed me as someone who had already born and raised children as a manifestation of the hope that they too could continue to enhance their feminine radiance i enjoyed living up to everyone's ideal and I believe I was doing a good thing I probably had some innate talent for it and soon enough I was in constant demand as a spokesperson and an arbiter of taste a position that was cemented by my advice column which first appeared in this magazine question what did you find difficult about being in the spotlight Expectations about expectation about me soared 
I was someone who knew all there is of love, a connoisseur of the finer things in life, a woman who could take a joke, a lifestyle to aspire to, a style you would want to copy, frank views on sex. I could hardly keep up. Question? What's the total number of questions you have answered over your career? Answer? Thousands? Tens of, tens of thousands? Even people I met in my private life couldn't help but spill their troubles to me within the first 60 seconds of our acquaintance. This magazine's main readership is women in their 20s and 30s, so most of the questions are about love relationships. Your concerns when it comes to love are much less unique and interesting than you imagine. The majority are variation on the following. How can I get the person I'm interested to to talk to me? He's having an affair. He won't have sex with me. My boyfriend's an asshole. And so on. Question. Problems that comes with being an agony aunt. Answer. I started, to f I started to feel that I was continuously giving advice in my daily life whether I was getting my hair done or having a meal or walking a pet. And if I was at lunch and dropped my knife under the table, I would ask myself, does the classy woman pick it herself or does she call a waiter? Walking down the street, it would be, does the sexy woman turn left or does she turn right? While having sex, does the woman of our dreams pursue her climax here, or does she wait? Thank you. Question. In your 40s, you continue to be a leading figure in the World's Woman magazine and one of our most widely admired. However, on television, your somewhat unique voice and personality became the target of humor inspiring jokes and widespread impersonation how did you really feel about it about this answer the imitations were malicious they would trim their bangs into unnaturally straight lines or try to outdo each other with the most pronounced lips or repeat comments that i had said just once as though they were catchphrases and poke fun at and put fun to put fun at them I suppose it was a gradually dawning on it was gradually dawning on people that I was losing my way, and it was true. I didn't know how long I could keep going. I didn't know whether the world was trying to make me into a role model or a clown, and felt like I was walking on tightrope, on an extremely precarious balance. I guess people were watching to see which side I fell on, as I was myself. Question: Your fifties. I wasn't sure if my answers to people's questions were masterfully profundities or the mad, mad, mad mutterings of an old hag. In your 60s? Answer. I stopped caring. Question. In your 70s? Answer. Mad mutterings of an old hag. Question. If you could give one piece of advice to your 20-something self, what would you say? Beware. The pressure of having to represent the platonic ideals of an attractive woman. The constant tension of having to be ready to talk vivaciously about romance 24 hours a day, of exposing cleavage without flaunting it, of making sure to cross and recross your legs while wearing a short skirt. There will be time when all your sex appeal can do for you is to make you want to vomit. Question: How do you feel about the support you have enjoyed from the women readers of all ages? Answer: When so many people were doing impressions of me and the prevailing culture came to see my existence as comical, it was only thanks to the support of my readers that I was able to escape without being escape being swallowed by the whole swirling torrents of malice. At the time, I felt that I was desperately clinging to a small raft and spent months in terror capsizing. The muddy water only kept rising and rising many nights. I woke from the nightmares with the starts and jumped out of my bed in the dark spit to spit out the mud I could taste in my mouth. 
that was that I was able to regain my standing was though nothing had happened no even more to further cement my place in this popular consciousness once I had resigned myself to living as a clown there was nothing so short of mi short of miracle and I owe it to all of you question you have said I can only be me please share the source of your unshakable confidence answer when I had lost my way many times over and I didn't know better turn what I needed to do in order to find myself again was to let myself to do an impression of myself that's right for a long time now I've only been doing what everyone was already doing impersonating me my mannerism my voice the things I say what would I say if I were me what would I do when when what I really want wanted to be was a tap dancer but what does I want to do with anything other people make me into who I am isn't that far more glamorous question do you still do you ever still have doubts answer none whatsoever once I admit the, the decision to live and die with you all, my conviction never wavered. Even now, in my 80s, I still intend to continue to be what every woman aspires to be in both mind and in spirit, albeit from a sick bed. Now, for the very last time, one of the most iconic columns in the history of women magazine and the culmination of my life's work, questions on life and love from you, my readers question I can't leave my boyfriend even though he's physically abusive quote not quote sorry parenthesis nurse 28 years old answer <laughs> okay wait hang on <laughs> oh my god Okay, listen. Question. I can't leave my boyfriend even though he's physically abusive. Parenthesis. Nurse. 28 years old. Answer. Challenge him to a duel. Call him out to the river at midnight. And have at each other once and for all. In the face of your resolute blows, set free from the bounds of reason, he is unlikely to be able to resist picking up a rock. It may hurt. Thank you. It may hurt, but that's where you need to be brave. You will find you already have what it takes inside you. Drift along the border between life and death for a while. Try to act very dead. He will probably be very frightened into leaving the scene without checking whether you are or not. And when he finally goes, take all the time you need to shiver with joy. Does that sound familiar, guys? Question. I always end up waiting for him to call. Parenthesis, aspiring homemaker, 23 years old. Answer, long, long before we learn to wait for things like that, we are always already waiting for something else. We have been waiting our whole lives for the moment when everything we can see vanishes into a puff of smoke. And someone claps their hand and say, your whole life up to now has been a lie. Your real life starts now. Which is to say that he is not the only the one leaving you hanging. Wow, shit, holy fuck. Question. can't seem to meet the right person. Parenthesis. 
office worker, 34 years old. It's about time you face up to the fact that this is a thoughtless delusion. There's no way there isn't a the right person out there for you. After all, aren't we all born right people? What I mean is, we all limit our own options too much. Have you considered someone from a different country? Someone old enough to be your father? Make a change and try to be with a woman. If you still can't find the right person, then try expanding your age range all the way down to newborn. <laughs> Once you have included 10 and 11 years old, the possibilities will only widen. Look into partners you may not have previously considered. Animals are good, as are inanimate objects. If you genuinely desire not to be alone, I recommend you take a bicycle saddle as your next partner. Do you think that's out of the question? But a saddle is shaped surprisingly like a human face. And if you pull it off the bicycle, you can take you can take each other out anywhere. Is that why you cycle so much, Dian? When you <laughs> When you go on a vacation, the money you save on the second fare means you can make many more happy memories than if you were with another human. Best of all, a saddle can't speak. You lament that you cannot find the right person because you have too many expectations of men who speak and end up seeing too many of their failings. But if your partner is a bicycle saddle, there's just one thing you need from them to gently and lovingly support your ass. Your town is overflowing in opportunities for you to meet your future partner. How many bicycle saddles are lying out, out there and outside this train station just waiting for you to choose them? Nothing is stopping you from going up the bike parking and like the king of some small country boldly selecting from their ranks. It may happen when that you fall for a saddle at first sight only for its owner to throw a wrench, a wrench in the path of your love. Hey, you there! What do you think you're trying to do? Take my saddle? Stand firm. Simply tell the owner that while the saddle may as well be as of thousands of them, for you, he is the only one in the world. You suggest that the owner can take your saddle. The one that you have never quite gotten along with. Instead, be sure to carry it around with you for the purpose. Then the majority of saddle owners are sure to agree. Put your heart into it. Convey the depth of the love you feel. Once you're finally alone with your chosen saddles, the rest is up to you lovebirds. Why not tell him by the stem as though he were walking alongside you and skip down the sidewalk together? He will never sniff demissively as a human being. Human men would when you suggest going deer watching for your next date. Even a movie in the most questionable taste will not elicit a yawn. Go to a museum, see the sights, gaze over the city as it lights up at night, and lean in close and get a romantic mood going to rival any other couple. But of course, there's likely to be an occasional jeer or heck of an insensitive bystander pointing out that your lover is a bicycle saddle. But let this minor obstacle only stoke the flames of your love. Your partner will no doubt be prepared to swung as hard as it takes to protect your honor. More importantly, most human men are no match for his manliness in bed. What do you say? Can you just picture the charm of a stepping? Pictures the charm of stepping out with a bicycle saddle. If you and an attractive saddle end up embarking on a serious relationship as a result of this, please make sure to send in a photograph. I will certainly be delighted to participate in your wedding. Editor's note. We have brought you a condensed version of our exclusive 8-hour long hospital room interview 
With the woman, you cannot afford to take your eyes off this season. Radiant as she continues to mature as an icon and role model, she's still juggling home and career, giving her all to every question as instructive as ever, right up to the very end. Her advice has attained the realm of the oracular. The end. Good shit. Good shit. Her imagination is insane. And the, it's not just the imagination, the, the, the daringness of her to write it all down and publish it. It's awesome. Okay, we got two sto short stories to go, and then I'm gonna end my stream. Thank you for staying, you guys. Thank you so much. Uh, up and coming, I think. Uh, yeah. But she published this one in 2015, so it's like she's not really like up and coming. But I think globally up and coming. stuff like uh very creative i would say yeah very weird stories i agree but yeah but i'm enjoying it because i haven't read like i you know the kind of books that i, I like right like very like you know um straight to the point like emotive stuff like sentimental sentimental yeah sentimental stuff but this is like insanely imaginative, so I'm I'm actually enjoying it a lot. Okay, last two. You should you should you should uh, once this is done, you should listen to. Uh, the first half of the book is actually really fun as well. Yeah, I think I had more energy back uh in, when I started. <laughs> I'm a bit tired now, but I'm still going. I'm still okay, I think. But I, I had some really good reading in the beginning, so you should go back uh, after I'm done with this one and like listen to the first half of the, of the book. <clears throat> okay. Okay. Last two. For those who currently just logged in and stumbled in to our stream, we're currently reading a uh, short story compilation by Yukiko Motoya called Picnic in the Storm and the second last story called The Dogs. The Dogs. I once lived with a whole lot of dogs. I don't recall the breeds, which is strange because we were close and I spent and we spent so much time together. I love those dogs and they loved me. There were dozens of them, each one bright white like freshly fallen snow. I spent my days warm and comfortable in the room with a fireplace not seeing anyone. The dogs did, did ask to be let out, but I never once saw them doing their business, which was also strange. But at the same time, I assumed that they were modest and had set up some kind of a toilet area away from the cabin. I, I didn't like the bed, so I slept standing up, leaning against the window still. The dogs would gather around me at night, like an overcoat, leaving only my mouth and eyes exposed. 
I enjoyed drowsily gazing into the fire, drifting to sleep with the heady feeling of being engulfed by the mass of dogs. At the time, I had some work that I could do to hole up in the cabin. It involved sitting at the desk in the attic from morning to night, peering into a magnifying glass, tweezering tiny pieces of paper of innumerable colors, work to nine months, uh, sorry, to mind numbing. <clears throat> work to mind numbing for most people even to contemplate. For many years, come winter, I would take several weeks worth of food and water and hide myself away in the cabin, which belonged to someone I knew. The cabin consisted of a high ceiling living room, a small bedroom and an attic, but there was plenty of room for me. When I first reached the isolated cabin, having driven expertly over the narrow, winding mountain roads, I was still on my own. I remember dropping the keys and struggling to pick them up again while still holding all my luggage because the bulky scarf that covered half of my face prevented me from seeing my hands. Autumn had just ended. Towards the beginning of my stay, I, I had definitely gone to sleep alone. Looking out the window each night and feeling as if I were at the bottom of the deep sea, I don't recall when the dogs started living there. I love all the dogs equally. At first, I tried to name one at a time, but I didn't get very far. I had never really liked naming things. I was just content just looking I was content just looking into glossy black of their eyes, which shone as though they had been fired in the magic kiln. It wasn't as if the dogs called called me by my name after all. But this got a little bit inconvenient. So I come up with names to try out on some of them. I lined up the dogs in front of the fireplace and told them to bark if they heard a name they like. Then I held up the collars that I had fashioned and looking into their eyes, I called out the names one by one. First up, early morning. <laughs> the day of the appliances arrive. Mm. <laughs> I'm trying to do the dog sound. Pastrami. <laughs> the dog stuck his tongue out in different chili. I place a collie marked pastrami around the, his neck. The world. <laughs> Take out. <laughs> the dog took care of their own meal as well. I surrept typically. I surrept. I surrept. Surreptitious. Surrept. Surreptitiously. Tishious. Surreptitiously. Oh my God! What a word. I surreptitiously let them out into the mountain woods so they probably hunted animals as a pack. Once when I walk, went for a walk among the trees, I found what looked like bird skull in the bottom of the tree. I, clip, I slipped the skull into my coat pocket and when I returned to the cabin, I threw at the dogs where they lay lounging. Boo! I shouted. The dogs didn't really react and I thought that must be... That must be because they were ashamed that I knew they had been eating birds. Never li they never let me see them feed. But what I, what I did see them doing was drinking plenty of the cold water that I got from the well behind the garage. I tried warming up milk, putting it out for them so they didn't catch chill, but they wouldn't touch that. The ice cold water seemed to energize them. One day, I drove down the mountain to replenish some food and supplies and came across a knot of people from the town puffed up in woolly hats and downfield jackets and gathered by the roadside. I slowed down to see what was going on. Through the open car window, I heard a voice saying something about, my, about a dog. My heart skipped a bit. The dog curled up in the passenger seat next to me began to raise his head as if he sensed something. So I said, Shh! Hush! And held his round head in my hand. He had come nosing around my feet as I was getting into my car, so I brought him along. The dog's head fit just fine 
in the palm of my hand, so I was always moved by how little their skull are wrapped in soft fur. This helped me stay calm on this occasion too. And I quietly rolled up the car window and slipped past the townspeople. Perhaps the dog had caused some kind of a problem. In the supermarket, I kept my scarf wound twice around my neck as usual. <laughs> hiding half of my face to discourage the staff from approaching me. But when the shop assistant from the fruit and vegetable section looked into my basket and casually remarked, stockpiling all brand again? I plucked up my courage and asked, has something happened in town? The man looked a little taken aback, probably because I had spoken at all. A five-year-old boy gone missing, he whispered. A child? Was it a kidnapping? Kidnapping? No, nothing like that would happen around here. Then what? Maybe he fell into the valley where his mother took her eyes off him. The bantering air of familiarity that had arisen between me and the shop assistant had become unbearable. So I hurried away from my cart. The dog, who had apparently been asleep at the foot of the passenger seat, looked up at me blearily and I gave his head a stroke. I swung by the gas station. There was an elderly attendant there who would always try to strike up a conversation with me. I found it a bit of a trial, but it was only the gas station in town. In town. I didn't keep in touch with anyone. I had always considered my only strength to be that I was completely content not to talk to a single soul all day and that I had a high tolerance for monotony. The exception was the phone call I got once a week from a certain man. Of, of the few people I had met over the years, he was the only one I felt I could still confide in. We had no romantic feelings for each other, simply a relationship where we could say we what say what we we can say what we honestly thought. That's therapy guys. That's therapy guys. He was the only one I felt I could confide in. We had no romantic feelings for each other. Simply a relationship where we could say what we honestly thought. That's therapy, guys. <laughs> when I heard his voice, my shoulders would let go of the attention, like the knot in a firm, tight silk scarf loosening deep inside a forest, far from where people are. His speech was distinct, like an oil egg popping out. From his mouth. This is how I feel when I go to therapy. Exactly how I feel. Exactly how I feel. If ever, if you ever wonder how therapy feels, is that like the moment I step into the room and the moment he asks me, so "How have you been?" Like. The knot in a firmly tight silk scarf loosening deep inside a forest. That's exactly how I feel when I go to therapy. And that is why I'll never quit therapy. There was no doubt he was a misanthrope like me, but unlike me, he had enough courtesy and presence of mind not to let it show. He was the only one who let me use his cabin and would always joke that it was because he wanted me to pursue the life he couldn't. We often put our opinions to battle on the subject of whether it was better to distance ourselves from civilization or immerse ourselves in it. And when we tired of that, we could hang up without hint of awkwardness. He had a family. After our phone call, I felt relief of having fulfilled some minimal quota of human interaction and comforted by the thought that he seemed to be making steady progress in the kind of life that was my road not taken. There wasn't a time for our phone calls, but on that day, like on others, I had a premonition that made me look up from, a, from my magnifying glass. I must have been engrossed in the work, though I, bar I had barely had a sip of my hot milk. Five hours had passed since I had come to my attic. I put on my tweezers down their stand and got up from the chair, checking that none of the tiny pieces of colored paper were stuck to my hands or clothes. 
Above the desk there was a window with two layers of glass and I could see several dogs running around the, in the snow outside. I descended the ladder with the empty thermos and mug in one hand and a warming one with some more milk when the phone rang. Stirring the aluminum saucepan with a spoon, I reached over with my other hand and slowly lifted the receiver. Hey, he said. I hope you're not suffering from isolation fatigue. No, I said, and asked whether he wasn't suffering from socializing fatigue. To which he responded that of course he was. You settled in your burrow? Anything giving you trouble? I told him about the mountain life, the hair dryer blasting out air that was unbelievably cold, the path that got buried in snow despite constant snoveling, the front door that I had hurled my body against when it was jammed, the hunk of snow that fell into the fireplace and sent ash flying everywhere. He said, that's why I never go there in winter. I don't know how you stand it after living like that. Are you really going to want to come back down when the spring comes? I informed him that I have been down through town just that day. Thank you very much. And then asked him never speak of spring again because I didn't even want to think about it. That, th that brought the afternoon events back to mind. So I told him about the huddle of townspeople I had come across. There might have been some kind of incident down there. An incident? Wonder what in such a nowhere town. I was reluctant to tell him more. I didn't want him to latch to onto it and start looking it up on the paper or in the or or on the internet. I stopped stirring the saucepan and looked over the, to the dogs stretched out in the living room, sprawled on the rugs like white sausages. They acted unconcerned, but I could tell they were a little unsettled by my being on the phone with a jealous boyfriend. I guess my demeanor changed slightly during these phone calls. It occurred to me that I could ask him about them. Why hadn't I thought of this before? They might have been his dogs. Hey, how about those little white fellows? I said, those one? Those ones? He asked, yeah, they're doing really well. There was a pause. Oh, he said, here, not so much, but I did spot some of those white fellows by the road today, although maybe they weren't so white. Most of them are black now. With all the gravel and the dirt. Is that so? I wonder w whether black dogs were really more common in the cities. Plus the black fellows weren't doing very well, all melting and deformed more or less on their last legs. I cut off this laughter. You really don't know? Know what? He wasn't playing dumb. For some reason I, did I didn't find it strange in the slightest that he didn't know about the dogs. One of them came up to me and press his fluffy coat against my shin and knelt down and rubbed his sides if I could as uh, if I was giving him as if I was giving him a good scrub and just said I'll tell you next time sure he replied as though to say he was used to my crotchety way anyways after that we chatted about nothing in particular I got through two mugfuls of hot milk as we were about to hang up he asked whether I had seen the weather forecast. I reminded him there's no civilization up here. He told me that la he told me laughing that a fierce chill would be invading over the weekend. I decided to follow the dogs in secret when they went out to play in the woods. Once I hold up I was holed up in the work room with the thermos, they, they knew that I wouldn't be back for a few hours so they would start to start to disperse. They each had a favorite spot. Some like to be just outside the door from to my workroom and others lie on the clothes strewn around the bedroom and the living room but most seem to be happy outside. I put in sunscreen to protect against that snow burn, some mirrored sunglasses sunglasses and an and norek and left the house. I traced the dog footprints through the bare trees reveling in my afternoon stroll, picking up a branch that I like to the like the look at and I drew meaning meandering lines in the bright snow as I walk, occasionally swapping the branch for another when I encountered a better one. The dog footprints were almost always all in a bunch. They were basically toddling along the least arduous path. Every so often, a, a set of tracks diverged from the set, but they shortly come back to rejoin the group. I thought they must hunt as a team like wolves. 
Before I knew it, I was on the path that I had never been on before. I looked over a clump of trees and saw one dog peeking through them from behind a bank of snow. His eyes were wide and he was only visible from the, from the nose up. I waved my branch number five and was curled up, which was curled up, which was curled like a spring, removed my sunglasses and said, I followed you. Is everyone over there? May I join you? The dog got lightly to his feet and barked. Then he turned on his heels and ran off. I advanced into a clump of tree through knee-high snow, calling after him. Should I not have come? Feeling like a parent secretly, secretly checking on whether my children were doing their homework, suppressing a grin, I looked out from behind a great tree. I was astonished to see where they were. On a large frozen lake, I hadn't known it was here, but there were dogs were stepping on a, pra a practice air across the lake. The lake, which was big enough to hold several games of baseball at once, it was as if a ready-made dog park sculpted by nature had suddenly appeared before my eyes. The dogs had seemed to have no idea I was behind the tree and were scattered in all directions. I tried to get closer to see what they are up to, but the ice at the water's edge was thin and far too treacherous. A state where I was squinted at the dogs beginning to jump up and down. At first, they only jump up about as high as they are tall. Gradually, their time in the air seemed to increase until they were jumping so high they could have cleared the head of a person standing. It seemed that they were each trying to make a hole in the ice. Their paws made digging movements, trying to break through the surface. Before long, each dog succeeded in making its hole, jumping swiftly into the water. When the last one had dived, they were nowhere to be seen. It's as if they had melted away. One of them poked its head out of its hole in the ice and sounded a sh and sounded a sharp, sh a short, sharp cry. It's drowning and calling for help. I thought in alarm, but in the next moment, another dog stuck its head out of the freezing water in different spots. It made the same bird like cry. More and more dogs popped their heads out from their eyes, repeating the cry. It dawned on me what was going on. Swimming as a pack, the dogs were forming a large circle under the eyes and using the cries as slowly closing the circle towards the center. I couldn't take my eyes off them. I walked around the lake and when I found an area where the eyes seemed thick enough to hold me, I leaped onto it. Using my glove as windshield wipers, I scraped away the frost and peered through the ice. The only thing that I could see was grey muddiness at the bottom of the lake. I made my way back to the cabin alone, picturing dogs gracefully chasing fish through clear water. The weekend I woke up to, to the morning I had always wished for. Every last thing in the world seemed to have frozen over. The all brand I kept in the cupboard was in clumps so hard it was like eating hail. The, the, and seeing the icicles protruding from the roof, I felt like I had been transported overnight into a grotto filled with stalactites. Once I had put on as many layers as I could, shivering all the while, I took an empty bucket and shovel, headed to the to the garage. The dog scampered around me, keeping close to my feet as if to hurry me along. By the time I reached the garage, taking three or four times longer as usual, sweat pouring out of me as though I was in a sauna. I was sh I, I made sure the generator battery indicator was green. I checked how many liters of diesel fuel were left, then decided to dig out some more snow tool. I discovered some emergency tubes of chocolate years past their use by date. Finally, I took some cold, dusty blankets and went around the back of the garage. I looked down to the well, and the solemn chill plastered my face. The extreme cold had four miniature ice rink in there. What shall we do? I asked the dogs behind me. Can't get you any water. The one with the collar, Mark Pastrami, tried to climb up onto the well, scrabbling his paws. Get off, I told him, and decided to do what I could about about the frozen pulley at least. I brought out a chisel and a mallet from the garage and pounded the blacksmith pounded like a blacksmith with all my might. 
and the frozen rope finally started to give. I took hold of the rope both by my hand and gave it a hard tug, and the layer of ice that had formed over the mechanism came away with a clatter as the pulley began quickly turn. Then, that was when it happened. Pastrami leapt up in onto the well and somehow got into the bu bucket and disappeared into the hole, looking pleased with himself. Pastrami! I shouted, but it was too late. He was yapping and rolling around in anguish at the bottom, having slammed onto the thick ice. Frantic, I worked the rope, raising and lowering the bucket that has fallen with him, trying to get him back up, but the bewildered dog could hardly stand up. Go get help! I called the dogs crowded behind me. I heard the footfalls of several dogs running. I leaned to the well, stretched my arm down, shouting, Pastrami! Pastrami! But the yapping cries reverberating up the well was so overwhelming I couldn't keep my eyes open. When I came to, I was slumped by, slumped by on the edge of the, of the well. Pastrami's cries had ceased, as had the sound of his forepaw scraping at the ice. What should I do if an animal jumps into a well? I asked. The power lines had gone down under the weight of snow and it was late at night before I got through him on the phone. Animal in the well? He said a little sleepily. Yeah, I was wrapped in old blanket from the garage. I tried to keep my mind occupied all afternoon chopping firewoods and doing other things. But when the night fell, I suddenly felt completely drained and found myself unable to stand up. The dogs have stayed close by me through the day like watchdogs. Actually, I did find something like a weasel drowned in it once. Was it winter? Summer. Then it's a different situation. I think I got someone in town to get it out. I could give you your number. What is it? A raccoon? A raccoon? I told him that I couldn't really tell because it was all the way at the bottom. He suggested that it might be dangerous and that I should just put the cover back on and leave the animal there. Wolves sometimes prowl the area looking for food, he said. He would come by with his family on the next day to try to take care of it. My mind kept pl re replaying past Jeremy, trying to jump into the bucket, but I was terribly tired. So I told him I wanted to go to bed now. If you ever feel in danger, he began, then went on to tell me how to unlock the cupboard in the bedroom, which he had never let me touch before. The emergency hunting rifle was in there. I told him that I had no need for such a thing and hung up. I was checking that the drafty living room window was properly closed, so I could go to sleep. When I thought I heard the faint cry of a dog, I raised my head. Was it the, was it the wind howling? With a storm lamp I, and a shuffle with the, and with the other dogs in tow, I made my way through the snow towards the well. The bucket was rattling against the pulley, and as the wind blew, I stopped a few paces from the well and raised the lamp. Pastrami? I said in a small voice, almost to myself. Pastrami? I thought I heard the keen crying of a dog in distress. Pastrami, are you alive? I called again. This time I could definitely make out a dog crying. I flung myself towards the well and in the lamp light I could see Pastrami getting up on the ice. I left the lamp and the dog to retrieve the chainsaw from the garage and returned to the cabin. I saw off the ladder that led us to the attic, <clears throat> getting showered in sawdust and then loaded it on the red sled that I used to transport woodwork. Once I was back at the well with the aid of, with the aid of some of the dogs, I lowered the ladder into the well, careful not to break the ice, and called the dog's name. I wanted him to hold on to the ladder somehow, but Pastrami only looked out with me with his tongue hang out, and that and wouldn't make a move. The ice at the base of the well seemed thick and gave no sign of cracking when I tapped the ladder on it. I screw my courage and tentatively climb over the edge and gingerly step onto the ladder. Slowly, cautiously, I descended. Pastrami wagged his tail weakly as I approached, just as I had put one one foot on the ice to reach for him. There was a slight cracking sound or something giving way, but all the blood drained out of my body. body. 
With bated breath, I coax the stone cold hunk of fur down into the front of my jacket. I put my hand on the ladder to climb back up, but short stop. It stopped short, sorry. The other dogs had surrounded the rim of the well and they were staring down at us motionless. One dog moved its mouth clumsily just as the wind howled and I thought the dog say, Good enough! Terrified, I found myself in a verge of laughter. Good enough? I said, For what? Beyond the still forms of the, of the dog looking down at us, I saw clouds being blown over the sky. Pastrami, who had been keeping still inside my jacket, yapped as though remembering that he was a dog. It was a pain having to go down the mountain, but my friend was adamant about keeping stocked on certain things. I made up my mind to go to the town for the first time in a week. When I got to the garage, Pastrami was waiting beside the car door, looking fully recovered and eager to come along. No, stay home, I said. After what I had seen last time, I thought better leave him behind. I drove down the mountain roads carefully and saw Christmas decorations were all up down up around town. It must have been the time of year already. I looked around and mulling over my long string of holiday season failures and noticed that something was a little off. It was people's expressions. They seemed haggard somehow. Some were constantly glancing behind in themselves in fear. An elderly person sitting on the bench had the puffy face of someone who had been crying all night. There were a few cars on the road and every house had its curtains down. Was I imagining it? Was I imagining it? Even o the overly cheerful Christmas decorations gave the impression that, that the town was desperately trying to avert its eye from something upsetting. The shop assistant in the fruit vegetables section wasn't around. Normally, I would have it. Re I'll be relieved, but this time, it bothered me. So I asked the woman restocking the food, frozen food, what what had happened. Yes, that boy. He quit. Quit all of a sudden. The woman gave a long, gave me a long look. I thought I detected weariness and irritation in her eyes and quickly walked away. For some reason, the dog food had been moved, even though the cat food was still in the same place. I asked, I thought about, uh, the, uh, I thought about asking where they had put it, but I didn't feel like engaging with that woman again. The older man at the gas station with whom I always exchanged few words wasn't there either. Is he not working today? I asked the young attendant in the center hat as he handed me my change. I had gotten him to put a plastic container of diesel in a trunk for me. Mm -hmm. And he nodded ambiguously. There it was again. Each time I mentioned someone wasn't there, I could sense irritation rise in townspeople's eyes. I was absorbed in the poster for a Christmas party. Forget all your troubles. When I felt the young man staring at me, he said I could ask him if I ever needed anything. I was counting on it, I said, almost to myself. Let me know if there's anything I can do, said the young man batting away the pom-pom on his centre head. Do you mean that? I might take you out for it. I hope my eagerness to get back up the mountain wasn't showing on my face. Sure, he trotted inside the cash register to bring me a pale pink flyer. The charges and the services are all here, if you would like to take it with you. I thank him and roll up the window. But one more thing was weighing on my mind. I, I rolled the dog the window that back down and asked offhandedly, Do you deal with dogs? Dogs? He said. There was a pause. He pointed at the bottom of the flyer. You can see about dogs at the bottom there. I stopped for, for a red light outside. <coughs> outside the police station, I was contemplating the sign in the large print on the notice board. For the good of the town, they've got to be put down when a huge truck behind me blasted its horn. After that, I spent most of my waking hours at my desk because I really had to knuckle down to my work. It required bottomless res reserve of concentration. Several jobs were already complete and framed and I line up on the at and line up on the attic wall, but even when I look at those, I didn't understand the slightest what made people pay so much for them. 
there was no need for me to understand. The thing that mattered was that having this work let me avoid dealing with people. The thing was, the more progress I made, the more time I spent dreading when I would have to leave this place. I was having leisurely soak in the bath for the first time in a while. Feeling good about the amount of work that I had gotten done when it occurred to me that I hadn't had a phone call in a few days. When I looked at the calendar in the kitchen, I saw that it was four days past Tuesday when he always rang. I checked the time, which, which was only eight at night, and decided to ring him myself. No answer. No matter how many times I tried, I didn't get through the answering machine. Has something happened? He was conscientious, not like me. When he had had appendicitis, he left me a message letting me know that he would be in surgery and wouldn't be able to answer his phone for 8 hours. That was the kind of person that he was. I would be, it, it could be that the phone had actually rung many times and I had been too engrossed in the work to notice. I checked the calendar again and was taken aback. It was December 31st. I decided to do something about the draft from the living room window before the arrival of the new year. I got some putty and pressed it, pressed it on into the window frame. Then I noticed the pale pink flyer on the floor. On the floor. <coughs> Beneath the coat rack, I sat down on the sofa with the dogs and looked through the list of service av available. Just in case, the prices are too the high, but I could see myself calling them in emergency. There was no entry for retrieval in animal wells, although there was one for recovery of dead birds in chimneys. Further down, the item is dog walking had been heavily crossed out. I recall the exchange with the young man at the gas station. The last item on the list was even more mysterious. Extermination of dogs. Perhaps they meant feral dogs. I thought as I stroked the heads of the white dogs, but surely that sort of thing would normally be left to the public health department. I suddenly remembered the strange snow tools like big sharp forks that had been propped beside the winter tires winter tires at the gas station. What could they have been been for? The dog I was petting pricked up its ears, barked menacingly, and leaped onto the flyer and ripping it to shreds. Stop it, I said, but the other dogs caught the scent of the paper and crouching down ready to pounce, started howling and growling as if they had gone mad. I calmed them down, got up from the sofa and thought about ringing him again, but for some reason I already knew he wouldn't answer. Instead, I dialed a number from my parents' place. For the first time in long time, no one picked up, despite being a New Year's Eve. Just to make sure, I called. I tried the police. No response. The fire department. No response. I dialed every number that I can think, think of. But all I heard was the phone ringing over and over. I got my jacket from the coat rack and the car keys in hand, headed to the garage. The dogs followed and tried to get in the, to the car. I told them I was just going down to have a look at the town. But this didn't satisfy them. You wanna come too? But I can't take all of you. The dog went on barking as if they were both broken. It took an hour to walk down the, the foot of the mountain. White dogs in tow. When I got there, the town was deserted. There were still Christmas decorations everywhere. I heard pet dogs crying from inside the house. I pried open the doors and let them loose, but the white dogs didn't respond to them in the slightest. The newly freed dogs ran off in flash, as if to get away from the white dogs as quickly as possible. I spent a long time wandering around town, ascertained that there wasn't a single person there. At the gas station, I found the words, Our Town, sloppily spray painted on the wall our town i remembered that once many years ago i had asked santa claus for a present to wake up and have the whole world to myself i gathered 
as much food and fuel as I could carry, headed back to the cabin with the dogs. The following day, I sat and worked in the attic with the magnifying glass and tweezers. When walking with the dogs over the snowy slopes, then, when I needed a break, there was no sign of anyone approaching the cabin. I spent the next day the same way, and again the next the day after that, watching the white dogs hunt, swimming gracefully under the ice. I could be so engrossed for hours. When I ran out of food, I went down to the town and procured what I wanted from the at unattended, unattended shops. I slowly become dingy and faded, but the dogs stayed as white as fresh snow. One day, while I was watching them play in the snow from the attic window, I took the hunting rifle from the cupboard and let off three shots in their direction. The dogs stiffened in a way I have never seen them do before, looked toward me and then scattered into the mountains as though to melt into the glistening snow. The day hinted of the arrival of spring. I leaned out the window and yelled, SORRY! at the top of my voice. I won't do that again! Come home! That night, as the snow fell silently, I slept standing by the window sill huddled by the dogs who had come back. As I, res as I revelled in the sensation of being buried in their warm flesh, I thought, I'll be leaving this place tomorrow. Hmm. <sighs> what does it represent? What does it represent? Hmm. Interesting. Okay, one last story and then I'm gonna end my stream. That's a weird one. Not that enjoyable as the others. Last story, last story, last story. Okay, the yeah, end, no worries. To those who are still here, we're going to read the, read the last short story from Yukiko Motoya. In the compilation short story novel of Picnic in the Storm. The last story is called this title, sorry. The Straw Husband. The Straw Husband. Her husband ran lightly ahead of her as if sorry, almost as if he was pace setting a race. He was dressed in his favorite team's soccer jersey and knee length short. His legs were shaved down to the ankles in the compression ties they, they had bought together at the sporting goods store. But from the gap between them and his sneakers, two or three strands of dry straw were poking out. The asphalt surface of the white running track in the park was littered with sawdust like material in his wake. But Tomoko skillfully avoided it as she tuned in to what he was saying. Good, nice and tall now. Try not to lift your feet. It's better to almost brush them forward just barely over the ground. You'll get let you get less tired that way. Keep your elbows tucked to your body and don't stick your belly out. Okay, Tomoko said. Wondering what to focus first. It was nice of him to be excited to be so excited about teaching her to run 
But giving her all the instructions at the same time was actually counterproductive. Reminding herself to keep a straight face, she let her husband's explanation wash over her and moved her attention to the leaves on the tree stretching overhead. They were like an endless couple of the hallway of some elegant mansion. Green, yellow, red. Evidently, the trees all changed color at different times. It felt luxurious to be holding all three colors in the field of vision at once. Look how pretty it is, she said. He looked up. You're right, he said. Aren't you glad we came? Yeah. Thanks for getting me out here. Study studies have proved that performance suffers when you don't take breaks. Tomoko copied her husband, who was swinging his arm rhythmic, rhythm, rhythmic, rhythmically and looked at the pale, skinny, stick-like arms that pick out of her running clothes. She needed to exercise more, it was true. She had been putting so, such long hours working that her fitness had suffered particularly her leg muscle. Now that she was out running, she couldn't ignore it. It was like having to drag along bloodless pieces of doweling. The leg muscles are one of most pro the most prone to lo lo losing mass, of course. You should be walking daily, whether you go out for a stroll or just for shopping. He sounded like a teacher lecturing a student. Yes, Tomoko thought. That was definitely true, but what could her husband really know? Running into co the cold wind, she thought back to the exhilaration of being a student and putting snow against her, her eyelid to keep herself awake when she studied for her exam. Squinting into the clear autumn sunlight, she gazed at the figure of her husband running just ahead of her. How could he possibly know what it was like when he didn't have a single muscle on him? He saw a couple approaching dressed in under understated matching duffel coats and walking their dogs. Hey, look! Those two are actually old enough to be grandparents. So adorable, she said in low, affectionate voice. Her husband slowed his pace. Very elegant, he said happily. Just when we want, just like we want to be when we are older, right? Tomoko thought. But he didn't say it out loud, because she was sure that her husband was thinking just the same thing. Six months since they had gotten married, she was only more than cert more certain that the path of to happiness was laid out ahead of them. From where did she get this satisfying feeling that they had avoided the common pitfalls of choosing a partner? Diaz was a marriage that hadn't necessarily welcomed by their loved one, but now she felt that the wild birds were twittering to congratulate them on making the right choice. As she passed the old couple on the path, Tomoko tried to imprint their image into her mind. She and her husband would no doubt become like them. In the weekday park, everything shone brightly and peaceful. The sunlight spilling through. Sorry, spilling through the trees, the fountains, grass, and her straw husband she sighed with happiness at her blessed life they spent the, ne the next 15 minutes doing a lap around the spacious park slow enough to avoid putting any strain on their hearts within the park's extensive grounds everyone was enjoying themselves a couple on a date peering to a flower flower bed Families relaxing on the grass, a student rehearsing lines on a bench, a cameraman shooting a scene as he scattered a pile of fallen leaves around a girl. They they were just past the park the park's dog run. The husband pointed to the patch of grass and said, Let's get to there and then take a breather. Tomoko was already fast walking, more than running. Okay, she said, summoning the remains of her willpower. I'll grab, us a dr I'll grab us something to drink. Go do some stretching. Tomoko watched him sprint off towards some vending machines and made, made for the grassy area, dead leaves crunching underfoot. A deserted, slightly balding patch of ground that was the spot. When she sat down and arched her back so far back, as, she, as, as far back as she could, her gaze met with a totally cloudless sky. 
She closed her eyes against the bright. She closed her eyes against the brightness and became aware of the sensation of her blood coursing through her. Her body had been tense from the pressure from work, but it felt looser now thanks to the, to the run. By the time her breathing had settled, her husband came into the sight between, from between the trees. She seemed to have gone a long way to find a vending machine, and aware that she was being watched, he was walking slowly towards the patch of grass clutching a plastic bot bottle. From the distance, his jerky movement stood out a little bit, but Tomoko didn't mind. Her husband was made of straw, yes, that straw, stalks of dried rice or wheat, you plant matter use it as a fodder for farm animal, animals and for their beddings, tied into bundles and rolled into human shape. Tomoko had married him of her own free will. Some of her friends had advised her to reconsider, but most people didn't even notice that he was straw. What Tomoko had liked about him was that as straw, he was kinder and more positive than anyone she knew. Of course, at the start, there had been days when she barely managed to swallow food, sick with worry that they were too different, that she would rush into things, but now, she no longer faltered in her conviction that her instinct hadn't led her astray. The soccer jersey that her husband was wearing was more vibrant than anything else in the park. It was a beautiful yellow, representing the sun, which was the team's emblem. Meanwhile, her husband was more akin to brush, to a to brush a painting, to brush painting of a dead branch, and Tomoko couldn't help but laugh out loud at the contrast. She saw her husband put down the water bottle on the ground and leap up to catch hold of the pine bow. She did a pull up, raising himself so easily, and then resumed walking as though nothing had happened, picking up something that from the ground and shoving it shoving it in his pocket as he did. An acorn, Tomoko thought, or some insights. Her husband noticed her watching him and waved. Tomoko waved back enthusiastically. Over here! No doubt, he was smiling from ear to ear. Her husband didn't have eyes or nose or mouth, but sunlight cast minute shadows that rippled across his face, putting the observer in mind of different expression. After sending a round of applause to a youth who was practicing juggling nearby, and with the likeness of bearing that made it seem that he was about to be airborne, he started running towards the patch of grass where Tomoko was waiting. On the drive back from the park, her husband said that he wanted a latte. You want a warm one? Right now? Tomoko had been looking forward to getting home and showering, but she said, Sure, let's go get one. Let's get one to go. Her husband's beautiful fingers rolled and tied as finely as any artisanal object made contact with the car turn indicator le lever. As they turned left at the intersection where they would normally make a right, Tomoko let the car take the weight of her sweat then back. Are you getting hungry? Not yet, Tomoko said. A strange voice her husband emitted from the gaps between his stalks of straw could be difficult to make out unless you listen closely. In the beginning, this had given Tomoko pause too, but now she understood him without too much difficulty. Her husband found the spot free in the metered parking lot and cut the engine. At the exact moment, it dawned on Tomoko that a work problem that on which she had reached an impasse could be solved another way and she reached for her phone to make a note of the solution before she forgot. She heard the driver's side door open and she unbuckled her seatbelt to get out and follow her husband. Just then, the car rang out with a, with a sudden sharp clunk as if a, a hard object had hit something. Still on her phone, Tomoko paid it no mind but then her husband said, What was that sound? And she quickly brought focus back to him. I don't know. She said, did something hit the car? No, nope. it's your seat belt buckle. Her husband opened the door on his side and was up and was paused awkwardly halfway through the process of getting out of the, the car. He looked down at the phone in Tomoko's hand. Why do you have to be so rough with it? 
I'm sorry, Tomoko said quickly. She had no awareness of how un unbuckle her seatbelt roughly, but then again, only last week she had opened the passenger side door and accidentally bumped it against the guardrail. Her husband's ca car was a brand new BMW that he had bought less than a month ago. Tomoko opened her car door. That was the seatbelt? That sound? That's right, it hit the door just there. Her husband said, leaning over into the passenger seat to inspect the spot. See? Look here! Can you see the scratch? Tomoko couldn't, but she apologized anyway. There's no way a seat belt could have reached all the way up here, she thought. Her husband was pointing out an area to the top of the window frame, insisting that it was damaged. That line's probably just part of the car design. But she decided to wait until he noticed it himself. Once he calmed down a little, she could casually say, Why don't you check what it looks like on the driver's side? Her husband was still facing intently towards the window frame. Come and have a look, he said eventually. See, it's dented. It was, as he said. There was a very distinct two-inch long growth that growth along the top edge of the window frame. Tomoko traced it with her finger. You're right. It does look like there's a little dent. <laughs> Hi, Evit. Tomoko slipped her phone into her coat pocket. I'm sorry, she said, dropping her head slightly. I wasn't paying attention. Her husband was sitting very still, gripping the car steering wheel. Tomoko couldn't read an expression in the dense layers of fine straws that made up his face, but she sensed that he was grappling with silent rage. Fearfully, Tomoko asked, Did you want to go get your latte? You let me down. Her husband said with a sigh, and dropped his head to his chest. Tomoko wasn't sure how to respond. Her husband raised his head again. After a while, he repeated himself, you let me down. He sighed, and once more he dropped his head, leaning his body to, towards the steering wheel. You let me down. I'm sorry, really, Tomoko thought. He might keep doing this movement endlessly unless she did something. I didn't think a seat belt would reach that far. She wasn't rewarded with the response. The uncomfortable silence punctuated with the rustling sound of the bundle, straw repeatedly hitting the wheel went on for several minutes. Finally, as though snapping himself out of it, her husband announced that he was going to get his latte, opened the door. Tomoko started to get up, but then thought that might make, make her seem con uncontrite and decided to stay in the car. Nah, her husband apparently had no intention of waiting for her. He crossed the road swiftly, even without glancing back. Once she was alone, Tomoko let out, let out a deep breath. She gazed unseeingly at the number plate of the car parked in front of them, then got out, got out her phone and quickly tapped in the rest of her note. She noticed a single stalk of straw had fallen at the foot of the driver's seat and was picking it up when her husband when her husband came back with the string and started the car without a word. They made a U-turn and they went back the way they came. I'm truly sorry. I promise to try harder in the future, she said, picking her words carefully. She wondered whether she ought to say more, but she thought it might be disrespectful to say things that she didn't mean. As soon as she looked out the window though, she changed her mind. She put her hand on top of her husband's where it lay on his knee. Since getting married, he learned the hard way that it only made things worse when they didn't talk to each other. Her husband didn't react to her gesture, but Tomoko kept her hand there for a while. Deep inside her husband's hand, almost imperceptibly, perceptibly, she felt something squirm. Tomoko stared at his hand. What was that? To hide her alarm, she pointed to the latte sitting in the cup holder. Can I have some? Help yourself. Her husband said like an unfriendly receptionist. Sipping the warm latte, Tomoko thought about what had just happened. 
there's been there's definitely been something lurking within that straw. She felt something start to itch uncomfortably inside her brain. Maybe what she thought she had noticed was just vibrations from the car. In their living room, her husband said, Let me down. And sat heavily on the sofa. Wondering whether it meant anything, he had dropped the U. Kamoko sat as well, straight on the carpet. Her husband still slumped over, his upper body bent forward, and his face in his hands as though he was struggling against despair. Why do you have to be so careless? He said, I don't get it. It's not even a month old. It was an accident. It was, it was the same last week. I didn't mean to do it. I just wasn't aware I had to be careful when I unbuckled my seatbelt. Her husband seemed to be making an effort to understand. Still holding his face in his hands, he nodded repeatedly. But then, in strained voice, he cried, I don't understand. And started rocking his body back and forth, as though he believed it would make things more bearable. Suddenly, at first, and harder and harder, and Tomoko looked on helplessly. He made it. He made a movement as if he were tearing off part of his head. Got up and strode off to the front door. Tomoko followed. Found him silently sweeping the the floor of the entrance hall, which had just been swept two days ago. What are you doing? She said, I don't know. Please stop. Tomoko took the broom from his hand and led him by the arm back to the sofa. I promise, I promise I'll be careful from now on. Sure. His voice was hollow. He started rocking again and Tomoko watched until he started, she started to feel like a boat drifting out to sea too far to get back to the shore. I don't do it on purpose. She said as patiently as she could. Please, just believe me about that. Maybe, he said quietly. Once again, something moved swiftly inside his straw. There was no doubt this time. A fine tremor was running through her husband's body, tra tra traversing it from end to end. Tomoko almost cried out in horror, but her husband didn't seem to be aware of anything. Are you accusing me of being destructive deliberately? She felt a duty to act as though she hadn't noticed what was happening. No, I'm not saying that. It was us she feared. Around the area where her mouth would be, her husband's straw was quacking. Something was pushing on it from the inside. Tomoko's eyes was glued to his face. I'm not saying that. But it's obvious that you think it's no big deal if the car gets damaged. Every time he spoke, he felt she was about to catch a sight of something from between the straws. Her husband's insights were teeming. What was in there? You already promised last week that you would be more careful. What I promised was about the door, Tomoko said, forcing the, the words out. Desperate to keep the conversation going. You know I've been really careful opening the door since then. But I just never thought I had to make sure that, that the not to let the seat belt bounce up and hit the door. Do you really need me to spell out every last thing? Just as he said every last thing, something fell out of his mouth. Whatever it was, it seemed to have been swallowed by the deep pile of carpet any rate nowhere to be seen i'll pay attention i promise i'll do better from now on can you give me a more specific strategy he asked accusingly noticing tomoko's less than heartfelt tone a strategy for being more careful tomoko couldn't look away from her husband's face something had started welling from between the straw tiny musical instruments and assortment of different musical instruments barely large enough to pick up the tips of her fingers was flowing out of her husband trumpets trombones snare drums clarinets harpsichords a strategy for taking my seat belt off more gently 
she said quietly, distracted by the instruments. I mean, you don't actually feel it's a serious problem. When you open the door carefully, you only do it to avoid me getting angry about it. Her husband was starting to sound enraged. Was that somehow related to the instruments falling out of his body? Tomoko said, I feel like I've been doing it thinking I sh should treat the car well, uh, but does it not seem that way to you? I don't believe for a, I don't believe for a moment you think that. The flow of the instruments sped up even more. They were piling up at his feet into a mold that almost hit his slippers. At the same time, her husband's body was shrinking. What do you get to decide what I think? On reflex, Tomoko thrust her hand out under his face, trying to stem the cascade of instruments which showed no sign of stopping. I think you want to call me a bad person, then why don't you just say so? Why do you have to be so passive aggressive about it? Her hands filled up. Almost immediately, and hundreds of instruments and flutes spilled over the edges of her fingers. I am impressed you could even marry someone you felt this way about. Her husband keeps talking, causing an outpouring of hundreds of pair of symbols. If you really crash, feel bad about doing it, crash, 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 you wouldn't even think about making excuses. How? How could you not? No, he was spewing instruments. The flow of instruments let up. Tomoko looked up quickly and saw that her form of her husband where he sat on the sofa was utterly transformed. Bereft of his insights, he was now reduced to a pitiful amount of unstuffed straw. The string that had tied him together was loose in places and he looked as though he might fall apart at any moment. Which was him? Tomoko wondered. The musical instruments that had fallen out of him? Or the husk of straw that remained? Which was her husband? Please, can we just stop fighting now? She cried. At this rate, her husband seemed to pause and finally closed his mouth instead of saying whatever he, has been s been, he had been about to say. In a cold, distant voice, he said, You're right. Wasting's only a waste of Fighting is only a waste of time. Tomoko looked into the black void that was now visible from the, from between his straws. He's out of instruments. There were small piles of them on the carpet that added up almost exactly the same size as him. Alto horns, euphonions, marimbas. She gingerly tried to reach for her husband's hand, but her husband apparently no longer able to support the weight of a soccer jersey collapsed before their hands could touch, like a plant blown down by the wind. Tomoko grabbed Slim's limp hand where it lay. It's okay, don't worry. It's all my fault. I won't ride in your car anymore. It sounds good, he said. Tomoko realized that his scent, which, was, which had been a familiar and cherish as towels dry in the sun had changed into the smell of animal feed. She stood up and looked down at her empty husband as he lay still with his back to her. Inside her head, another Tomoko said, Why did I get married to the thing like this? Why was I so happy to be married to a bunch of straws? Her husband was utterly unmoving. Maybe he was already dead. If I hit this body with something, she wondered, would it feel like there was nothing inside? As she looked down at him, the picture of fire burning brightly burst vividly into her mind. The image of something going up in violent flames on the stark white sofa. In the morning light filling the room in this house, Tomoko didn't know yet what happened when, when you set fire to straw. How long would it burn? Her heart beat faster just imagining it. Just a little flame would it probably ignite it all in the blink of an eye. Tomoko came to her senses. Unable to bear to see him like this any longer, she started to put the fallen instruments back into the, into the straw. 
She couldn't tell whether they were broken, but as they gathered, or she gathered them gently in both and both hands and poured them into the gaps. His body expanded like a sponge, sucking up water. Tomoko repeated the movements over and over, from carpet to straw, from carpet to straw. Just once during this process, Tomoko stopped and picked up a fallen stalk and carefully touched it to the flame of an incense lighter. The flame red up like a live thing. Tomoko sighed at its beauty and thought about how she would like to set a whole bundle of light like this sometimes. She finished pouring the last of the instruments into the gaps in her husband. Eventually, her husband got up from the sofa, seeming to have recovered his strength. He looked at Tomoko and casting subtle shadows on his face through its delicate ridges, gently said, I'm the one who should be apologizing. It's just a car. I'm sorry I got so upset over it. Shall we go for another run? With her hand clasped in her husband, Tomoko forgot that she had just been imagining a hunk of straw getting swallowed in flame. She accepted the invitation cheerfully. Good idea. Let's go. As they ran through the park, which was slightly more crowded than it had been earlier, Tomoko shifted her gaze up to the turning leaves and murmured, It's beautiful. The sunlight spilling through the trees, the fountains, grass, Flower beds, she could hear the constant stream of instruments falling and breaking underfoot. Miniature horns and timpani, her husband taught her to run. Tomoko breathed in the cold air. The afternoon was lovely. The leaves overhead were as beautiful as burning fire. That is the end of the straw husband and also the end of the short story compilation called Picnic in the Storm by Yukiko Motoya. And hi Evie! <laughs> yes, Merry Holidays! Happy Holidays everyone! Merry Christmas! I'll oh, bite what a day late. Yeah, we are done. I actually had a six-hour stream today. <laughs> a bit insane, to be honest. That I went on for so long. Seven hours. Okay, I just checked. It's seven hours. Jesus Christ. And uh, we went past 190 followers, and we have nine more to go to get to to get to uh, 200. How does it feel to come back here? Oh, uh, have you ever had a dream <laughs> that 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 you you would you could do you could do do you could you want to do you could do? Yes, my favorite song. Hey, hello, Kevin Satron. Thank you. Thank you for joining. Thank you for joining. Thank you, Evid. Thank you, everyone, for joining the stream today. We, we have so many people today. I, I, I. Okay, let's just. Okay. Let's start with what Dimitri just said. Uh, how does it feel to come back here? Oh, wait, oh, that's to Evid. Okay. Yeah, the story is. Uh, it's a you it's a I think it's a very good representation of like we, women dealing with uh okay let's just say um I don't want to I don't want to generalize <laughs> I'm not ASMR primal but thank you for the title um Okay, let's not generalize women uh, at, uh, uh, at specific place, but I would say like Asian women. We are. I know, I know incels or like some stupid men will disagree, but I hope you guys are not. But it, um, generally, women in Asian countries are very. 
at all, at all, and taught to be submissive. Uh, I hate it. Because obviously you can tell that I am not. <laughs> uh, uh, submissive and not like in a sense of like you are all listen to your husband you gotta do everything your husband say um, you gotta please your husband your husband is like the most important person in your life like the kind all those things right like it, you can tell that this writer um has either experienced something herself or she has heard a lot of experiences around her like she has seen first-hand experiences around her whereby especially in Japan whereby a wife should it's like you have to act a certain way so The whole... I feel like the straw husband might be my favorite story. In the sense that... <laughs> it, in the sense that it's so realistic. Don't you think? It's so realistic that... She can do something so minor and then he gets so fucking upset over it that he'll just argue and argue, argue and argue. Like, and she doesn't, un I, the instruments is a euphemism for like this energy that comes out of nowhere. Like, wh why do you have so much energy to argue about something so stupid? You know? And it's and no matter how many sorry you say, they still, they are they are still arguing about it. And I've seen this, and I've seen this, and I felt like I have experienced it in some way or another. Like it's very it's it's like yeah yeah exactly. Like, where do you get so much, like, what? Uh, because they are, and, and it's like, because they are men, right? Okay, I don't want to generalize. Okay, some men, right? Some men, their ego of being, like, the big, the big man, like, in, in a Asian people will know this, this phrase, like, big man, small man, okay? They, they want to be the big man in, 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 in. In the in the in the in the dynamics in the relationship, that to the point that they cannot, their ego do not allow them to say, ah, it's okay. It's like, like, it's so fucking like you heard this kind of argument before. It's so real, and it's like really touched the nerves. You know, it's really crazy, honestly. But yeah, it's crazy, isn't it? I think she. I think she has a lot of experience with like this kind of men yeah I've... yeah it's it's very very i feel like it's very common but then i don't want to generalize because i i okay okay it took me many many years to become who i am today and who i am today is um i i'm i'm not submissive like i don't like i still have it okay i still have it in me because it's like it's so ingrained in 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 my in your brain that you, you, you can't completely get rid of it but i would say like 10 years ago when i was in my first relationship that guy is not asian and by the way just to get it out i never dated an asian guy because I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, first of all, Asian guy that okay. okay. Okay, never mind. Put that aside. I don't want to talk about that right now. So, that boyfriend I had, 
I I can't tell you how many dumb arguments I had with him. That is just me apologizing nonstop, like 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 that like that girl just now, like Tomoko just now. It's just me saying sorry nonstop, for 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 nothing. Like I, I like I ask, can we go to the zoo? Because you promised that you, you want to bring me to the zoo, and then he is like, I'm so tired, I'm this and that, but the kind of thing, and then I'll be like, and then I'll be like, but you promised, and then and then I'll be like, okay, it's okay, so I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm just, I just, I'll just like go, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, the entire time. <laughs> it's very very tiring, you know. Yeah. I'm sure there are men who go through the same thing with like that kind of partner as well with like women who are like that. I'm sure. I'm sure they are like there's always people like that both sides, right? So I can't just say all men or I can't just say all women. But all I can say is being in being in Asia, being in uh in in countries where and especially for East Asian in Japan and Korea, it's like it's almost like a like they have to be submissive. They have like, especially when after they get married. They lose their identity after they get married because they are like that's not like that's why they don't get married anymore. Uh, Japanese women. Not just not I mean besides the point that it's expensive to ha- get married and have kids. But it's like they they don't get married anymore because they don't even get into relationship anymore because they don't have a say. If you have a say, you are a feisty woman. You are bitchy. You are bossy. You get all the bad things, you know, being 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 labeled to you for being for having an opinion of your own as a woman. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I agree with Evit. This you Yeah, you 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 cannot and after like first of all you, you you have a boyfriend and you possibly have to do everything to please them and then after that when you get married to them you lose your identity because you Thank you for being here. I'm sorry. I'm just like, you know, ranting right now. But thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Like, then then you get married to them. You take their surname. And then you, you, you lose your identity again. And in Japan, you have to take your... Husband's surname when you get married, you don't have a choice. You have to. So, they don't even give you no. There's no option for hyphenation, by the way. There's like no such thing in like in if you get married to someone in Japan, you have to take their surname. That's how it the the man's surname. So, or the woman's surname in some cases, like there there are like male who wanted to be adopted into their wife's family. That happens too, but. You know, but most of the time it happens to women and they lose their identity that way and then they become a mother, they be- lose even more identity because they went from this guy's wife to this children's mom, you know? So being a woman in Japan is not easy. <laughs> I mean, being a woman in Asia is not easy. That's why when I, whenever I see like women in like Western countries complaining about shit, I'm just like, you, don't, you guys don't get it. Yeah, I mean, I like to cook and clean. I mean, maybe not clean, but I like to cook f- for my partner too. Like it's it's like, yes, I don't. It exactly. We 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 don't. Okay. Okay. First of all, I n- I've never been approached by an Asian guy in my country. Okay. Uh, I just don't have the personality that Asian guy likes. That's all. Uh, or 
the face or the body I don't know because Asian guys tends to go for like really like model-esque okay when I say Asian guys I meant like Chinese guys like they like like model-esque model-esque uh, girls so I'm not okay I'm chubby so that's already out of the uh, out of their requirement and then I'm opinionated no 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 why Chinese guys are the most hypocrite ever people serious they 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 don't give a shit about them their own look but they want like the hottest girl ever but I could that could apply to everyone on earth like every other assholes guy I guess yeah but it's more it's more predominant I feel like because I can't tell because I, I only ever lived here but it just seems to me that the Chinese guys here only like like really hot girls so if you're not hot then blah um, so <laughs> okay there are two types of Asian girls that prefer foreigners one is the most common one that they are from very very poor countries therefore they wanted they wanted some white savior to save their life so they can get the fuck out of their poor country that's the most common one uh, but I think nowadays there are more who just are open to dating um, other races basically like personally I cannot imagine myself dating a guy who can't speak English well um, like don't have the command in English well uh, secondly uh, someone who can accept how opinionated I am <laughs> I guess Yes, exactly, Ivit. Wherever you go, you'll find traditionalists and fundamentalists who think that women should be submissive and such. And yes. Yes. Hello, sniper. Hi, hi. <laughs> I'm back. I've been uh, away for a long time. So, yeah. It's, um,. It's it is it's not just an Asian thing. I think it's like just all of, all over the world thing. Yes, including one thing a white savior. That, yeah, it's yeah, it's like white people want to be white savior, and then the third world country uh, women wants a white savior. So it's a perfect fit. If they, if it works out for them, it works out for them. I don't give a shit, you know. But. I just find it very difficult to find people of my mindset around me but maybe I haven't been exploring much so but at the same time it just doesn't seem like that there are there are like men in nearby me who are interested in my kind of character you know so yeah Of course, I would love to, but I can't. <laughs> I have no skills. <laughs> the only skill I have is reading and um, talking shit. <laughs> that's, like, that's my only skill. I can't. I can't get out. I can't get out from this fucking country. I'm stuck here. So. Yeah, I don't know what to do. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not. I am. I work something that's very close to what I like to do. <clears throat> something like a writer. <laughs> Con 
conspiracy? <laughs> no. No, my job is getting replaced by AI now, so I won't be able to find a job anymore. And my my job is getting replaced now. AI are taking over. something else I know yeah but but people eat it up you you say AI writes the most horrendous stories but they have perfect uh, spelling they ha they you don't need an editor like they take over everyone's job they take over writers job they take over editors job basically and they take over graphic designers job so AI is taking over we are, we are all out of our jobs now so I, I honestly, if, I don't know, I know there are AI artists who are really good, right, but, um, it could be good, I mean, like, everything on earth, it could be good and it could be bad, whether, on, the, whether how, rather, it doesn't matter, like, yeah, exactly. So I'm just trying to get out from this industry. So, but I don't know what to do. So I'm uh, pretty much uh, fucked. <laughs> That's all I can say. <laughs> That's all I can say. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's nuance and everything. There's nuance and everything. There's nuance and everything. You can't. I can't say. I can't say. It's completely bad. But yeah. It, but it's taking over our like creative job. Um. Expert. Yeah. So no, I. Uh, not great. But I think one one of the reasons why I'm not feeling great. Um. Uh, for the past like year or so it's like just seeing like witnessing the rise of AI and sl like slowly taking over your job kind of feeling and it's like it sends chills down my spine and I'm just thinking okay one day I'm gonna I'm gonna lose everything <laughs> basically so <laughs> um, so yeah so yeah it's, um, it's depressing depressing I'll see maybe one day I'll make it to London you know you gotta recommend you gotta you gotta host me Dimitri yeah go London one day and I'll visit you and your girlfriend then you can bring me out and show me off to your friends and I don't know, introduce guys to me or something, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> don't say that. No. Yeah, maybe snow. Maybe snow. That'll be nice. Aw. Thank you, Piao! Staying for the whole day. Oh my god, you crazy. Thank you so much. It's it's not it's <laughs> white. First name white, last name savior, yes. It's not that I don't like Asian guys, like I, my, I, I come from a very multicultural country, and I, and I feel like I like everyone just the same. It's just that they never like me. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think anyone ever liked me. <laughs> 
but then I've been told okay so I, but I've been told that I can be very dense so I don't know maybe it's like I'm just dense and I didn't realize it because because uh, I remember there was one time when like just like maybe 15 years ago I was playing Ragnarok online and I play it very 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 often like every day at the time I mean I st- I, like I do with this fucking Final Fantasy game so I play that and then uh, I play with my girlfriends always and then <laughs> like it's only like a decade later like a couple years later when one of my friends said that do you remember the one guy that always like like you know sit near you or like try to talk to you every time you're online and I'm like and I'm like um yeah what who I said yeah like there's this one guy who always like follow you around try to talk to you or talk to you all the time or something like that and then when you're not online he gets super depressed like just like sulk around the same spot that I always sit at and I'm like who <laughs> So, <laughs> so I'm, I'm pretty sure. I don't, I don't, I don't know. I'm not sure, but I'm pretty sure there might be people who like me. But like, okay, yeah, exactly what Dimitri is saying. <laughs> As always, the guy likes you, but not all have confidence. In fact, major majority don't approach you these days. Or <laughs> you like someone the same belief that it's hard. Yeah, if it is very very hard to find someone who has the same belief and values with, as me. Yes, mysterious talker apparently. Yeah, I oh, I really don't know who. I really don't remember who. And I asked her if you did you have like photos or something like you know we had like screenshots or something. That you can show me, maybe, maybe I'll remember because I'm a very visual person. I don't, it's very hard for me to remember names and all that. So, yeah, so she said that no, no, but it's like she doesn't even remember his name anymore. But there's just this one guy that always follow me around, and I don't, I don't even care. Like, because I was just playing with my girlfriends, I'm that kind of person, so I didn't even realize it. Oh, like, but then, like, like in in our own last time, you can just open a a, a party chat and said, can, can someone help me level? Um, like, uh, in this dungeon or something like that, and there will always be some guys who <laughs> who will want to do that for you, if especially if they are very high level, and they will be like, oh, I'm low. I'm level 100, I'll, I, I can bring you to this dungeon, that kind of thing, so it's very funny, yeah, it's, it's always like guys like that. It's a... <laughs> Shiva right here, damn! Damn, son, that's that's great. <laughs> Don't go for. <laughs> Don't go. Let's not go for men in dungeons. <laughs> oh my god, you guys are cracking me up. I gotta cut all of this off <laughs> from my. From my vault later. <laughs> I it's I I don't mind it either. But I, I literally I I don't want someone who's exactly the same as I am. That sounds stupid, right? You want someone who kind of compliment you, right? So that's how I feel. Someone who can compliment what your, your lifestyle, your life. I don't know. Let's not go. 
<laughs> you too. Funny. Let me try something. Um... Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's how. That's how we uh, we met. Actually, the sky the sky sleepers. Fucking awesome. Still my favorite fucking mount. Seriously. <laughs> no doctor. you started listening to my stream like i don't think i told you i was streaming right like how the fuck man doctor <laughs> ah, the sky sleeper is great there's other mount too i haven't gotten the eden one we should go get the eden one wait did i get the eden one i think i haven't I don't know, there's still some more that I haven't gotten. The, ring, uh, the new raids. I haven't done all the new raids. <sighs> yeah. I'm a super raider, guys. You guys just don't know yet. You guys should watch my old raiding videos. I'm actually really good. I'm very good at call out. I was. <laughs> I was. Oh, P four, really? Yeah. Hey, wait. I don't. I don't know who, who you are in game though. What's your name in game? I'll never remember. Never mind. When you when you are when you log in, just like uh, text me uh, and say it it's uh, a e f a. Oh my god. How do I find them? very hard to find but it's okay just oh no <laughs> no <laughs> yeah piao let's let's do i didn't know omega is eu i'm sorry <laughs> i'm like hmm okay it's so like you guys i just appreciate guys honestly i i've been gone for two months um i i'm actually very i've been i've been very very anxious and 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 scared to come back because i don't know if anyone is gonna care anymore that I'm back but you guys really made it made it very very um you guys made me happy today you guys made my day that's all I can say and I would like to say a big thank you to all of you um let's go from the top okay because I know some people already left um but that's fine um <laughs> So we see Piao. Thank you, Piao. 
uh, for jumping in so fast when you see me go live. Um, someone called uh, Labyrinth, Labyrinth Zion. Um, first time chat. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, and then um, uh, Kim Komodo dropped by, but Kim, I think he was he probably he usually go to sleep around like uh, like his time around the time that he logs in. So thank you, Kim, for dropping in. Thank you for Dimitri for coming back. <laughs> thank. <laughs> oh, thank you to Sniper Hobby <laughs> and also for the follow. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you to Tentacle BKK for the follow. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you to Evit. Thank you to Kevin Satrum. Um, uh, thank you, thank you to Dian for uh, moderating and just being awesome as usual. <laughs> I'm not. Don't say that. I'm not herald of literature. Don't, don't, don't give me compliments like that. It makes me uncomfortable because I'm not. I just like to read. That's all. I just like to read, and I thank you all for listening to me read thank you all for uh, hanging out with me um, I know my content is very niche I know my content is um, like who the fuck watch someone sit there and read for like 6 hours right so I don't know what kind of like viewers you guys are but thank you that's all I can say. Thank you. Uh, I I'm not here to make a difference to the world. I don't have a mission in this world. I don't know who I am most of the time. I don't know why am I here most of the time. Um, I struggle thinking about why am I here all the time. Um, and reading to people is or reading in general gives me a sense of purpose somehow and I would like to thank you all for giving me that purpose because we all need a purpose right <laughs> and Um. <sighs> Bit overwhelmed. <laughs> um. I'm sorry for missing for two months. I I don't mean to. I just dis disappear like that. But I was really going through a hard time, and I thought that I really thought that I couldn't do this. And I'm very, very surprised when I woke up this morning and I thought that, yeah, I can do this, why not? Uh, that kind of confidence do not do not come very often for me. Uh, and... <laughs> I'm speechless. <laughs> I don't know when's the next time I'll be streaming, but as I've mentioned before, uh, I don't want to give myself a schedule so to overwhelm myself. Uh, I want to do things. Uh, how I feel like doing. I want to feel like I'm comfortable doing it. So, if let's say 
if let's say tomorrow I wake up and I think I can I can stream today, <laughs> why not? <laughs> you know, uh, I will stream. I will stream. Um, I'll probably I'll probably read a book, a couple of chapters, maybe two chapters, three chapters, um, and then I will stop there. And then I don't know if I will stream. I don't know when's the next time I will stream. So I'm all I'm saying is that I might step. I I don't I like I used to do things like read a book in one week. I'm gonna separate into three parts so I can read it on Monday, Wednesday, Friday. All I, all I'm saying that I don't do that and I'm not going to do that anymore because it gives me anxiety, like maximum anxiety. I know it doesn't make sense to you. Doesn't make sense to me either, but it just does. Um, all I'm saying is, if I wake up tomorrow and I think that I can read three chapters of a book to you, I will do it. But if I don't come back for the next until the next week, I am sorry. I apologize. I apologize for the cliffhanger of reading a book. <laughs> you know, I understand that. I gotta like have that coherence in reading the book to people, but at the same time, if I don't feel comfortable or confident enough, or com like just generally, I feel like I'm overwhelmed. I'm too overwhelmed. I probably can't regularly read the entire book in a you know in a in a week's time. So it might take me longer to read a book, but I have. At least five new books in my bookcase right now that I will read for you guys. So I'll be here if I'm not here anymore. The end will let you know. But for now, for now, you guys are stuck with me. <laughs> For now, you guys have to listen to me rant about how miserable being depressed is. Um, but yeah, but, but I'll be here for now, okay? And uh, because I'll be here for now, I hope that you guys will look out for my next stream. It might be tomorrow. It might be next week. We don't know. So, um, put on the bell, turn on the bell thing on uh, Twitch, uh, or follow me on uh, my Twitter. I will never call it X, by the way. It's always Twitter to me. Tune in to Twitter. I will announce when I go live, but it would it it would be sporadic. I I can't promise you anything. But I'll be here somehow, okay? <laughs> I'll read books to you all. I'll read nice, nice, nice books. A shitter? <laughs> um, yes, a shitter. It's basically, a, it, it is basically a shitter. X I T T E R. -R. <laughs> I I have thought about uh, putting chat in my uh, screen before, uh, but I also don't like clutter. If you can if you can tell from the way my screen <laughs> looks like, it's very it's very clean. <laughs> so. <laughs> I hate clutters. Like literally, my windows background do not have any files or folders on it. <laughs> the cleanest. I I have a thing that I yeah I don't like clutters. So so I thought that if I put the chat in my uh, screen in my share screen in my uh, stream. Um, people who are watching the video from YouTube might have like a little uh, context as to what conversation I am having 
but I don't like clutter. I really don't like to have words popping up on my screen. So I don't know. I'll, I'll think about it. But anyway, uh, I really gotta go. Um, I'll go have a proper dinner, and then I'll talk to you guys soon. Uh, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for being here with me the whole day. Thank you for listening to me read. Thank you for your subscription, Dimitri. Even though I didn't, I didn't stream for two months. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, thank you for supporting uh, a small, small streamer. And um, I don't wish to have a big audience because it's very chaotic if that's, if, that, if that's the case. And I have terrible time communicating with too many people at once. But, uh, but, but um, I, hope, I, hope the channel, I hope the channel can grow a little bit. Just because, because I want more people to have more... Um, I don't know. My content is too niche, but I hope people will find out my channel and start to, like, um, pay attention, like, actually pick up a book to read, you know? That's, uh, that's my, uh, I guess if there's a mission in my life, it's that. Encourage people to read. Uh, no! Unfortunately, my dear Piao, um, I generally don't care much for like medieval or like fantasy stuff <laughs> and I think Lord of the Ring is very difficult to read huh I think it's like a really big book but then I did read I am a cat by Natsume Soseki so I think I can probably if I can read if I can read I am a cat by Natsume Soseki I feel like I can read any book in this, in this world read books only <laughs> Yes, we books only. Um, no, once I run out of we books, I do have some uh, books that uh, that are like in my uh, bookshelf that I haven't read. I bought it. I bought them, but I haven't read them. So, yeah. I, I once I start run, running out of we books, I will read you all uh, uh, books written by western writers but for now I'm reading books mainly read written by uh, Asian writers specifically Japanese writers yeah because I'm a weeb remember so yes I'm like yeah I want to go hang out with Twisty now we're gonna wait for the the what Oh, uh, Paolo Coelho? No, apparently the, I read that uh, The Alchemist is super uh, not good. <laughs> it's a very niche topic, yes. I know, I know. But okay, Dimitri, nobody wants to look at my face. I, I, I confirm to you that people would rather look at this fake face here than the real face me because I'm not cute <laughs> this this is that this avatar is cute I'm not cute so <laughs> so no <laughs> the, this is the smudge as you get from my camera using it to track my movement yeah I, I don't have green eyes <laughs> yeah. But I do wear glasses and have brown hair. But I'm not cute. Anyway, 
Yes. Gondor call for it. I don't know. I I want more books that give me ability to like do a little bit of like voice acting in some way, you know. Yeah, what has grey blue skin? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. I contemplated putting ears on my avatar, but nah. That's that's the that's a VTuber thing. I'm I'm not a VTuber. I'm not a VTuber. I'm just a normal human being. I don't have a character. I wish I'm creative enough to have like to build a character. You know, have like a a, a storyline or something act out as that character all the time but I can't I can't I can't what you see is what you get Dimitri I just want you to say that uh I wear when I wear when I wear green contact lens I'm cute story really give you um, a lot of thoughts about being a woman in a Asian society especially in being in a woman in Japan kind of feeling and uh, it's very realistic very very ab absurd absurd yet realistic at the same time it's very weird um, but uh, I feel like I, I had some good voice acting in it uh, especially in the first half of the, of the book I think I got tired in the second half, so I didn't do. I don't have much energy. But uh, Dimitri, when the stream ends, go back to the beginning and start from there. And then I think I I, I had quite a few good read. Yeah, in the beginning, I I'm proud of that. <laughs> Can't tell me what not to wear. I like my green contact lens. Damn you. <laughs> Anyways, I've been trying to say goodbye for like half an hour now. I think I'm like delaying it because I really don't know when's the next time I'm gonna stream. And I miss you guys. I like you guys. I like hanging on with you guys. So when I switch this off, I'm gonna be lonely again, which is which sucks. But you know that's life. Anyway, um, okay, seriously, I gotta go, I'm spying, <laughs> okay, I will, I will, I will, yeah, I know, it's my space after all, that is correct, it is my space. Alright. Alright. I'm gonna go now. Thank you so much for being here for the whole day. Eight eight hour stream. It's an eight hour stream guys. And <clears throat> Yeah. Yeah, probably. I can I can play some stupid game and I can chat with you guys like I did the last time I played Minecraft. That was nice. Maybe I can do that tomorrow when I'm free or when I'm free, whenever I'm free, whenever I'm in Minecraft. But good times has to come to an end. I'll have to say goodbye. Um. Uh, Ha in case I don't come back anytime soon before the new year, I'll say a preemptive happy new year. Uh, but first, uh, m m m Merry late Christmas. I hope you guys had a, an amazing Christmas and a great holiday. I hope you guys are enjoying your holidays. I hope you guys are enjoying your time with your family and your loved ones. I uh, hope you guys will enjoy the upcoming new year. 
um, until then thank you so much for being here with me today it's been my honor to read an entire book to you today and I can't wait to do more of that in the future and I hope you guys will stay on um, stay on and hang out with me that will be my greatest honor until then I'll send you off with my favorite song in the world have you ever had a dream that 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 you you would you can do you skip do do you skip you want to do you skip and also why is the end always dying <laughs> see you love you guys have a great, 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 great night. Good night. Go eat. Nice dinner. Nice breakfast. Nice uh, lunch wherever you are. I love you all. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Arigatou gozaimashita. <laughs>